I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever amen are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk oh okay, first if I believe Senator the Labor government seeking Thank you, uh, President. I, I appreciate you giving me the call uh, straight up. Um, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023 yeah. and related bills. Bill Is leave granted? Uh, leave is not granted, Senator Wong. Pursuant to contingent motive standing in my name, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to the consideration of the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023 and related bills may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Well, Senators, we know what's been happening in this chamber this week. Yes, we do. We know what's been happening in this chamber this week. We know that what has been happening in this chamber this week is that the partnership between the Greens and the Liberal Party of Australia has ensured that the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill is not debated. And it has been, frankly, undignified, undignified from the so-called Progressive Party to see them teaming up with the National Party and the Liberal Party to filibuster and deny debate. Yeah. Filibuster, delay debate, because they don't want to debate legislation that is the most significant investment in housing by the Commonwealth Government in a decade. In a decade. And, in a decade. and why do they not want it debated? Why do they not want it debated? They don't want it debated. They don't want it debated uh, because they don't want to have to vote. That's right. no. They don't want to have to vote. Now, let's be clear what this bill represents. This bill represents an election commi commitment that was clear and un unambiguous uh, and transparent to the Australian people. The Labor Party have a mandate for this legislation. We, do. we absolutely do. We went to the Australian people with this legislation right. and we said, with this policy, and we said, this is what we will deliver. This is what we will deliver. Uh, but, and the legislation uh, went through the House some months ago. It's been in the Senate. But have the Greens and the Coalition wanted it debated? No. No, they don't want it debated. Uh, they want to filibuster and delay uh, and ensure that they don't get to a vote. I suspect because what, what, you, know, you hear some whispers, the Greens don't actually want to be seen to be on the wrong side of it. They just want to keep playing this out. How cynical. At least have some courage. Either vote for or vote against. But you know what you're doing? You're filibustering with the coalition on a, a legislation that will deliver 30,000 new social and affordable homes in the first five years, 4,000 homes for women and children fleeing domestic violence. Perhaps listen to that. 4,000 homes for women and kids fleeing domestic violence and older women at risk of homelessness. Now, the joint crops crossbench, including the Greens, came to the government with concerns, uh, and Minister Collins negotiated in good faith to address every single concern. But you know what? The Greens are led by a spokesperson. The Greens spokesperson on housing. The Greens spokesperson on housing. Let me talk to you about the Greens spokesperson on housing. You know, he's had a taste of the media spotlights. 
He's had a taste of the media spotlight. Your spokesperson on housing is now prioritising media t attention from stunts and obstruction over housing for, for women and kids fleeing domestic violence. How shameful. You know, this man's ego, this man's ego matters more than housing for women fleeing domestic violence and older women at risk of homelessness. This man's ego matters more than women fleeing domestic violence. What uh, sort Senator of party McKim, are you? Senator McKim, what Senator sort Wong, of party Senator are you? Wong, I have a point of order. Senator. Rant from, uh, from the Leader of Government in the Senate is well out of order. She is reflecting personally on the motives and impugning the motives of a member of the other place. She's not only wrong, she is uh, very clearly showing that uh, Mr Chandler Mather is right under the skin of the government and I ask, yeah, I, I, her, I ask you to require her to withdraw. Senator Wong, for the benefit of the chamber, I have to, I'd ask you to withdraw. Well, it, I withdraw for the benefit of the, of the chamber and what I would say to you is this. The question for the Greens is whether a person's ego matters more than the security of having a hot roof over That's your right. head, because that is, what, that is what we are seeing. Now, you've got an opportunity today You've got an opportunity today. In the next few hours, let's see what you do. Senator Lambie, Senator Lambie has given notice that she wishes. Yes, Senator Wong. I'm just waiting for them to stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Senator Wong, it's a matter for you how, how you use your time. So I ask you to proceed. Invite you to, to, to. I'd ask for a little decorum at the uh, back end of the chamber. Uh, so, Senator Lambie's uh, private senator's motion is uh, she's deferring. So, you've got a couple of hours. You've got a couple of hours to do the right thing. Uh, and we'll give you the opportunity to do that. Because I know, I suspect, I should say, that there are those in your party and in your party room who are concerned about the way in which your spokesperson is handling this. Because he is prioritising his, his, he, he is prioritising a bit of media attention and his personal ego over the interests of of women and children fleeing violence, uh, and people in this country who are in need of government investment in the housing sector. Now, you 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 may, you may sit there saying, "Oh, we want more. We want more." Well, this is the election commitment. You are standing in the way of the biggest investment in housing in a decade. And you may yell as much as you like, but you are blocking funding for social and affordable housing Thank in this you, country. Senator, Senator Wong, um, I'm going to Senator Birmingham and then I'm going to go to the Greens. And then we will rotate, rotate round. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Deputy President. Well, it's always unfortunate to see lovers having a fight, isn't it? Particularly when it plays out publicly. A, a lovers' tiff between the parties of the current government, between the Labor Party and the Greens, and this little stoush that's turning into a big stoush that's turning into quite a personal stoush. Senator Wong, is this a point of order? Skim to withdraw. I would point out that who the lovers are this week. Are you and them? Senator, Senator Wong, it's not a point of order, and you know it. Senator Birmingham, you have the call. De De Deputy fun. President, the parties of the current government, the Labor Party and the Greens, <laughs> here they are now, having this stoush, playing out publicly, a lover's tiff that's turned into quite a public brawl. And you know the government is feeling the pressure on these things. You know government ministers are feeling the pressure when they start to personalise the debate yeah. too. And we saw there in Senator Wong's contribution that it was a personalisation of the debate, targeting in about the particular Greens housing spokesman, turning it into a personal debate against a member of the Greens, trying, of course, to play into whatever divisions may exist within the Australian Greens. So, so we see within, we, well, well, it didn't sound like a policy debate, it sounded like a personal attack. It sounded like a big sledge against the Greens. It sounded like the two of you falling out of love with one another. But of course we know it will only be temporary and that no doubt at some stage there will be some sort of deal, secret deal, bargain, etc. 
The government, though, is seeking to come in here and say this bill should be expedited. The chambers apparently had enough time to debate something that it's barely debated at all. It has barely had the chance to debate this at all. So what is this government doing with the management of its legislative program? Mishandling it terribly would be the answer to that, because to try to mount the argument that it's time to push this through, it's time to guillotine this, there should have been some debate of it beforehand, before you actually get to that point. This is a new $10 billion fund, a new $10 billion fund that the government has struggled to define or defend when it's come under scrutiny. It's meant to be an off-budget fund. That's the way they took it to the election yes, campaign, so they could, of course, go through that campaign and say, well, this isn't really money that we're spending. We don't have to account for this money. We're running it off-budget. But then when challenged about investment mandates for the fund in terms of how it will actually be accounted for, would the government make any of that public before this Senate is asked to vote on it? No, of course they don't. None of that sort of detail, none of that sort of information in advance. And then in their desperation to try to negotiate this fund with the Greens, we learn, or with the rest of the crossbench, we learn they start to give deals. Deals that say, well, regardless of how much this fund earns, we might build this many houses. Or regardless of how much this fund earns, we might start to spend this much money as a guarantee year on year. Well, guess what happens if you give those guarantees? It takes it on the budget. Yes, it blows out of the water the entire premise of the policy yes. that the government took to the last election. So in their desperation, with an ill-conceived policy, they are now starting to unpick it and demonstrate just how bad Labor is when it comes to managing money. That's right. And that's what all of this comes back to, that this off-budget fund, this off-budget fund that the government has said we don't have to account for it as spending, we can claim a budget bottom line position without having to account for this, this fund will end up costing Australians, it will end up hitting the budget bottom line, it will end up deteriorating the government's budget position, it will end up operating completely contrary, completely contrary to what was promised at the election and the approach that they've taken. So, Deputy President, this is a bill that deserves scrutiny. This is a bill that deserves fair debate. And Senator Wong, Senator Wong, Senator Wong, you knew, well, you knew coming in here today that Senator Lambie is going to withdraw her private senator's time, providing an extra hour of debate time. But guess what? By pursuing this tactic, you're reading up that time. Rather than having an hour of debating Rather than having an hour of debating Senator Lambie's bill, we'll instead spend about 45 or 50 minutes debating the motion that you've insisted on moving. Senator so, Wong, Senator you Wong of order. you've created this. If Senator Birmingham wishes me to give me leave to close the debate Senator so he Wong can get on to the housing debate, I'd be happy to order. move that motion. Senator Wong, it's Go not on. A point of order. Give me leave. That's, that's I'll a matter, move it. That's a matter of private discussion no, between the leaders. This is a mess of the government's own making. This policy is a mess of its own making. This poor chamber management is a mess of its own making. This lack of time to debate this bill is a mess of its own making. And this lovers' tiff between the Labor Party and the Greens is a mess of their own making, which is only going to get worse thanks to the personal tactics Senator Wong has now deployed against the Greens. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Well. I mean, you'd think better of uh, the government if they really wanted, if you, if they really wanted to actually be constructive, if they wanted to work with this chamber to get uh, legislation passed. And, you know, they've done that before, but for whatever reason, they've got out on the wrong side of bed this morning, and they are tetchy. And we just saw that, and we just saw that from Senator Wong, uh, personalising things running the personal arguments, running the politics and not at all talking about the issue. And not at all and not at all talking about the issue. And she does, and, and, and Minister Wong, who uh, moved this motion and says that the, the government wants to get on with debating their bill, spent the entire time talking about the Greens housing spokesperson. 
the entire time. Now, I would like to point out that in the bill has been through the House. It is now before this Senate, and it is up to the Senate to decide how we deal with this piece of legislation, how much time uh, we are going to uh, give to scrutinising this bill. But it is always, it is always, it doesn't matter what side of government, when they want their way, they think they have ultimate control. And it doesn't matter whether it's the Labor Party in government or the Liberal Party in government, wake up. There is a Senate crossbench and you have to be prepared to negotiate, to talk and to work together. And what we've seen today, and in fact what we've seen all week, is a lack of respect for this place, a lack of respect for this chamber and a lack of respect for the individual senators who have been elected to this place to, uh, to stand up for our constituents and the issues that the community wants. No one in this uh, debate should be wanting to ram through a piece of legislation which has already proven to be a fake. There is no guaranteed spend. There is no guaranteed spend of housing in this bill, and that is a problem. The, the minister, minister Wong has stood here. Minister Wong has stood here and said that this government has a mandate. Well, you don't have a mandate in the Senate, and you don't have a mandate on a bill that you promised people you would build houses, and the bill doesn't do that. The bill doesn't do that. We would like to fix the bill. We would like to fix the bill so it does build houses, so that money is spent creating homes for the most desperate people in this country. It is a sick joke that this government continues to pretend that they are dealing with the housing crisis while gambling everything on the stock market. It's a sick joke and people are seeing it for what it is. So if you really care about building houses so help to help women fleeing domestic violence, build them, fund them and build them. And that is what the Greens would like to see. The fact that there is no guaranteed spend in this bill means that your promise is hollow. Your promise is hollow. And what about the one third of Australian households who are renters. Nothing in this bill for them. Nothing in this bill for them. And what does the Prime Minister say about that? Oh, not my problem. Leave that up to the states. We can't do anything. Not my problem. Not my problem. It is not good enough. It is not good enough. We want to work constructively with you. But if you keep playing these silly games, the winner-takes-all approach, you're not going to get very far. You're not going to get very far. And I remind members in this place that this Senate works best when we stick to the issues and stay away from the personal jibes. This place works better when we give decent time for debate and we work together to maximise that, not have stunts brought in at 9 o'clock in the beginning of the morning to upend things. And from the government of the day, you have to start to get uh, to, you, from the government of the day, you have to start understanding you do not control the Senate. You do not. You have to talk to people, you have to cooperate, and that is what the Australian people voted for. They voted for a Senate to scrutinise and to work collectively, not to rubber stamp fake promises, hollow promises from the government of the day. Senator Lambie. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, first of all, I just want to make it quite clear, um, this bill that I was doing this morning is very important to me and many veterans out there. I did not tell the Labor Party until about 8 or 8.30 last night um, that I could not put this bill up. And the reason I cannot put this bill up is because it will fail. It will fail the veterans and what they need for a Royal Commission because I haven't got it right. I haven't got that right. I am close and I know you guys know I've been working on it. I do thank Senator Scar. He's working on it with me. I just haven't, I just haven't been able to get it done in the time. 
I'm making phone calls and I'm doing everything I, I can because I know those rural commissioners need every piece of document they possibly order or want on that table to make those veterans' lives better. I would be just standing up this morning and I would be just grandstanding because I have still not, do not have the answer. I will continue and I hope to God I have that by the next sitting and that we can make an agreement so that those guys up there, those Royal Commissions, have every bit of evidence that they need to continue on with this Royal Commission and to make those recommendations for the future, that they have that in the next three or four weeks. But I apologise and I apologise to those veterans out there. I just don't have that answer this morning. And I'm not going to sit here and waste an hour's time when I know I can find that bloody answer. It's there. And I will find it. That's my first point. My second point is this. My second point is this. We got houses built because I got a deal done with the Youth of Your Party last time. And those houses have made a significant difference in Tasmania. And I will pay credit to Peter Gutwin and the Liberal Party and the state down there. They're a little bit slow to get started with, and I understand that that process, it does take about two years, because you've got to get greenfield sites, you've got to get the materials, and you've got to have the tradies. I know that and I understand, but we're doing a bloody good job between using, taking out the, politi pl the politics out of it. We are doing a good job in Tasmania, and we're trying to build them as fast as we can. I know that. But I have to say to my colleagues from Tasmania, we are falling behind, because for every one we build, we've got nearly bloody 50 more on that waiting list. We can't hold this back. I know this is not perfect, but people out there need roofs over their heads. So for goodness sakes, please, can we just get a starter on this? I don't want to hold them back any further. I really just don't want to hold this back any per further. Nothing's ever perfect up here. It's never perfect. But for somebody to know what it's like to move out of normal housing and know that we didn't have to live in tent with my mum, which would have absolutely paralysed her, knowing that she couldn't keep a roof over her kids' heads, is heartbreaking. We cannot hold this up. We need this to get through. We cannot hold this up another day. So please, for you people over here that think you have a social conscience, do you really want to keep playing with people's lives? Do you really? Because all I hear is about all these women out there, domestic violence houses, you have an opportunity to get a starter. You have the biggest balance of power in this, in this parliament this time around. You have that. You can keep chipping away, no different to what you do with your gas and coal and what you're doing there. And you keep getting better at it and you keep, getting, you keep reducing on, on, on having more gas and coal here and you're doing a great job. Okay, you're doing a great job, but this, we need a starter. This is something we can keep chipping away at and we can keep doing deals at and adding to it. So please, can we just use a base here and get started today? No more of the politics, no more of the rubbish. I just want roofs over people's heads. That's all I want. I want to thank the Labor Party for being very constructive. I know that um, Senator Tyrrell's worked very hard with you guys. I know there's been a lot of hours put into this. And yeah, we may not get this perfect, but we've got to start. And what we do know is that every state has been promised 1,200 houses to get started. Let's get it started because it is going to take quite a few years to get them started and get them built. And in the meantime, we can chip away. We also know there'll be an election by the time they get, start, get started to building them. And I can tell you now, if people are crying out for houses, they're going to be offered a lot more. But at least get the program started so we can get moving. So I don't have as many people out there, especially our children. That next generation. I don't want them seeing them starting their lives by living in a tent because that's really unfair, and we're not acting like adults by doing that to our children of the future. It is as simple as that today. Uh, uh, I'm going to Senator Watt, but do you, you know, how, how long is your contribution? It'll only be a couple of minutes. Can I give him a couple of minutes as a, as a crossbencher and then come back to, and I'm going back to the rotation? Thank you, Deputy President. We're opposing this uh, suspension of standing orders and we'll be opposing, if the suspension is successful, we'll be opposing the motion by leave. Let's have a look at some of the considerations. The first clause, 1A, is wrong. But if it is the most significant Australian government investment in social and affordable housing, if it is, then it needs proper debate, proper scrutiny. We haven't had that. The second, 1B, is spurious. Again, we need a full debate. 1C, again, spurious. We need a full debate. 1E, at a time when Australians are facing significant housing pressures, I'm quoting, the progress on the bill should be expedited by the Senate. The Labor budget is inflationary and will hurt, people, hurt housing in this country. 
housing prices will escalate because they're bringing in 400,000 new immigrants. Who the hell is going to, going to house them? Plus, this bill, these bills are littered with wastage and a huge increases in bureaucracy. Bureaucrats do not build houses, they frustrate the building of houses. They increase the cost of building houses. We need to let the free market get on with the job. Tradies get on with the job of building houses. F, recognising the significance of this legislation, there is a need that these bills be considered today. We need thorough debate on these bills, they're significant. We need to get back to basics. The $10 billion future fund, it's not the $10 billion fund rather, is not monopoly money, it's taxpayers' money. We need to debate how to spend that wisely and properly. So we will be posing this. And I make the point in this debate in the Senate, as it happens so many, so often, labels are the refuge of the ignorant, the dishonest and the fearful. People using, using labels in this parliament, dis decide for yourselves which of those apply to you. Is it ignorance, dishonesty or fear? Thank you. Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. Well, I want to particularly single out the contribution we just heard from Senator Lambie, uh, who I think actually dropped a few truth bombs on this chamber, which really needed to be heard by a few people. Because this is actually about real people who cannot get housing. You're a disgrace. You're a disgrace. Senator Wong. Orders. Senator Wish Wilson you just accused, disgrace. suggested, made, made a remark about Senator Lambie that which should be withdrawn. Senator Wish Wilson. Please withdraw. Wish, please withdraw the, what you shouted across the chamber. I did hear it. It wasn't, I withdraw, a, it wasn't in good taste. Thank you. Well, the Greens uh, and their lack of graciousness are on full display already today. Don't make it worse, um, Senator the Watt. Senator Lambie's contribution brought home the stark reality that too many Australians are experiencing at the moment, and that is a lack of housing, rising rates of homelessness, which we are trying to work with this chamber to fix. It is time for the nonsense around this issue to end. We've had weeks of the, of the performative self, social media from the Greens. We've had months of the self-indulgent press conferences. The Greens at some point have got to realise that we are not here in a school debating society. We are actually talking about real people's lives and real solutions to create the housing that so many Australians so desperately need. And today we have an opportunity to fix that. People are hurting. And it is time to debate legislation that will build 30,000 social and affordable homes across Australia. That's what this motion does. It seeks to bring on the debate on a bill that will help build tens of thousands of homes. Now, I've listened to the Greens try to characterise this as being not enough. It's the only thing that's being done about housing. And of course, that is just more nonsense and, mis and misrepresentations from the Greens. Because not only will this fund build 30,000 new social and affordable homes in the first five years, so the Greens want to vote against 4,000 homes for women and children fleeing domestic violence and older women at risk of homelessness. The that. Greens want to partner with the Coalition to, as Senator Lambie is talking about, build homes for veterans. That is what is at stake here. There's a lot more at stake here than a social media tile or a graphic or a video or whatever, whatever other self fulfilling, self-indulgent social media want to do. These are people's real lives. And that, of course, is in addition to the additional $2 billion that Labor is financing being made available to support social and affordable rental homes, up to $575 million available for social and affordable rental homes, $350 million to build a further 10,000 affordable homes. We are, doing, we are pulling every possible lever open to government to build the social and affordable homes that the Greens want to jump on Instagram and tell people that they care about. So we're doing every single one of these things, and it's still not enough for the Greens, because what they're interested in is milking public attention to build up their votes at the expense of people who desperately deserve housing. They should be ashamed of themselves. They should be ashamed of leaving people living in tents so that they can have a social media feed. That is all that actually matters to the, to the Greens, not the content, not the substance. That is all that actually matters. So who is actually coming together today to oppose the biggest investment in public housing that we have seen in this country in a decade, in addition to everything else? Who's coming together? Really well, we have a new coalition emerging between the Greens, Peter Dutton, 
the Liberal and National parties, and it would appear Pauline Hanson and One Nation. Well, give yourselves a pat on the back. What great company you're keeping in order to stop Wilson, the development of public yourself. housing in this country? Oh, you don't want to be with the Greens. Point of order, yes. Uh, comments should be directed through the chair. I know it's a highly emotional argument for the Labor Party at the moment, but to pe be sh shouting at um, the Greens in Thank the manner you, that Senator they are McKenzie. is Senator highly Watt. disrespectful. To the extent, please address your, chair, your comments through me. So it would seem now that the, the coalition between the Greens and the opposition is even going to procedural points as well. Now, the Greens want public housing so badly that they will sell their soul and wrap their arms around Peter Dutton, Pauline Hanson and every single member of the opposition. That's how badly they want public housing to happen in this country, to stop the biggest investment in public housing in this country for a decade. But, of course, it's not the first time we've seen the Greens say they want housing and then do everything possible to stop it. They've got a long record of doing that at council level in a number of states. Who could forget the Yarra Council, controlled by the Greens, who knocked back a plan to build 100 new social housing units on council land? They wanted social housing in Melbourne so much that they blocked it. They wanted social housing so much in various Sydney councils that they blocked it. And now they want social housing so badly at the federal level that they're teaming up with Peter Dutton and Pauline Hanson to block it as well. Now we know that this, this, this hypocrisy disease that surrounds the Greens unfortunately has now spread to Queensland as a result of the Greens running federal seats. Because of course we have the Greens housing spokesperson, the member for Griffith, out there saying, we need more housing, we need more housing, we need more housing. But you know what? There's a housing development with 1,300 homes and I'm going to block it. He's out there leading protests in Griffith to stop housing developments in his electorate while saying that he wants more public housing. The member for Brisbane is teaming up with him to do it as well. The Greens are hypocrites on this issue. It is time to call it out and it is time thank to you, build more thank homes. Thank you, Senator Watt. I, I had the call being asked for, but is this a point of order? or For the last two minutes, I got the call to the coalition. The coalition will be opposing this suspension, and I just want to make it clear— I've just been told by the clerk that time has now expired, oh. so we will have to forego your contribution, Senator McKenzie. I'm now intending to put the question. The question is about the suspension of standing orders. I put the question. Those for the question say aye, as moved by Senator Wong. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? A division is required. Ring the bells.
order, lock the doors. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone as teller for the ayes and Senator Cadell as teller for the noes. across the chamber, and that is what I expect. Senator Wish Wilson. I stop the count. Senators, I have called order three times, and I have called particular senators to stop the interjections. I am asking you to respect this chamber. There is a count underway and it is normally done in silence, without interjections. Please continue. Order. There being 23 ayes and 41 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'm now going to in, uh, in the negative. Sorry, wishful think. Uh, I'm now going to call Senator Lambie. Um, thank you, Madam, Madam President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of my private senator's bill today, which has been circulated. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. I move that the Senate not proceed with the consideration of my private senator's bill today. The effect of this motion is that the Senate will proceed immediately to the next item of business, which is the attendance of a minister, and following that, debate on the housing bill. Thank you, Senator All Lambie. Bills. So the question is, a motion is moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. I also note a committee has lodged a proposal to me to shown at item three of today's order of business. Thank you. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senators. I call the clerk. Uh, order the day attendance of minister representing the minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Senator Ayres. Uh, well, President, um, the opposition has moved a motion in the Senate uh, because apparently they weren't happy with two of the answers to questions on notice that they received. Uh, and the, the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy of this particular proposition is extraordinary. The first question was a question that Senator Hume asked about comments attributed to the Finance Minister in the Canberra Times, 
in relation to what was called a productivity efficiency component. Those comments are completely consistent with a responsible government cleaning up a trillion dollars worth of debt left by a decade of liberal neglect and dysfunction. Uh, the minister quite right, rightly in his answer said, in relation to the sustainability of the budget, the Albanese Labor government inherited a budget disaster from the previous Liberal government, featuring a trillion dollars in Liberal Party debt, growing inflation, a cost of living crisis and an ugly mess of waste, rackets and rorts that defined the legacy of the wasted decade under the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison government, a situation with which Senator Hume will be intimately familiar as the senator was a senior member of the previous Liberal government. Uh, and, uh, uh, and a minister in an economic portfolio. In addition to that, in addition to that uh, there is a question here from Senator Patterson that is the subject uh, of this motion uh, about, of all things, of all things, the lobbyist registrar. Now, uh, I just remind the Senate that that uh, the, the lobbyist register, and, and Senator Farrell says here correctly, uh, that the lobbyist registry is a creation of this government. A creation of this government. Uh, the last time that there was a lobbyist register in place was a creation of the Rudd uh, and Gillard governments. It was abolished was abolished by the previous government. The, the lobbyist register that there was before that was abolished by the Howard government. I mean, I mean, these guys have no shame, no shame when it comes to the activities uh, of lobbyists and the proper regulation uh, of lobbying here. I mean, extraordinary proposition. To, to, to ask this Senate to get stuck into the government about lobbyist registries that, and lobbyist regulation that you have abolished every time you've got anywhere near the government benches. And why is that? Well, as Senator Farrell said in his answer, and I understand that Senator Patterson and Senator Birmingham and others over there don't like the answer. As, 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 as Senator Farrell pointed out, every time you've got near the government benches, you've dispensed with lobbying regulation. And why? Why? Because regulation and clean government is anathema to these characters over there. And, and, and you only have to look, as Senator Patterson pointed out, at the activities of the member for Fadden. But Senator Farrell could have gone fur further. If Senator Scar doesn't like it, he could reflect on the activities of the current member for Hume, of the current member for Hume over the course of the government. Because when, there was a, because when he had a problem, when he had a problem on his property, a bit of native grass that he wanted to get rid of, what did he do? What did he do? He walked the little red carpet, the little red carpet, up to the minister's office and pleaded his case. After he'd got the roundup out and knocked over the native grass to make an enormous personal profit for his company. Remember Jamlands? Remember Jamlands? We uh, all remember it. Senator, Senator S, I have Senator Scar on his phone. Deputy President, on personal imputations, reflections, it's hard to even pick. Um, there are so many. A cascade of personal reflections, imputations. Senator, the Senator, Senator, Senator should withdraw. Senator is. I withdraw and I point out that there is a yawning gulf between what this side says about governance and what they did in government. What they did in government. And uh, all of them Senator Senator Ayres, I have Senator Senator Steele John on a point of order. Uh, there, there are twenty one seconds uh, remaining. My point on relevance relevance. Uh, the Senator is not being relevant to the question before the Chamber. If we could uh, talk about the NDIS Senator Stilljohn, Senator Stilljohn, I understand there's no requirement for the minister to be relevant on this particular matter. Senator Ayres. What, what I'm pointing out is that there is such a giant gap 
between what these characters say about parliamentary accountability and governance and what they do. And it's not just about you know, the sad sight, the sad sorry side of the flyblown member for Fadden withdrawing after all of the controversy, but it's also about current members uh, of the opposition front bench and their conduct Senator in Ayers. office. Senator Ayers. Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy, Acting Deputy President. I move the Senate take note of the statement from Senator Ayres. And, uh, Acting Deputy President, I really do feel a little sorry for Senator Ayres this morning. He clearly drew the short straw within the government front bench. In Senator, in Senator Farrell's absence, in Senator Farrell's absence, Senator Ayres was the one who had to front up and defend the indefensible. Senator Ayres was the one who had to turn up uh, and provide the humiliating response to this Senate, defending the type of responses that should never be given in relation to questions on notice that have been taken. There's a time and a place, Acting Deputy President, for us to engage in political sledging, for us to engage in terms of comparisons of track records of your government versus our government and the types of things that do frame part of the political debate in the conduct of our national politics. But that time and place is not in written answers to serious Senate questions on notice. That time and place is in the ABC studios. That time and place is in the Sky News studios. That time and place is on the airwaves of radio and television stations across the chamber. That time and place is sometimes here when we are debating live the contest of ideas, the battle, indeed, of track records. But it's not when a senator has asked a serious question when a senator is seeking serious information about serious topics. This debate has come on because we believe, as a coalition and an opposition in this place, that it is a question of respect versus contempt. Hear, hear. Respect for the Senate and parliamentary institutions versus contempt for the Senate and parliament, parliamentary institutions. And Senate, and Mr Shorten, and through agreeing to table Mr Shorten's response, Senator Farrell and the government as a whole have shown contempt for the Senate and its institutions rather than respect for them. And Senator Ayres talked about a yawning gulf was part of his rhetoric. Well, let's consider the yawning gulf in the government's rhetoric, the yawning gulf in what this Labor Party promised to be in government. The Prime Minister, even as recently as April of this year, said, I'm focused on running a good government, a government that's run by adults, a government that has good processes in place, a government that has ministers that are undertaking their tasks and are working hard. Well, Acting Deputy President, there's nothing mature, there's nothing adult-like about Mr Shorten's response to a question asked by Senator Hume in relation to comments about efficiency dividends and how they apply, particularly in relation to the National Disability Insurance Scheme. I cannot imagine a single Australian who cares about either good budget management and good budget processes or a single Australian who cares about the operation of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, thinking that Mr Shorten's response, in which it constitutes an entire paragraph of diatribe against the disgrace. former Liberal government, and has no mention, no mention at all in his response of the NDIS or of disability policy or of anything that goes remotely close to answering the question. If he tried to give this response in the House of Representatives, even the Labor Speaker would call it out of order. Even the Labor Speaker would sit him down. And yet he dares to try to give this response in writing in the Senate. It is contemptuous. It is a case of this government speaking with one mind, saying there will be adults, saying they're going to undertake their tasks properly saying that ministers will be held to account, but in reality, they're not. They're not. And they've said this again and again. Senator Gallagher, 
assuring this Senate that we are an orderly, adult, responsible government. We take matters of integrity and honesty very seriously. Well, if you take matters of integrity and honesty very seriously, why again, when Senator Patterson asks a very straightforward question about lobbyists that Mr Shorten may have met with, would he provide an answer that goes nowhere close to actually addressing the question? This is a message to the government. Lift your standards, show respect to this institution and to this chamber when it comes to responding to these questions. Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I just want to say to everyone listening to these proceedings, and we've got people in the public gallery, and it's great to see people in the public gallery again, this is one of the worst things I've seen in my time in the Senate since starting on 1 July 2019. And what's happening here, just to explain to everyone, is some courteous, relevant questions were put to the government in relation to the NDIS referring to an article which appeared in a newspaper and asking some legitimate questions, for example, with respect to the application of a so-called efficiency dividend to the NDIS, etc. Courteous questions were put and what was responded to on notice in writing was a diatribe of discourtesy, sneering contempt. Absolutely disgraceful. Absolutely disgraceful. And every senator Every senator who is not sitting on the government chambers, uh, government benches, should be absolutely outraged by this. The Australian people should be outraged by this. And Senator Ayres is coming back into the chamber. He did his best to defend the indefensible. I don't think he picked the short straw. I think he, he rushed forward and grabbed it with both hands. Rushed forward and grabbed it with both hands. And Senator Ayres, in the past, I've heard him. I've heard him talk about. The uh, others in this chamber sneer at others in this chamber and saying they're engaging in Trotskyite university sort of pranks. That's exactly what this was, Senator Ayres. This is exactly what this was. Sneering diatribe in response to courteous questions, relevant questions asked about the NDIS. Sneering, contemptuous, discourteous. Absolutely unbelievable. I was actually shocked when I saw the answer to the question on notice, sneering, discourteous, contemptuous. Beneath the contempt of this Senate, surely beneath the contempt of this Senate, every single senator, every single senator in this place has the right, has the right to put questions on notice. And I expect, and I'm sure my colleagues here expect, that those questions will be put in a courteous manner, they'll be relevant, they'll be objective. And when they do that, when they do that, there is a reciprocal obligation on those sitting on the government benches to respond in a courteous fashion to those questions. Because we're not just sitting here as individuals. We're sitting here as representatives of the people who elected us here. And that in itself, the position each and every senator holds. I may disagree with senators in terms of their political ideologies, their views on different policies. But I will always defend, and I don't care which party, I will always defend the right of every single senator in this place to be able to put forward their views, to be able to put forward their arguments, to be able to put forward their perspective without being responded to with sneering, contemptuous discourtesy. And that's what we've seen from the government on questions on notice. I mean, I can understand, Madam Acting Deputy President, that in the heat of the battle, People may say things. They may step over the mark. I've done it myself. I plead guilty, Your Honour. I plead guilty, Your no, Honour. I've done it myself. No, and I try and be a better person every day, Senator McGrath. I really do. But on occasions you do step over the mark. And then you withdraw to provide comedy of the chamber. You withdraw. You do the right thing. But to actually put in an answer to a, a serious question, serious questions in relation to the NDIS, to respond with such discourtesy, such sneering contempt, is just outrageous. And can I say to the leadership of the government opposite, can I say to the leadership how profoundly disappointing it is? It's profoundly disappointing. And I think really there needs to be cause for deep, deep reflection. Deep, deep reflection. Because if this happens again, if we see the same tone, sneering, contemptuous discourtesy with respect to legitimate questions,
questions which have been put forward in a courteous fashion. We will call it out every day of the week. Every day of the week we will call it out and shine a bright light on it. Absolutely unacceptable. Unacceptable to this chamber and, un and it should be unacceptable to every senator sitting in this chamber. It's within a whisker, Senator Stilljohn. The parliamentary scrutiny of the NDIS provided by the Senate is vital. It is vital. Asking questions in this place of the government in relation to how they run the NDIS is so important because disabled people do not trust the major parties not to stab them in the back as the Liberal Party did over the decade that they were in power. As the NDIS was rolled out, they systematically and continually excluded disabled people from critical decision-making and attempted again and again and again to cut our plans and supports to make it harder for us to get on the scheme. And as a result, so many people went for so long and still go without the support that they need. And quite frankly, it was hoped among the disability community that having wrenched the Liberal Party out by the neck and, God willing, condemned them to the dustbin of history, that period of time in our lives where we woke up week after week, month after month, to headlines about the government of the day making changes to the NDIS in such a way that impacted our lives without consulting disabled people, we hoped that was over. And indeed, before the election, the Labour Party made the promise that they would make no change to the NDIS without consultation and co-design. And yet, in the budget, they broke that promise. A week before the budget, the Prime Minister led every Premier who is now Labour from the mainland and the Liberal Premier out into the public to announce a cap on the NDIS. And that cap was followed through with in the budget delivered by this government. Now, the impact of that cap, the cut that it means, is that $74 billion, colleagues, $74 billion will be removed from the NDIS funding pots over this decade. $74 billion. That is being reported today, and I believe that this is accurate, as the single largest so-called saving in the budget. At a time when this government has committed to $368 billion, uh, more than $368 billion, I'm reminded by Senator Shoebridge, uh, now nearly upwards of half a trillion dollars on the AUKUS nuclear submarine project, when they are spending in their budgets, continuing to commit $54 billion in the stage three tax cuts over the decades, tax cuts that benefit overwhelmingly wealthy men, wealthy white men, I should make the bloody point. In that budget, the single biggest saving they could find was not scrapping the stage three tax cuts. It was not uh, opposing the AUKUS proposal, it was cutting the NDIS. Cutting the NDIS. And just in case disabled people hadn't got the message, just in case we hadn't really understood where the priorities of this government were, they really drove it home by failing to commit a single dollar a single dollar to the implementation of the recommendations that will come from the historic Royal Commission into Disability Abuse, which will be handed down in December. Meaning that when those recommendations are handed down, disabled people will have to continue to wait until the next budget cycle, when some form of funding from recommendations, I assume, will be provided. And just in case that wasn't enough, they also failed to listen to the disability community and raise the rate of the disability support pension across the board, which is what we have been pleading with the government to do now for so long because of the expense 
of being disabled in Australia. Well, disabled people in this community will not cop this cut, and we will not be gaslit by any government or any minister that tries to tell us that a so-called target isn't a cut, particularly not from a mob that, when they were in opposition, made much hay out of the exact language from the Abbott government in relation to health and education. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, can I too echo and support uh, not all of the comments of my colleague, uh, Senator Steele John, but I too say shame on you, Labor, and hypoc hypocrisy. Your name is Bill Shorten. And if only his hypocrisy and his lies, and I, I use that word very carefully, uh, I'll withdraw that, uh, uh, his statements that do not reflect the reality. And let me just go through some of the reasons why. Before the election, as Senator Steele John has so passionately and eloquently highlighted, Bill Shorten, as Order. Opposition Senator Minister, Reynolds, use the correct title. As Minister Shorten, who was then uh, a shadow minister for the NDIS, spent months, he spent months, if not years, saying that there was no problem with the NDIS. He denied us any bipartisanship to implement significant change to the scheme and sensible changes to the scheme. And can I note that we have, uh, the Leader of the Opposition has offered that bipartisanship, uh, which has not yet been taken up. But the contempt at which Minister Shorten has now for transparency is breathtaking in its hypocrisy. Before the election, he was talking about transparency, and I agreed with him. So I introduced a monthly NDIS uh, statistics summary uh, in July 2021 to provide great transparency to everybody, uh, not only to participants and their families, but to members in this place. Uh, and also to families and anybody else interested in the NDIS. We produced monthly reports to show year on year what the changes and the trends were. Guess what? What is one of the first things that Minister Shorten has done this year? They've removed the monthly reports. No more transparency for everybody who is interested and engaged and relies on the NDIS. But even worse, uh, on the website, it says that they've stopped providing these monthly reports. They're now putting them in the quarterly reports. So they've gone from monthly to quarterly reports. But guess what? There hasn't been a quarterly report published this year. Uh, and the last one was actually December 2022. So since February this year, there has not been any transparency. And I think it is no coincidence that the NDIA keeps refusing to appear and finding every reason under the sun why they won't appear before the JCPAA to talk about their financial reports. I don't think that is a coincidence. So, so much for this great uh, man who believes in transparency. So the, ones, the, mo the motions uh, on notice that are the subject of this motion today are not the only ones. I have pages and pages and pages of questions that he has simply refused to answer. And when he does, the responses are contemptuous of this parliament and this place. For example, there are still, from March, many, many unanswered questions, uh, not only for Services Australia, of which he's also uh, responsible, but also for the NDIA. Now, when the minister came in, not only did he launch an 18-month review, which has pretty much put the whole scheme on hold, and including a lot of the reforms that we implemented, with almost no transparency, and when we ask questions about that in this place, he does not answer. So the minister, not only did he uh, put the entire scheme on pause for 18 months, even after 30 reviews of the scheme, he doesn't answer questions. So what he did do. So while he uh, put the whole scheme on pause for 18 months, he did actually carry out quite a very long uh, night or month of the long knives. Uh, while technically I, know I asked questions in relation to the resignations of the chair, Dennis Napthine, and also the CEO, Martin Hoffman, very important questions in terms of how their resignations came to be and whether the minister had actually 
suggested to them that they might like to resign. The minister has still yet not responded to those questions. And in fact, one of the responses I got in relation to that was quite gobsmacking in its uh, contempt of this place. So I asked this question, uh, the timeline, and I got an absolute response that said absolutely nothing. I have followed up with questions in March. We still do not have answers. This is such a critically important scheme, the third largest expenditure of our national budget, and he refuses expired. to answer any questions. We will change sides. Senator Roberts, I'll come to you next, but Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Asking questions and getting good answers to them is incredibly important for the workings of this Senate and the workings of the parliament. It is incredibly important for transparency. It is incredibly important so that the Australian public can have some understanding of the rationale behind decisions that are being made. This week is budget week. Budget is all about choices. But the budget is all about making one decision rather than another decision. Actually having some transparency so that you can work out why are these decisions being made is critical to see whether these are good decisions for the country or to see indeed whether they are decisions that have been made after lobbying by various vested interests. That's why it's important to get to be asking questions and to be getting good answers to questions. And it is very legitimate for this Senate to be taking this time to be focused on this, to be applying pressure, to be telling this government it is critical that when questions are asked that there are transparent answers with the detail that's required to be given. It's important when you see decisions that are made in this budget of ripping $74 billion out of the NDIS. It is outrageous that it is the, dis the community of disabled people here in Australia who are being asked to take the fall. They are the ones that are having to suffer because of the decisions being made in this budget. Now, if there was some good rationale, if you could be shown the government's workings out to say, yep, this money isn't needed, this is how it's not going to impact on services, you might be able to trust them. But when you ask questions about it, you get zero. You get silence. So it's pretty clear that the reason that $74 billion is being taken out of this budget is because the government's decided, well, the disabled community, they haven't got much political power. They will just have to suck it up. This is outrageous. And particularly when you put it in the context of other, um, other things that the disabled community and disabled people are having to, to put up with, we have had an absolutely paltry increase to the job seeker allowance of $2.85 a day, which won't even buy you a kilogram of potatoes, won't even buy you a loaf of bread. Absolutely. There was no increase, however, to the disability support pension, despite the recognition that people on the DSP actually need more support, they need more funding, they need more resources to be able to live a decent life. Zero increase to the disability support pension. People on the DSP are still in poverty. In my Senate inquiry into the extent and nature of poverty in Australia and our inquiry into the adequacy of the disability support pension last year, we have heard the most heartbreaking stories from people on the DSP and people with disabilities who should be on the DSP of the circumstances they are having to, to live in, of not being able to pay the rent, of not being able to afford food, let alone healthy food that's going to help them to, to stay well, not being able to afford their medications which is critical. When if you're on the DSP, you're there for a reason, and there are significant health costs. Not being able to afford to go and see specialists to help them deal with their, deal with their disability. This is what this government, these are the choices that are being made. And yet at the same time, we are having the choices to be going ahead with the stage three tax cuts. At the same time as we're ripping $74 billion out of the budget from the National Disability Insurance Scheme, there is $254 billion that is being given away to the wealthy. There's been given away in $9,000 a year tax cuts. At the same time as the people on the NDIS are having that money ripped out of them, ripped away from them, Every single one of us in this place, every single politician is going to get a $9,000 a year tax cut. 
We are going to get an extra $25 a day in our pockets compared with what the cuts that are being made to people with disability, the cuts that are being made to, all, to, to other people who are, who are struggling to get by. These are the choices that are being made. We absolutely need to have transparency and accountability to show up how inadequate and how wrong these choices are being made are. We need to know the rationale for not increasing um, payments above the rates that they currently had. We need to know the rationale as to why the petroleum resource rent tax is only going to bring in an extra $3 billion when it could bring in an extra 30. billion. That's right. Transparency and accountability is critical. Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts, you have a call. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Now, I like Senator Farrell. He's a good bloke. We don't always agree, and I accept that he's overseas right now. Yet his repeated non-responses are not acceptable. His behaviour is not acceptable, because answering questions is important for accountability. The people that we serve deserve honesty and accountability. Senators. There's only one word to describe this government's attitude to Senate estimates, to questions on notice and to the orders for, for the production of documents. That word is contempt. They continue to treat this chamber with contempt. Almost every, Senate, every order by this Senate to produce information is met by this government with contempt. And it is appropriate that we begin to treat the ministers who treat this Senate with contempt appropriately. We have had explanation after explanation after explanation from ministers. Ministers are all too happy to come into this place and cop a lashing for an hour and continue to refuse to produce the information that this Senate has ordered, that this Senate has ordered. The explanations are not good enough, intentionally inadequate, and it is not good enough that this Senate continues to accept them without any further action. It's time for this Senate to use its constitutionally enshrined powers, constitutionally enshrined powers, to hold ministers to account. And that must be through charges of contempt when they, are, when they continue to disrespect this Senate's orders. I remind senators that it is this Senate, not the government dominated privileges committee, that makes the final determination on matters of contempt. If this Senate is not happy with the Minister's disobedience of a direct order, then the Senate itself can vote on contempt, which we would do and which should happen. The time for meaningless, hollow, blather in explanation after explanation after explanation is over. Start serving the people or face contempt motions. There are jail cells in the basement. It's time for the executive government to be reminded why they're there. That's not a joke. That is fact. It's time for the, go for the government to be reminded why the jail cells are in the basement. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I too uh, rise to speak on the answers provided uh, through Minister Farrell uh, um, from uh, Minister Shorten. Now, I've been involved in this place in a couple of capacities for quite a long time now, coming on 13 years, uh, five of them as a senator. And, and I actually probably read more questions on notice, answers to questions on notice, uh, as, as a member of staff in my previous life. And I have read literally many thousands, many, many thousands of answers to questions on notice. And I cannot remember, I cannot recall amps, answers that are as sneeringly contemptuous as my good friend Senator Scar described them, as arrogant, as patronising, as hubristic as the answers that we are looking at here today. And just to give those listening or those reading on Hansard an idea of the questions. You might think that they were highly politically charged questions, questions that deserved a political answer in some way. So let me just read a couple of the questions out to you, just to demonstrate that they are completely reasonable, legitimate, straightforward questions. What is the current efficiency dividend rate 
for your department and any relevant agencies. Are any agencies or other entities within the portfolio exempt from the efficiency dividend? If so, please list them. Is the efficiency dividend referenced in the portfolio budget statement for your department? If so, where? And are there any agencies or entities that have an efficiency dividend that is higher or lower than the rate applied to the department? If so, please list them. Fairly straightforward question, asking about a technical matter in the budget. This is not that any question deserves such a contemptuous answer, but if you are listening to that question, then the answer served up by the minister does, displays such a level of contempt, not for us, not for the askers of the questions, though there is contempt for that, but for this place, for this chamber. We speak a lot in this chamber about the need for civility, order, uh, about the need to, to uh, maintain the comity of the chamber. This flies directly in the face of those demands, those, those requests from the chair on a regular occurrence. In fact, just this morning, the president of the Senate uh, asked that we respect the chamber. We respect the chamber. These answers do not respect the chamber. Again, let's look at the second question under consideration today. Not a highly politically charged question. In fact, a very straightforward question that deserves a straightforward answer. Has the minister, the minister's office or the minister's department met with any representative of employee or employees of Anacta Strategies Pty in relation to TikTok, either in person, via video conference or phone? If so, what was the date, time and duration of the meeting? Very straightforward question. All it requires is a very simple answer. It does not require a political attack on us. It does not require the contempt displayed of this chamber and its processes, of this parliament and its processes that we received from the minister. Order. Sorry, Senator Pratt, I believe you're Order. interjecting over there, but the contempt displayed in these answers is appalling, and you should be ashamed of the way your government Brotman, is treating. You will ignore the, the interjections, and you'll address your remarks through the chair. Interjections are always disorderly, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Through you, I would say that answers to questions on notice such as this are also, in their own way, disorderly. They are a contempt of this place and demonstrate that this is a government, arrogant, hubristic, but one that still thinks it's in opposition. These answers, these answers that we see are the answers of a political party that is still in the mentality of opposition. At some point, they have to realise they need to start behaving like a government. Sadly, I don't think Whatever that realisation will ever come. Expired. Senator Walters. Thanks very much, Acting uh, Deputy President. Well, you know what's happening here? The government is trying to hide their cuts to disability services. They're trying to hide the efficiency dividend cuts through giving virtually useless responses to these questions on notice. And they were very cagey about their cuts to the NDIS in Tuesday night's budget. But it's coming to light now, thanks to the forensic investigation of Senator Steelejohn, $74 billion is being cut from the NDIS. And you know what? Some of the tiny, tiny little bits of sugar that they've sprinkled around to other cohorts of desperate people who deserve far more, they're not kicking in anytime soon. They've got to wait a few months. You know what's kicking in on the 1st of July? The cuts to the NDIS. As if it wasn't insult enough to find $74 billion for some pathetic surplus off the back of people with a disability, those cuts are going to come in virtually straight away, and everybody else's meagre sprinklings of inadequate support have to wait. So uh, and the priorities of this government just continue to surprise and deeply disappoint me, and I'm sure many people 
out there in the community. So we're here today because they weren't answering questions on notice properly about cuts to disability services. Now that itself is troubling, the lack of transparency and the lack of respect to actually respond to questions um, that were very reasonable and deserved to be asked and deserved to be answered. But this government hasn't responded properly, and now they're disguising the fact that there's a $74 billion cut to the NDIS in the budget. And if you take a look at what else disabled people got served up on Tuesday night, there was a tiny, tiny increase to income support for young people and for people who are seeking work. Tiny, $2.85 a day. I mean, almost insulting in its uselessness. Sure, every dollar will help, but it is so far below the poverty line. But you know who didn't get that increase? People on the disability support pension. The, the government didn't even have the decency to increase the DSP. But no, they, they certainly had the temerity to cut $74 billion from the NDIS and have that cut kick in from the 1st of July. It, it's it's sh absolutely shocking. Now, I recall Labor promising that they wouldn't make changes to the NDIS without a co-design process with people with disability. Now, that was, a, that was an appropriate commitment. But where was that co-design process in cutting $74 billion? It did not happen. And as Senator Steeljong has said, the disability community will fight these cuts and the Greens will be there every step or roll of the way. Now, this budget leaves millions of people behind, including people with disability. And budgets are about choices. And one of their wafer thin political surplus, it's off the back of people with a disability. It's off the back of women who are seeking support fleeing violence, who, where frontline services still don't have the funding that they need to help everyone who seeks um, their help. It's off the back of uh, people who deserved far more of an increase in the pathetically inadequate income support that keeps people jobless because they can't afford to get to the job interview, to have a decent shirt to wear, um, to, to be job ready. This is a, a budget that just so deeply disappoints and leaves so many Australians behind. And I thought that was meant to be the tagline. Well, you're not doing what you said on the tin. And I'm afraid people are going to notice you can't really get away with it. And when you've got a wafer thin surplus and inadequate provision for people that really need it, but you're failing to cut $254 billion of unnecessary tax perks to mostly wealthy white men, people are going to notice. Budgets indicate what your priorities are. And nuclear submarines, billions of dollars, fossil fuel subsidies, $41 billion over the Fords, perks to property investors and moguls that are part of the problem and part of why housing is so unaffordable, billions of dollars in perks to them, $254 billion to wealthy white blokes who already have enough money and certainly don't need any more support. That's who's getting benefit from this budget. And yet you're hiding the fact that you're cutting $74 billion from the NDIS. I thought we had a change of government. We expected a change of policy and a change of approach. Do better. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. At, at its core, what we're discussing here are, are, are two elements. Uh, the first is it's another broken promise fr from Labor, which, which I'll come to shortly. But secondly, it is a, a breach of, of the separation of powers because the executive should be accountable to parliament. And, and I'll deal with both those issues in turn. One of the characteristics of, of this government has been its propensity to, to make promises from quite outlandish ones to, you'd think, quite sensible ones, and then break those promises. Uh, and particularly before the election, when they were attempting to garner the support of, of the Australian people. Um, and we should not forget that the Prime Minister said, if you make a promise and a commitment, you have to stick to it. Well, ironically, he also broke that promise. Um, because remember, they promised to cut electricity bills by $275. Labor and Prime Minister Albanese said that 70, 97 times before the last election. Uh, they promised cheaper mortgages. 
uh, we've had about 10 interest rises uh, impacting on people's mortgages uh, since the election. It's another broken promise. Remember the promise of, of no changes to super, broken, uh, lower inflation, broken, that uh, they're not going to touch people's franking credits, broken, uh, industry-wide bargaining is not part of our policy in relation to industrial relations, broken, we'll be doing our bit to assist real wage increases, broke that promise also, we're not about raising taxes, well, broke that one numerous times, and they're going to cut the cost of consultants and contractors, well, they broke that promise. But the promise they've, that we're discussing here this morning is the promise that they would be an, account, an accountable and transparent government. And they've broken that promise. And, and no doubt Minister Shorten and, and his staff sitting in, in, on the blue carpet wing of this building think this is all a bit of a laugh and are sitting there watching the screen, uh, giggling away at opposition senators and minor party senators um, raising our concerns about the approach of the government. They probably do think it's a big laugh, and it's not. Because it is quite sad and it's quite juvenile, the answers that were given. They're sort of not even the answers you'd expect from a, a first-year politics student, or indeed from one of the students who um, occasionally come into the gallery upstairs here, whether from on year six or seven or, or later in high school. It, it appears that, that the minister's office have maybe gone to Wikipedia or, or used chat GPT just to think of, of to find answers to think how can we how can we snub our noses at, at the Senate? How, how can we how can we disrespect the Senate? But what they've done with their answers to the questions asked by, by, my, by, by my colleagues is they've actually snubbed their noses at at the people who are affected by, by the issues. And, and you've heard from, from colleagues from a range of political views across this chamber about their concerns with how the NDIS is, is, is operating and has operated. And we, we do disagree uh, um, along that particular spectrum. But we all want answers from the government. And when you get a, an answer to a question on notice, and in particular the one that was, that was asked by my colleague Senator Jane Hume, where it is just so rude, it's just so patronising, and it's just, it's just wrong that any parliament, that any elected body would be treated in such a manner by, by members of the executive in relation to answers, to answers that are put on notice. So for those who don't understand, a question on notice is like, like a take-home exam. You get, get the question and you've got a period of time to answer it. Now, questions on notice, you've got up to sometimes two weeks, four weeks, whatever it is that the government is, is always late with, with its answers. But it's not, you're not doing it on, 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 on the run. It gives an opportunity for the opposition to ask serious questions and for serious answers Order. to be given. Your time has expired. Senator Cox. Acting De Deputy President, I wish to also uh, add my voice to this issue and echo the statements made by my colleagues who have spoken on this very important matter. And, and so very few times we agree with uh, the opposition, um, but agree with their commentary around this. And it's particularly relevant coming out of this budget that we all had some hope. We had some hopes that a new government, new change, new policy, as Senator Waters outlined. And to learn that $74 billion would be cut from the NDIS is beyond, beyond unacceptable for those disabled people across Australia, the ones that my colleague here from Western Australia, uh, Senator Steelejohn, works with and does so much amazing work with. So thank you for your work. And so much for Labor stating that no one will be left behind. When you do that in your campaign logo and that's your mantra, you actually have to walk that on and continue to do that and not leave people behind. Not leave people behind. When you deliver your budget, 
and set your priorities, you are not to leave people behind, and that includes disabled people in this country. It's shameful that this government can sit in this chamber and hold their heads high when they're doing this to disabled people. They do not trust the major parties of this country, to be, especially because they've had that experience over the last decade, and they continue to be stabbed in the back by the Liberals who did it for a decade, and now Labor have picked up their mantle and continue to do this to disabled people across this country. And I want to talk specifically to the double disadvantage that happens for First Nations people yep. who are disabled yep. in this country. The First Peoples Disable, uh, Disability Network of Australia have done some incredible work fighting in this space for NDIS to be better supported for First Nations people across this country. And they actually estimate that there are 60,000 First Nations people who should be participating. Should is the operative word here in the NDIS, but in reality there are actually much fewer disabled people who are getting the support that they deserve. And there's many, many reasons why. And this includes years of long wait lists to actually access NDIS's yep. assessment yep. process because there's lots of First Nations people who live in rural and remote areas, yep. meaning that sometimes they actually can't get that access. It's only available to them who have the means and capacity to travel hundreds of kilometres to access these services. This means you might need to have a car. You also potentially might need to have someone else drive that car, depending on what your disability is. Yep. You've got to pay for fuel, you've got to be able to have the time to drive those hours, potentially pay for accommodation if you can't make that trip in one day. You've got to pay that some accommodation. And these costs add up very, very quickly, making it simply unfeasible for many First Nations people and let's not forget, everyone, that we are in a cost of living crisis and we're expecting people with disabilities, First Nations people who live in some of those rural and remote areas, to travel to those services. And I'm sure people in this chamber don't need a geography lesson, but Australia is actually quite large and quite vast and it's a very spread out nation, especially true for uh, my home state of Western Australia. Um, in a previous life, I, before I entered this workplace, I worked in a place called the Goldfields, and it's quite a remote part of Western Australia. And the nearest service centre there is some approximate 600 kilometres away to Perth. Now imagine a First Nations disabled person who might not have their first language as English having to travel to get services under the NDIS. Not only is there cultural sens sensitivities in the mainstream disability services, they're simply not enough. And the one million measly dollars, I'm going to use Senator McGrath's uh, quote of the sugar hit uh, that uh, I'll borrow from him today, the little sprinkles that have been given is not enough for those some 60,000 potential First Nations people for NDI NDIS. This is a big slap in the face for disabled people and for my people in particular. Asking questions on notice in this place is important, is part of healthy and transparent democracy, and there have been significant changes that have been announced in the budget. We need those answers to be able to relate those questions to our constituents. Labor promised no big changes without co-design. Co-design means you involve people, not just rip out $74 billion out of the budget for NDIS. Although your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, th this is a very serious issue that we are discussing here today in the Senate. Uh, it's an issue of contempt of this place. There's been very serious, sincere questions that have been put uh, to the minister, or ministers in this case, and we've had uh, a very contemptuous response to those questions, Senator Hume and Senator Patterson, in putting those questions on notice. Now, I try to be—I try, as always, to be to be very measured uh, in my language and the way that uh, I approach debates. So I try as best I can to, to bring a, 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 a you know, I don't try to conflate or, or overstate the, the seriousness of an issue. But I've got to say, this is quite genuinely one of the most serious issues of contempt that I've seen in this place. I've only been here for three and a bit years, three and a half years or so, uh, but this is already the, the, the most contentious issue that I've seen. Now, normally, 
Uh, we do see some confected outrage on, on debates and issues and the contributions that have been made by my colleagues uh, on this side and indeed my colleagues uh, in the Greens Party uh, that they've made are, are presenting some very serious issues because the questions that were asked go to very important points uh, that matter because they matter be it to our national security or they matter in the case of the NDIS to, to people needing the services of the NDIS. And it's a very disappointing point indeed that the questions, the very sincere questions that have been put, have been answered in such contemptuous ways. Uh, sometimes I, I feel sorry for, for ministers who have to come in and be, be given, the op, given the job of, of defending the indefensible. Um, and, but I'm actually not going to feel sorry for Senator Ayres in this instance, because even in his response, uh, he, I feel, was uh, um, uh, discourteous to to the Senate in the way that he, uh, in the answer that he provided in responding on behalf of of the minister here today. Uh, he was given a, a tough job to do, but uh, he could have dealt with it uh, in a in a less uh, contemptuous way. And I think that's a, a poor reflection um, on, on the, the good order of, of this chamber. Because, of course, as Senator Brockman was saying in his contribution, uh, it's not just when these issues come up, it's not just an issue of uh, being discourteous or disrespectful to the questioner, the senator who's asking the question, but indeed to this chamber. And the good working nature of this chamber is important. We have a role to do. We're not here as individuals. We are here representing our communities. I'm here. I've been elected, duly elected, by the people of Western Australia to come in here and ask questions. Now, of course, as others have remarked, sometimes we, in the heat of a battle, of, of a debate on, on policy or issues, we can uh, there can be a bit of political to and fro. Uh, but this was a question that was put on notice, which, as Senator McGrath was, was, was remarking, uh, when it's put on notice, there's a, a due date that's usually uh, more than two weeks away. So it gives a chance for the, the minister to seek advice from his departments, from his agencies, to, as to regard to the substance of the answer that's required by that question. And the question that was, that was put in this regard, the question that was actually uh, provided, particularly, and I just want to read it out in relation to the NDIS question, uh, the question was asked by Senator Hume, what is the current efficiency dividend rate for your department and any relevant agencies? Are there any agencies or uh, are any agencies or other entities within the portfolio exempt from the efficiency dividend? If so, please list them. And it goes on. We're very very, very straightforward questions requiring just a factual response. But in return, uh, Minister Farrell, in his response, provided a very political answer that didn't go anywhere near, uh, didn't mention the budget, didn't mention any efficiency dividend, did nothing about finances, didn't even mention the NDIS, because this was a question of the NDIS minister. Didn't even go there. Anything to do with the agency, and it's a, it's a very disrespectful Order. point. Your time has expired, Senator Shubridge. Oh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, these non-answers or embarrassing responses show not just contempt for the for the Senate, but but worse still, contempt for the disability community. This is a government that made the promise of co-design on NDS. Nothing about us without us was the promise that was made. And then in this budget, they deliver $74 billion in cuts to the NDIS. Secret cuts, hidden in footnotes. Nothing about us, with, nothing about us without us. Well, this budget is a disgraceful betrayal of the disability community. And I think it's important in this debate to put some of the words of those extraordinary uh, activists and campaigners from within the disability community about what the NDIS means and why this betrayal cuts to the bone. And particularly, I want to put Order. the words on of Senator L. Gibbs. Shoebridge, I'm afraid the time for this debate has expired. Uh, so we will now uh, put the question that the motion moved by Senator Birmingham to take note 
uh, is agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Uh, put the question, Senator Shoebridge. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Shoebridge, no point of order? I, I, no, I just seek leave of the House to table four paragraphs of contribution from L Gibbs, a disability yes, activist from my home granted. state, on this matter. Uh, it hasn't been distributed, so well, I'm not happy to granted. distribute. I'll seek leave I'll let again. You deal, I'll let you deal with the clerks later, Senator Shoebridge. The Senate you. will now proceed to the consideration of government business, and I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023 and Related Bills, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Scar, I believe. Green, sorry, in continuation. Thank you very much. And I'm very pleased in the very short time that I have to finish my contribution by again explaining to those watching that what we have seen every single day in this chamber every single day this week is the Greens political party teaming up with the Liberal Party, the National Party and today One Nation to block this bill, to filibuster this bill, to make sure that we don't vote on affordable and social housing, on a bill that will provide 30,000 homes affordable and social housing, something that we know people desperately need. This is what we have seen every single day this week, teaming up to stop this bill with the Liberal and National Party. That's what we've seen from the Greens. And the only thing in continuing to play these political games that can be said about the Greens political party is that they have come in here and are betray betraying, betraying the very real people that they supposedly come here to represent. Because that is the only explanation of what they are doing and the behaviour that they are displaying in this chamber and throughout this House in blocking this important legislation and in doing so sitting with the very people who made sure that over a decade we had no investment in affordable and social housing. Well, it is clear where they stand. It is clear that the Greens Party want to make sure that in sitting with the Liberal National Party that we block this bill. But they are also in doing that, standing in the way of 30,000 affordable social affordable homes, funding for domestic violence uh, homes, funding for families that are leaving domestic violence, Indigenous remote housing repairs, $100 million of that, and also housing for veterans. Th those are the people that the Greens Party are turning their back on, and they're choosing to make sure that this is an issue where, the, where it is very clear where the Labor Party stands. They Order. don't want to even Your go to a vote on this bill. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I want to put some facts, some facts on the record in relation to this bill and what is being proposed, because there is a lot being said about this bill in the public sphere, the $10 billion Housing Australia Fund. But it is important that everyone understands what is actually proposed in this bill. So what is proposed is that the government goes out today and borrows $10 billion. So it goes out today and borrows $10 billion, then gives that $10 billion to the Future Fund to invest, not in housing, but to invest, and it could invest in shares. Australian shares, international shares, bank government bonds both here and overseas, etc. And then the return, the return up to a particular cap from those investments would then be invested in housing. So does anyone see any problem with that? The obvious problem is, well, what happens after you borrow $10 billion at, say, 4 per cent interest because we're in a high inflationary environment, and then the Future Fund tries to invest that money to generate a return, and there will only be money going to housing all of the laudable goals which have been referred to by the Labor Party if that fund generates a positive return. Now, if you're in a high inflationary environment, if you're in an economically difficult environment, then one would have thought the risks that that return won't be generated to enable investment in social housing, in that environment those risks are heightened. So you can get the perverse 
the perverse outcome when social housing is needed at its most, your investment in the housing fund, in shares, in bonds, etc., is low, it doesn't produce the return to enable you to invest in the social housing you desperately need at that point in time. That's the perversity in terms of from a policy perspective, in terms of what's being proposed. The government had the option. The government has the option now to say borrow, because everything the government does now is on, based on borrowings, borrow $500 million today rather than $10 billion, borrow $500 million, issue that money in grants and get houses started to be built today. They could do that now. But what they're proposing is to borrow $10 billion, give it to the Australian Future, give it to the future Fund to invest in shares, international equities, domestic equities, bonds, etc. And it's only the return from that investment that will go into housing. Why? Why are they proposing this? And if you want to know the dangers of it, all you need to do is look at the annual report 2021-22 of the Future Fund. So the Future Fund is the fund which will be investing this $10 billion in shares, international equities, etc. So what happened to the returns in the Future Fund in the period up to 30 June 2022. And all you, do, all you need to do is ha have a look at the chair's forward, the report from the chairman. And this is what he says, and I quote, in a year in which global equities and global bonds fell by more than 10 per cent each and where the Australian stock market fell 6.5 per cent, the return of negative 1.2 per cent was a pleasing outcome. So in the period up to 30 June 2022, if that $10 billion had been borrowed by the government, given to the Future Fund, which then went out and invested them in shares, domestic shares, international shares, bonds, etc., its pleasing outcome, pleasing outcome was a negative 1.2 per cent return, not even taking into account inflation. It would have gone backwards. And at the same time, you've got to pay interest on the borrowings. No houses, increased debt increased interest payments, none of those laudable goals achieved. And that's why those opposite are opposing this piece of legislation. I, and with due respect, I've, I've heard the Greens put forward the same argument with respect to the uh, non-secretary that goes to the heart of what is being proposed. You're borrowing $10 billion today to invest it in shares in a very difficult economic environment, and only if it generates return will anything be invested in housing. It doesn't make sense. Negative 1.2 per cent for the Future Fund for 30 June 2022. And the Future Fund also, also invests other Future Funds in relation to a range of areas. And what were those results? The Medical Research Future Fund delivered a return of 0.1 per cent per annum in 2021 to 22. So you're borrowing money at, say, there's a bond issue that finishes finished yesterday at 3.25 per cent interest. So borrow $10 billion at 3.25 per cent interest. That's $325 million interest a year. And then you generate a 0.1 per cent return on the $10 billion, which isn't going anywhere near even coming your interest. So there's nothing goes into housing. You're actually going backwards. You're going backwards. The pool of funds to invest is going backwards. It's diminishing. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Land and Sea Future Fund returned negative 0.2 per cent for the year. The Future Drought Fund and Emergency Response Fund delivered returns of negative 0.2 per cent per annum and negative 0.1 per cent per annum. The Disability Care Australia Fund delivered an annual return of negative 0.4 per cent. So they all went backwards. Every single fund, every single fund which the Future Fund managed for the period up to 30 June 2022, went backwards, negative return. Plus, you've got to pay the interest on the $10 billion of debt which you borrowed up front. Does it make sense to you? Does it make sense? When instead of borrowing $10 billion, you could arguably borrow $500 million today and invest that $500 million direct into housing. Isn't that a better idea? And yet those opposite are wedded to this proposal of the $10 billion big sugar hit. Now, what is this about? I mean, when you, you put forward that logic, which seems to me pretty straightforward based on 
uh, fiscal policy, based on economics policy, based upon risk management, cost-benefit return, it seems pretty straightforward to me that what the government should be doing is working out how much it wants to invest today in terms of those laudable housing goals and actually borrowing that amount to be spent today. That makes sense. That makes sense, but they're not doing it. They want the big hit of being able to say $10 billion housing fund, as if $10 billion is going to be invested today in housing. When what I've just outlined demonstrates, demonstrates conclusively that you may get nothing invested in housing because it all depends upon the return in the markets, and even worse, you may go backwards. So you borrowed an extra $10 billion. That's inflationary. That puts pre upward pressure on interest rates. It necessarily has to put upward pressure on interest rates because you're going out in the market borrowing $10 billion instead of $500 million. So you've got to find extra homes for that money. You've got to find people who are prepared to bid into that bond in the issue and take the $10 billion instead of the $500 million. So potentially you've got to make it more attractive for them. They've got greater leverage, supply and demand, basic economics. So it puts upward pressure on interest rates. And then at the end of this process, you might ha not have a single dollar to actually invest into a social housing uh, project. Not a single dollar. It doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense at all. And that, that basic illogic going to the heart of what is proposed by the government has not been explained by any of those sitting opposite. All we hear, as you heard from Senator Green before I rose to my feet, was passionate, good faith, no doubt, uh, assertions that we've got to do this today in order to provide homes to worthy people in the community who, who, who need housing. And there is a chronic shortage of housing at the moment in this country. There's no question about that. But there's no explanation as to why this is the right model. When the government could today go out and borrow, say, $500 million or $1 billion instead of $10 billion and immediately invest that money into housing and not put that investment in housing at risk, that, it, that the future fund will not get returns on the markets when it invests the proposed $10 billion. And that illogic that goes to the heart of what is proposed by the government has not been explained. It has not been explained. There's been much toing and froing between the Greens and the Labor Party, and we've sat back, we've eaten our popcorn and watched the show this morning. But in terms of in terms of delivering policy results on the ground for those who need that social housing, women and children escaping terrible domestic violence, veterans, the elderly. There is no explanation as to the, why the government doesn't take the more prudent approach, which I think ticks all the boxes. It's not as inflationary. It doesn't put as much upward pressure on interest rates. There's more certainty with respect to the delivery of social housing in a more timely manner, there's no explanation as to why that can't occur. So analysis has been undertaken. What would have happened if this legislation had been passed in the month after the, Australian, the new government got elected? And based on those current statistics in terms of the future fund, there would have been a loss of approximately $370 million on that $10 billion. A loss. When in fact they could borrow, the government could borrow a more prudent amount, a more modest amount of still substantial, five hundred, a billion dollars, and invest that in social housing today. And yet that is not what is proposed. That is not what is proposed. So it's very, very important that the people of Australia understand what is being proposed by the government today. It is not a situation where the government is proposing to put $10 billion directly into housing today. It is a proposal where the government will borrow $10 billion, get the future fund to invest that $10 billion in the share market, international share market, government bonds, equities, private equity, whatever it is, whatever it is, and then only the returns from that $10 billion which is invested will go in to provide housing. And that's the risk, and that goes to the core of the ob objection that the coalition has with respect to this policy. In my remaining time, I do want to correct the record those opposite are fond uh, now they're on the government benches to say the previous government has done nothing in its previous nine years in government in relation to anything. 
And I just want to put on the record uh, in the time I've got available in terms of the government initiatives, uh, when we were in government, our initiatives with respect to housing. So under the coalition, our housing policy supported more than 300,000 Australians to purchase a home. More than 300,000 Australians to purchase a home. We supported more than 21,000 social and affordable homes through the establishment of the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation. 21,000 social and affordable homes were supported by the coalition government through the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation. After nine months in office, the government hasn't built one. They haven't contributed to one. In nine years of government, we contributed to 21,000 social and affordable housing units. Under the coalition, first home buyers reached their highest level for nearly 15 years. In 15 years, those, those first home buyers, and a record number for nearly 15 years, it went from approximately 100,000 a year when we came to office to nearly 180,000 in our last year in government. An extra 80,000 Australians became first homeowners during our last term of government. Fantastic result. In addition, the National Housing Infrastructure Facility established a $1 billion perpetual facility financing critical housing related infrastructure to speed up the supply of new housing through the provision of loans and grants and making of investments. We also established an affordable housing bond aggregator providing cheaper and longer term finance to registered community housing providers. The National Housing and Finance and Investment Corporation was a landmark coalition achievement. $2.9 billion of low-cost loans to community housing providers support 15,000 social and affordable dwellings, saving $470 million in interest payments, which could then be reinvested in affordable housing. We unlocked 6,900 social, affordable and market dwellings through our $1 billion infrastructure facility, supported more than 60,000 first home buyers through the home guarantee schemes. And I've personally spoken to people who took advantage of that home guarantee scheme to buy their first home. And we protected the residential construction industry with more than 137,000 home builder applications. And lastly, through our first home super saver scheme, helped 27,600 first home buyers accelerate their deposit savings through super. So typically young Australians who could access their super, because after all it's their money, and then invest that to pay for their deposit on their invariably their first home. So that's the roll call of achievement of the coalition government. So if those opposite want to get up and say the coalition government has done nothing, those listening to the debate should compare their comments with the actual facts on the record. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the many different people who make up our one Queensland community, the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023 and related bills introduces a seriously flawed concepts. Many flawed concepts. The bill establishes the Housing Australia Future Fund to make funds available for Housing Australia to make grants and loans in relation to acute housing needs, social housing or affordable housing. More bureaucracy. The Treasury Laws Amendment, Housing Measures No. 1, Bill 2023, renames the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation to Housing Australia. More bureaucracy. This is a clear difference between the Liberal and Labor parties. The Liberal Party names their reckless, wasteful market interventions as corporations. The Labor Party gives their reckless, wasteful market interventions grander names. Housing Australia sounds so big, so comforting, so reassuring, yet it falsely implies the Prime Minister has the, has the housing crisis sorted when he is way off target. He's making it worse. Prime Minister Albanese's solution is not to slow down the obscene level of immigration pouring into cities without homes for them to occupy. No, his solution is to not address foreign investors buying and locking up new homes so they can be sold as brand new in a few years' time when values increase. His solution is not to address short-term rental, rentals pushing long-term rentals out of the housing market. No, his solution is an investment fund that will make no noticeable improvement to the housing crisis. And here's the data around that. 
The Australian Bureau of Statistics puts the number of Australian dwellings at 10 million. This bill pretends to add 30,000 new dwellings, or 0.3 of a percent increase. The total value of Australian dwellings is just under $10 trillion. We need as much as $1 trillion worth of new housing by 2030 to meet the needs of everyday Australians, including migrants. This government is offering $2.5 billion. That's 0.025 per cent. The government can't build enough homes to fix this. Only private enterprise can meet Australia's needs. What created this mess? Red tape, green tape and blue tape created this mess, plus high interest rates from a flawed Reserve Bank strategy and inflation from bad government management has created this mess. The only thing that will work is getting government out of the way and letting free enterprise fix this mess. Anything else is dishonesty, reckless dishonesty. This bill is dishonest. Not only does this bill not solve the housing problem for people who are already here, it does not solve the housing problems for the millions that will arrive by 2030. Either the Albanese government is deliberately misrepresenting the outcome of the bill, or there is more here than the paperwork suggests. So let's see what else we have here. The Treasury Laws Amendment, Housing Measures No. 1 Bill 2023, streamlines the functions of Housing Australia, oddly by making it bigger. Establish an annual review mechanism for the National Housing Infrastructure Facility and extend the Commonwealth guarantee of the liabilities of Housing Australia to apply to contracts entered into until 30th of June 2028. This last one is interesting. In Queensland, a number of construction companies have gone broke recently. The main reason is because, thanks to the government, we have high inflation and home builders use fixed price contracts. The last thing you want in a fixed price contract is high inflation taking the profit margin and pushing the builder into a loss on every home they build. Who is going to build the homes now that private enterprise can no longer shoulder their fair share of the burden? Well, the government, of course. Or is it? Or so it says. I'm sure Albani Anthony Albanese's mates in those big union superannuation funds uh, are out there recruiting order. builders as we speak. Senator Roberts, remember to address the Prime Minister by his correct title. Prime Minister Albanese's mates in those big union superannuation funds are out there recruiting builders as we speak, ready to open their construction division to build and own Australian housing. If the project runs over budget, who cares? It's taxpayer money. After all, the government is giving a liability guarantee, so just shovel that government money right in there. This bill will distort the housing construction market. On one hand, suppliers are under pressure to hold costs down to make private sector construction affordable for everyday Australians to build and own their homes. On the other hand, Housing Australia will be out there paying top dollar to get their materials and labour to deliver their homes to keep their jobs. What could go wrong with that? The, the Albanese government could have worked with the supply chain and with banks to put in place supply chain security to keep existing builders in business. Instead, it went the Soviet route again, pushed the private sector aside and let the government build it. The third part of this package is the National Housing Supply and Affordability Council Bill 2023. That streamlining thing I mentioned earlier apparently extends to creating a whole new advisory body called the National Housing Supply and Affordability Council to advise the Commonwealth Government on matters related to housing supply and affordability. More bureaucracy. We have the Productivity Commission and we have the Australian Bureau of Statistics to provide this economic and statistical data already. We have an entire Federal Department of Housing to advise the Minister. Now we have a whole new body as well, more bureaucrats. Where is the corresponding reduction in the Department's budget allocation reflecting a substantially reduced workload? Bigger government is the Labor Party's answer to everything. History would disagree. The numbers on this bill do not add up. The Housing Australia Future Fund, half, will receive $10 billion to fund the delivery of 30,000 social and affordable homes and allocate an additional $330 million to acute housing needs over the half's first five years. That's the Housing Australia Future Fund. Oh, really? I notice, though, that the budget line item for this bill is $15.2 billion. The explanatory memorandum states the Housing Australia Future Fund would be credited with $10 billion as soon as practicable after establishment. Where's the other $5 billion going? Once invested, the Housing Australia Future 
Future Fund would provide up to $500 million per year, up to $500 million per year to support social and affordable housing. That's a 5% return on investment, which is nice if you can get it in the current investment market. The Future Fund can't. Their return on the funds invested in calendar 2022 was negative 3.7. The fund would be reduced and no houses built. So borrowed money, interest costs, lost money, no homes built. Even at 5% return on investment, a $500 million investment divided dividend over five years, that's $2.5 billion, divided by the 30,000 homes, that's $83,300 per home. One may speculate these are going to be really tiny homes, yet the truth is likely much worse than that, far worse. What would a home built by this Labor government actually look like? Subdivisions will be of the modern design, with narrow streets, because cars are an environmental sin, and we will never have the generation capacity for everyday Australians to use electric cars. Those are for the city elites, the nomenclature, Eliminating excavation for obsolete parking garages will save money. Residents will, will instead walk or ride children's scooters. Shopping will be delivered by drone from BlackRock and Vanguard-owned businesses like Amazon, Coles and Woolworths. Cameras will keep you safe and inside your 15-minute allocated region. Are cameras coming out of the $83,000 for the each house or are local governments paying for those? Home units will be constructed to the four corners of each block and the landscaping which used to soften these buildings no longer allowed because pointless plants waste water. Canberra's posh Red Hill suburb, where senior bureaucrats live, gets beauty, while everyday Australians get utility. Well, they get cell blocks, really. Ceilings will be lowered, walkways narrowed, and walls made thinner to squeeze additional units into low-rise blocks without lifts. With a daily water allowance of 120 litres per person per day, I remember receiving a presentation on that target back in 2019. A standard bathtub holds 180 litres, <laughs> so baths are every bit as much environmental vandalism as gas stoves. Don't laugh, Senator Dunningham. Toilets, toilets will be half flush only. I don't get this one. Is there like a little electric charge that zaps you if you flush twice? How does that actually save water? This is. Smart water meters will police water limits and make home and balcony gardens impossible to keep watered. So purchasing food from corporate supermarkets or corporate takeaways will be the only way to eat. Smart electricity meters will police our daily energy allowance and remotely switch off unapproved appliances. All of these things are the current ideology of modern urban design, stated in writing. Many of these are already evident in council building codes. Smart meters are being deployed as we speak. Once the reality of having to sell a home built to these standards is removed by government ownership of all these measures, this will be standard. Even applying hive home ideology can, cost the, can, the, can the cost come down to $83,000 per house? <laughs> I doubt it. But to use a yardstick of $400,000 or more is to ignore the real intent of the bill, which is a principle we are hearing a lot lately. You will own nothing and be happy or else. After the bill passes, the minister will de then decide where and how the money will be spent. After the bill passes, we'll get the details. Disbursement includes grants, including grants made under the scheme, will be a budget measure, meaning the Senate can't disallow. The legislation does not include the rules around who can and can't get a grant or disbursement. So this bill is really a $2.5 billion blank check. Clause 49 would allow the Future Fund Board to use derivatives for certain purposes. This would include using derivatives as a risk management tool or to achieve indirect exposure to assets that it could not otherwise achieve. That sounds terrifying. I look forward to the Minister explaining the intention of this section in the committee stage. We have questions for you. The National Housing Supply and Affordability Council Bill 2023 establishes the Council as an independent statutory advisory body to inform the Commonwealth's approach to housing policy by delivering independent advice to the government on options to improve housing supply and affordability. More bureaucracy. Does this suggest the bureaucrats have been giving poor advice to the government? We already have a Commonwealth Department of Housing. What's gone wrong with that department? 
that we need this whole new body, an additional body? Or is this just another opportunity for jobs for your mates among union bosses and amongst the union superannuation industry? This bill should have been about getting people into their own homes. That requires making life easier for private sector home builders and for private home ownership. That will take demand out of rental accommodation and free up homes at more realistic prices for those who can only rent. Instead, Prime Minister Albanese is using government construction to push private home builds out of the market and entrench renting over owning. Entrench renting over owning. A lot of additional bureaucracy and a lot of economic and social harm for proportionally little benefit, almost no benefit. One Nation opposes this Soviet-style reckless, wasteful market intervention. One Nation proposes getting down to basics, cutting immigration until housing and infrastructure catch up, cutting red tape, green tape and blue UN tape, comprehensively reforming taxation to give Australians a fair go, shrink government to fit the constitution and get government the hell out of people's lives, enabling people to make choices that suit people's and families' needs. We do not need more bureaucrats, more waste. We need more houses, real houses. We need a return to basics. Let the tradies of Australia get on with the job. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Polly. Thank you, uh, President. I rise to speak on the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023, National Housing Supply and Affordability Council Bill 2023, and the Treasury Laws Amendment Housing Measure No. 1 Bill 2023. These bills once again display that the Albanese Labor government is committed to ensuring that Australians have access to safe, secure and affordable housing. For far too long, the Australian people have suffered housing insecurity thanks to those opposite not making the necessary changes to improve secure and affordable housing for those in need in our communities. Safe and affordable housing is not something that all Australians have access to, and this has disproportionately affected high-risk communities such as women and children. With the cost of living pressure persisting, more and more Australians are struggling with the cost of rent. We can't deny that. These bills will help Australians who need affordable social housing to get it. We shouldn't be demeaning people for needing social housing. We can never step out all the issues uh, that led to the need for social housing, but we can provide housing to help get people into a safer environment. Now, we know in this country the fastest growing cohort of homeless people in this country are women over 55. We, in my home state of Tasmania, in the last nine years have seen a massive increase in homeless people living on the streets in my home city of Launceston and in Hobart. We see families living in cars. We see them living in tents. And what those opposite did while they were in government for nine years was do nothing, do nothing. And what do we see from them now that they're in opposition? What we see, and it's so good to have Senator Dunham in the chamber today, because he likes to go back Senator to Tasmania and talk for this about the Labor has Green expired. Report. Please resume your seat. We, it's 11.15. We're moving to notices. Um, are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? No. Is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Urquhart. There is. Thank you, uh, President. I present the fifth report of the 2023 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Thank you, I move Senator that the report be adopted. Senator Rustin. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, could I move that at the end of the motion, just moved by Senator Urquhart, that we add and in respect of the provisions of the Family Law Amendment Bill 2023, uh, the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee report by the 24th of August 2023. Uh, yes, so 
Senator Chisholm. Um, I move the following amendment as well. At the end of the motion, add and in respect of the provisions of the Family Law Amendment Bill 2023, the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee report on 14th of June 2023. Thank I move you. So we'll deal with a Senator Ruston's. Okay. So Senator Chisholm's amendment is an amendment to the motion, the amendment just moved by Senator Ruston. So I intend to put Senator Chisholm's amendment to Senator Ruston's amendment first. So the question is uh, those in favour of the amendment moved by Senator, Ruston, uh, Senator Chisholm say aye. Aye. Against? Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that the amendment moved by Senator Chisholm to the amendment moved by Senator Rustin to the selection of bills committee be agreed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart to sell for the ayes and Senator, Force, uh, Senator Askew to sell for the noes. Order. There being 24 ayes and 40 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We we'll now move to the amendment uh, to the selection of bills committee report as moved by Senator Rustin. Those in favour of that amendment say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Quick. Four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the amendment is moved by Senator Preston to the selection of bills committee be agreed. The ayes shall move for the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 41 ayes and 25 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. There are some further amendments. I'll just let senators get back to their seats. Senator McKim. I understood that. Well, I, we can let. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I understood that. Um, okay, we'll move the government first, yeah. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move uh, the following amendment at the end of the motion add, and in respect of the provisions of the Defence Legislation Amendment Naval Nuclear Propulsion Bill 2023, the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee report on the 9th of June 2023, and I move the amendment. Thank you, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I uh, uh, would like to move an amendment to that amendment proposed by. The government and I do move my amendment as circulated in the chamber. The amendment from the Australian Greens would change the reporting date for the Defence Legislation Amendment Naval Nuclear Propulsion Bill from the 9th of June, as proposed by the government, to the 26th of July. Thank you, Senator McKim. So we'll. Oh, Senator Shoebridge. President, I'll speak to that amendment if I may. Uh, the Australian public were blindsided waking up about two months ago and finding out that the Labor government intended to spend 
$368 billion on nuclear submarines. And, and in fact, one of the real offensive parts about that is the Albanese government has not told the truth about the real cost. The re it turns out that $368 billion only gets you the first five of the AUKUS subs, and the last three happen outside that budget envelope, bringing the real cost of the nuclear submarine pro project to close to half a trillion dollars. It's extraordinary, isn't it, that the Albanese government comes out and scares everybody with a $368 billion bill, but it's not even the truth. The real truth is it's close to half a trillion dollars. And then they say, and then they say that don't you worry, it'll all be safe because defence will look after it. Defence will be looking after it. They'll look after the nuclear safety. And in fact, we found from the Defence Strategic Review that the government wants to have a standalone defence agency to look after all the nuclear safety, um, all the nuclear safety regulation regarding their nuclear submarines. So we could have 12 nuclear reactors, each containing more than three times the fissile material in the Hiroshima bomb, floating in Port Kembla or a few kilometres off the coast of Perth or floating off the coast of, of Sydney Harbour and entirely regulated by defence. Defence regulating defence and defence regulating its own nuclear reactors. And they're floating them into our harbours and they're floating them across our shores. And now we find, now we find that the government wants to slip in a little change, just a little change to our nuclear regulatory materials, regulatory legislation, to allow to start facilitating this, to start allowing defence to be its own regulator. And just remember what defence has been like when it comes to safety. Think about the contamination in site after site after site from defence on PFAS. And you want defence to be its own regulator on nuclear safety? And you're trying to just sneak it through and start it through? But we can tell, actually, the deal is in here like everything on defence, like a $30 billion frigate deal that blew out to $45 billion, and it turns out no one checked from the coalition or Labor whether or not it was value for money. You've got top-heavy frigates that sink in a heavy sea that are 50 per cent over budget, and none of you checked. None of you bothered to check if it was value for money. None of you lifted up the bonnet to have a look at what is actually happening in defence, because you agree between you. Labor and the coalition to not put this stuff under scrutiny. And now you're trying to slip through a, a, a quick and dirty inquiry on nuclear safety regulation for nuclear submarines. Now you're trying to slip it through. Labor and the coalition desperately not wanting anybody to look at this, this, this extraordinary project of intergenerational theft that is the AUKUS submarine project. Mm -hmm. And of course we want to allow a decent time for reporting. We don't want it rammed through in just another short, sharp, nobody look here, three week non-investigation of defence. Because just think about, think about what will happen if this nuclear submarine project blows out like the frigate, frigate project. It'll go from half a trillion dollars to three quarters of a trillion dollars. $750 billion. And that, that's even if they can deliver it in the, in the first place. So what we're saying here clearly is end the club. Time to end the club, where Labor and the coalition come together and agree never to ask the hard questions of defence, never to check for value for money, never to check to see if this actually will make us any safer, or in fact make us a nuclear target, or put a bunch of highly fissile um, nuclear material in 12 floating nuclear reactors sailing up and down our coast and coming into our biggest cities. We want the public to have a right to have a say. We want to finally lift the bonnet and have a look at this club of secrecy that keeps protecting defence. That keeps protecting defence. And that's why we're moving this amendment. And we'd love to see Labor and the Coalition for once not come together like you do time after time Thank after you, time Senator. and Reach vote the time to shield defence. Order. Order.
Order across the chamber. Order. I'm now going to move the government's amendment. Order. It's in the Sorry. Order across the chamber. It's twice already this morning. There's been disorder across the chamber, and when I've called order, I've had to do it repeatedly. I would ask that when I order you to be silent, that you do that and not continue the disorder. So the, I'm moving Senator McKim's um, amendment first. So the question is that the amendment to the selection of bills committee is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the, aye, the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Oh, I beg your pardon. It needs to be four minutes as there's been debate on this amendment.
lock the doors. So the question is that the amendment as moved by Senator McKim to the selection of bills committee be agreed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order, there being 16 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll now move to the government's amendment on the selection of bills committee report as moved by Senator Gallagher. So those uh, in support of the amendment, please say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I'll now move the selection of bills committee report as amended. Those uh, in favour say aye. Against, uh, I declare that carried. <clears throat> uh, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired or postponed to rearrange the business? Senator, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I move that General Business Notice of Motion 232 be considered during General Business today. So the question is, the motion as moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Thank you, President. I ask that Government Business Notice of Motion number 2 proposing the approval of— Oh, OK. Am I doing— Oh, so that's yes. this one. Sorry. Um, I ask that government business notice of motion number one relating to the reference of time critical bills to legislation committees. Oh, okay. I have nothing more then. <laughs> okay. So there are no postponements. Uh, I'm just. Oh, sorry, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, Madam Deputy, um, Madam President, I ask that. Um, the Senate notice of motion number one be postponed to the next day of sitting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Babette. I seek leave to a motion relating to leave of absence. Uh, yes, is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Babette. I move that leave of absence be granted to myself on the 13th to the 16th of June for personal reasons. So the question is the motion is moved by Senator Babette be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to formal business. Uh, we'll go to business of the Senate number one, which 
That's, that's been postponed. So we'll go to business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senator Hanson. I ask that general business notice motion number 228, proposing the introduction of the bill be taken as formal. Uh, Senator Hanson, you need to do business of Senate number Yeah, sorry. Okay. Right. Okay. Yes, so you're going to 228. Sorry, my mistake. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Hanson. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Acts Interpretation Act 1901 and for related purposes. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and, and now be read a first time. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Oh, sorry, no. A division required? Yes. Um, ring the bells for four minutes. Four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion in relation to notice of motion 228, a motion moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Roberts as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order, there being three ayes and 44 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. If we now go to business of the Senate, number two, standing in the name of Senator Hanson's, is no longer in order. So I now move to government business number one, standing in the name of Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I ask that government business notice to motion number one relating to the reference of time critical bills to legislation committees be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? <clears throat> Senator Gallagher, there's an objection to that matter being taken as formal. Give me the thing. So much of standing orders be suspended that as would permit me to deal with that motion now. So this, I'm now putting the second motion as moved by Senator Gallagher. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Uh, ring, ring the bells for one minute. Order, lock the doors.
So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Gallagher to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Roberts as teller for the noes. Order. There being 40 ayes and three noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, Senator Gallagher, if you move the motion, please. Number one. I move the motion. So the question is that government business number one, as moved by Senator Gallagher, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. I believe the ayes have it. Now move to government business number two, standing in the name of Senator Chisholm. Thank you. I, uh, business notice of motion number two, proposing the approval of works within the parliamentary zone, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Uh, there is. Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Um, I'm trying to find my thing again. Uh, I'm. I move uh, to suspend standing orders that would allow me to move the motion um, number two in my name. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Um, Minister, I'm inviting you to move the motion. I move the motion. So the question is that government business number two, standing in the name of Senator Chisholm and moved by Minister Gallagher, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? <clears throat> I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that the a government business number two is moved by Senator Gallagher, standing in the name of Senator Chisholm, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Roberts as teller for the noes. I advise the advisers at the back of the room, once 
tellers are appointed, no one in the chamber is to move, and that includes all of you. Order, there being 39 ayes and three noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 229, standing in the name of Senator Steele John. I ask the general business, notice of motion number 229, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, President, pursuant to uh, contingent uh, no, pursuant to contingent notice of motion, standing in the name of Senator Waters, I ask that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion, namely a motion uh, motion number two two nine. <laughs> Almost <laughs> there. Yeah. I've sat and listened to people do it. Okay. So the question is that the motion to, sus to suspend, as moved by Senator Steele, John, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that the amendment, the, the motion is moved by Senator Steele John to suspend be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Roberts as teller for the noes.
Order. There being 41 ayes and three noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Steele John. President, I ask that the uh, motion number 229 be taken as formal. You just oh, moved sorry, the I moved the motion. I moved the motion. <laughs> Thank you. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 229, standing in the name of Senator Steele John, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Noes have it. Division required. Division required. Yes, ring the bells for one minute. Four minutes. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Steele John 
Business of Senate number 229 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair. The noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 42 ayes and 23 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. It being 12.15, we will now move to um, attendance by uh, minister. Um, I call Senator Wong. Thank you, thank you, President. I wasn't sure, given the hard marker, what would actually happen to this, but um, uh, can I thank the op opposition for the opportunity to talk about the government's performance in answering que estimates questions on notice? I would make the po point this government is still answering questions that, uh, on notice that the Morrison government never answered. There are more than 300 questions placed on notice outstanding from the previous government. Uh, a total of 6,733 questions were asked on notice to the current government following the supplementary budget estimates hearing in February. We have provided answers to 5,543 of these, so that is 82 per cent. I'll, say, I'll give the, those numbers again. And I note Senator Han, um, Hanson Young today spoke about and yesterday spoke about transparency. 6,733 questions asked, 5,543 of these have been answered. This is a better compliance rate than the Morrison government achieved. I, I would make this point, and um, I'm happy to engage with senators about this directly. Uh, there is, um, I, I would encourage senators to consider uh, the impact of questions which are particularly voluminous uh, or orders of production which are particularly volu voluminous. I can uh, say to senators uh, that I know in my own portfolio the diversion of resources uh, by uh, public servants um, uh, to answer very wide-ranging, wide-in-scope questions on notice uh, is um, uh, challenging. Uh, I made the point that Senator Wish Wilson asked a question where my department spent 290 hours complying with a Senate order. 14 people across a period of several weeks were required for this question uh, in a diverted attention from the delivery of high-priority climate and environment-related policy advice from multilateral engagements, uh, development assistance programming as well as finalisation of material for the federal budget. Uh, I can't speak for all ministers, but I can indicate to the chamber for myself. I'm always happy to provide briefings to the opposition as required, uh, and in fact we offer them regularly. Uh, uh, we are also happy to work with senators who put in place very wide-ranging inquiries to try and narrow the scope uh, so that the interests of transparency on uh, a particular issue uh, can be resolved. Uh, but perhaps without the sorts of um, hours that I've, I've described in, um, uh, in relation to my own uh, department's answer. 
Uh, responding to the Senate is a legitimate part of government. I've been here for some 20 years. I do regard the transparency of uh, the, the interrogation, that's probably the wrong word, but the um, questioning of executive government that this chamber enables to be an important part of our democracy. I would ask senators to be mindful of the volume nature of requests, uh, as that does impact on the government's ability uh, to uh, respond on them. Uh, I uh, trust that I'm happy to have further discussions um, uh, with opposition senators or Senator Cash, I think, who moved this motion as required. Uh, but I would make the point uh, that in terms of estimates, questions on notice, uh, obviously uh, it would be better if it was 100 per cent, uh, but I venture that 82 uh, per cent plus, because this was obviously drafted for me, I think, uh, last night. Uh, so questions may have been answered in the, 20, in the time since, uh, is, uh, demonstrates a government that is seeking to respond to a great many requests from, from the Senate, and I thank the Senate. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Cash. I would uh, take note of the Minister's statement. And the issue I have with the explanation that the Minister has just given is that it is full of excuses, excuse mm -hmm. after excuse mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. excuse. Uh, there are too many questions asked. The questions asked have too many parts to them. Excuse after excuse after excuse. That was never a luxury that was afforded to us when we were in government. When we were in government, those on the other side, right. at the drop of a hat, did not hesitate to stand up and ask for, in fact, not even ask for, demand accountability and transparency. And yet how the attitude changes the minute they are elected to government. Excuse after excuse after excuse. But you see, one of the issues is this. You see, prior to the last election, what did Mr Albanese and his ministers trumpet from the highest mountain they would they could find? Well guess this. The problem was he kept on telling the Australian people that if his, he was elected to govern, his govern, government, for the first time in Australia's history, would deliver the transparency, integrity and accountability like no government in Australia had ever delivered before. And guess what? How's that going? Yeah. That's a really good question, a good question because you see, day after day in this place, what we see from this government is complete contempt for the Australian people, complete contempt for any form of transparency, integrity or accountability, and complete contempt for the way they treat this Senate. Well, there are the questions outstanding, 1,192. Wow. Let's now turn to how they answer the questions that they are asked. And I refer to question 1788, asked on the 31st of March 2023, Senator James Patterson, asking the Minister, Mr. Shorten, Minister Shorten, the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. It was a very simple question. It just really asked, had the Minister or the Minister's office or the Minister's department met with any representative, etc., of Anacta Strategies Limited in relation to TikTok? either in person, via video conference or phone? If so, what was the date, time and duration of the meeting? Now, I would have thought, quick whip round the office, there you go, we did or we didn't. If we didn't, you could submit straight away. And if you did, flick through the diary and guess what? Date, time, duration of meeting. What we instead get from Minister Shorten is, quite frankly, an absolute disgrace. He's given a political answer to what is an incredibly serious question. But what's worse, in giving his political answer, he tries to trash the record of former Prime Minister John Howard. Now, on any analysis, John Howard was a Prime Minister who presided over the largest and most successful times of Australia, for Australia and for Australians, since the post-war period. And there are many Australians out there who to this day will come up to you in the street or when you're walking through a shopping centre and they will say this to you. The biggest mistake I ever made in 2007 was believing the Rudd 2007 hype. The biggest mistake I ever made and I've been paying for it ever since. But you see, 
In making the answer political and saying John Howard became the only second Prime Minister in Australian history to suffer the ignominy of being rejected by his own electors when he was unceremoniously dumped. Well, let's just compare Mr Howard's record to Mr Shorten's record. Because, you see, if Mr Shorten wants to be political, maybe he needs to be reminded. Mr Howard was elected by the people four times. Mr Howard served as Prime Minister of this nation for almost 12 years. Mr Shorten was rejected by the Australian people in 2016. Mr Shorten was rejected by the Australian people in 2019. And then he was rejected by those on the other side, dumped, didn't want him as the Leader of the Opposition, failed twice. You're not taking us to another election. He now gets to stand next to Mr Albanese. And guess what, colleagues? It must gut him every time he's got to look at Mr Albanese and say, Mr Prime Minister. So if you want to get political in your answers, guess what? You want to compare a record, we will proudly compare John Howard's record with Mr Bill Shorten's any day of the week. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Senator Cash. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, Senator Cash, uh, I know you um, called Minister Wong's uh, embarrassing uh, and I think shameful defence of what is an absolute quicksand approach from this government to transparency and accountability by this chamber. And it happens time and time again, whether it is the vague non-answers at the estimates table by their uh, assistant ministers and uh, ministers, whether it is the refusal to answer very sensible and necessary questions on notice, whether it is the refusal uh, on OPDs, whether it is on any measure of transparency and accountability that this chamber was designed to bring to our political system, turns out when they get to government they don't want to have the sunlight shine in on their decision making. Yep. That's exactly well, right. Senator Wong proudly stands up and uh, says 82 per cent of questions have been answered. Well, that may be the case, but the vast majority of them were late. In my own portfolio area of infrastructure, transport and regional development, they came in very late, only last week. So they've been sitting on Minister King's office, because I know this isn't just annoying us in the opposition. It is annoying the public who uh, want yep, to see the answers right. to these questions. It is annoying the crossbench. And it is also incredibly frustrating for the hardworking parliamentary um, staff and public servants who have done the hard work, who take their job very seriously of closing dates for questions on notice to be handed back. And it was in estimates last time when I had the department in front of us in the RAC committee, the secretary frustratedly answered that briefs had been sent up. Yep. They weren't in the department waiting to be sent up. And so I assume the same things happened with the questions on notice. The department's done the right thing, sent them up to the minister's office, and they're just piling up on someone's desk, refusing to be sent off. They're either doing that for political reasons or incompetency. Political or incompetency. So it must be very embarrassing for senators who are also ministers to have to repeatedly come into this chamber and apologise for the behaviour of ministers from the other place who clearly do not take the Senate's role seriously. The sort of questions Senator Wong uh, made out that the questions that hadn't been answered were somehow hyper complex uh, and were just really going to take the the public service off the hard work of um, you know, delivering on the government's policy agenda. Question uh, SQ23003381. How is the $7 million being spent? Good question. It was, a great, it was pretty simple. On a white paper into aviation. Oh, there you go. Sorry, no answer. I'm sure the minister signed off on a brief on what the white paper looks like. <laughs> Tell us about it. On a, on, the, um, on a consultation around community infrastructure and roads program, 
The government said they consulted, changed the program a bit. Fair enough. You won the election. Knock yourselves out. I simply asked, could you provide details on what consultation was undertaken? Fair question. Like fair question. Thank you, Senator Scar. It was a fair question. Uh, the, the very diligent public servant said, yes, Senator. Still no answer. They either didn't do the consultation or they don't like the results of the consultation. In terms of decarbonisation across government, you think this would be one they actually yeah, wanted to answer? They'd want to answer. Can you tell me uh, who is the lead department? With this is my question: Who is the lead department on the electric vehicle strategy um, and the road user charges piece? Is it all of PMC? Is it Minister Bowen? Is it Minister King? Please tell me who is in charge of the transport policy area in particular with respect to decarbonisation. Now, I shouldn't be surprised that this one wasn't answered because this government has no idea on who's in charge of what. You've had Minister King being overruled by the Prime Minister on what's in and out of her infrastructure review. These guys, the confusion about who's doing what where thank goes you, on and on Senator and on. Senator McKenzie. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'm very pleased to support my colleague Senator Cash and Senator McKenzie yeah, yeah. in relation to this very important issue. Now, those listening to the proceedings and watching the proceedings today would have seen Senator Wong stand and would think that Senator Wong's sentiments in terms of her response it was all light and reason. Nothing to see here. We're very cooperative. Briefings offered to everyone in this chamber. We're very transparent and open. The issue is the, issue is the gap between Senator Wong's rhetoric and what is actually happening in substance. The gap between the rhetoric and the substance. That's the issue. Now, I want to, I want to go back to uh, the questions on notice that Senator Cash was referring to and the responses which we are receiving from the government in relation to some of those questions on notice. And I'm going to give you an example of question on notice 1856, which was asked by my colleague Senator Hume. Senator Gallagher, the finance minister, was quoted in the Canberra Times as saying, putting a productivity efficiency component into any funding I think is a responsible part of government and making sure we keep the budget on a sustainable footing. End quote. I think that's quite a reasonable proposition. I don't find much to disagree with that, to be frank. And so Senator Hume asked a series of relevant questions in relation to that, very courteously. The questions were, what is the current efficiency dividend rate for your department? Fair question. The minister said we should have an efficiency rate. Question, well, what is the efficiency rate? Are any agencies or any other entities within the portfolio exempt from that efficiency dividend? Fair question. Is the efficiency dividend referenced in the portfolio budget statement? Are there any agencies or entities that have an efficiency dividend that is higher or lower than the rate applied to the department? Very courteous, obvious questions flowing naturally from the quote attributed to Senator Gallagher. Now, the way you would expect, the way you'd expect, if the system was working, if the government was reflecting the principles enunciated by Senator Wong, in her statement at the outset of this debate, what you would expect is a logical, considered response, responding to the questions. And what did we get? What did we get in, from, from the Minister for NDIS, uh, the Honourable Bill Shorten? What did we get? This is what we got. The Albanese Labor Government. Well, it's worthwhile reading it again, Senator Gallagher. I know you don't like to hear it. I know you don't like to hear it. But it's worthwhile reading it again. It's worthwhile reading it again. The Albanese Labor Government inherited a budget disaster from the previous Liberal government. Blah blah blah. Featuring a trillion dollars in Liberal Party debt. Now, even the ABC, even the ABC fact-checked that and found that was wrong. Even the ABC fact-checked that one and found that was wrong. Order, senators. There's a difference between gross. Se Senator Scar, please take your seat. I think the president has made it very clear that the, the chamber should be proceeding in an orderly way. I don't think that anybody could consider what was going on then was orderly. So I, I, I call you once again, Senator Scar, mindful of the standing orders, to continue your contribution. Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. 
The ABC fact checker even found that statement was wrong. But the thing about this response, none of it related to the actual question that was asked about where is the efficiency dividend applied across government. None of it. All it was was a political diatribe. It was absolutely contemptuous, sneering and contemptuous in relation to legitimate bona fide questions put on the notice paper by the opposition. Absolutely appalling. So the issue when we look at the fact that there are over 1,000 unanswered questions, over 1,000 questions, budget estimates is there, an extraordinarily important process in terms of the Australian Parliament. It gives an opportunity for senators from all parties to ask questions in relation to any government action that involves the expenditure of public funds, the taxpayer funds. Extraordinarily important process and a way, a key way in which the opposition, the crossbench, can keep the government accountable. And yet we're in this situation over 1,000 unanswered questions. Over 1,000. And as Senator McKenzie said, when we get the answers, they're obviously quite often they're terribly late or they're non-responsive. Or we've got to put in an FOI Act request. We get the question on notice, then we put in a Freedom of Information Act request, we get documents and we play spot the difference between the answer that's given to what we find on the Freedom of Information Act application. The system shouldn't work that way. The system shouldn't work that way. The system should be one of integrity, transparency Correct. and accountability. Correct. And as Senator Cash so eloquently pointed out, Prime Minister Albanese said something in opposition and now they're doing exactly the opposite in government. Thank you, Senator Scar. And I call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The government's behaviour in hiding from answering questions, avoiding accountability, is not acceptable. Answering questions is important for accountability. The people deserve accountability and they deserve their respect. Look at the list of questions here. The Senate notes, I'm, I'm quoting from today's um, notice paper, the Senate notes that as at 9am on Monday 8th of May 2023, 1,929 questions on notice from the 2022-23 supplementary budget estimates remain unanswered and are overdue. 1,929. From the Prime Minister and Cabinet, 591 questions not, not uh, uh, answered. Defence, 408 questions. Health and aged care. Health and aged care. 401 questions. Social services. 189 questions. Foreign affairs and trade. 133 questions. Infrastructure, transport, regional development, communications and the arts. 52 questions. Employment and workplace relations. 42 questions. Climate change, energy, the environment and water. 26 questions. Finance, 26 questions. Treasury, 25 questions. Services Australia, 22 questions. Industry, science and resources, nine questions. And Attorney General's, four questions. Senators, there is only one word to describe this government's attitude to Senate estimates, to questions on notice and the orders for the production document. That word is contempt. The government continues to treat this chamber with utter contempt. Almost every order by this Senate to produce information is met by the government with contempt. And it is appropriate that we begin to treat the ministers who treat this Senate with contempt appropriately. We've had explanation after explanation from ministers. Ministers are all too happy to come into this place, fluff around and cop a lashing for an hour and continue to refuse to produce the information that this Senate has ordered. They just put up with the hassle for an hour and it's, it's over. The explanations from ministers are not good enough. And it is not good enough that this Senate continues to accept them without any further action. It's time for this Senate to use its constitutionally enshrined powers, constitutionally enshrined powers, to hold ministers to account. And that must be through charges of contempt when they continue to disrespect orders of the Senate. I remind senators that it is this Senate, not the government, it is this Senate dominated privileges not the government, sorry, it is this Senate, not the government dominated privileges committee that makes the final dis determination on matters of contempt. The Senate decides whether or not someone is in contempt. If this Senate is not happy with a minister's disobedience of a direct order, then the Senate itself can vote on contempt, which we should do and which should happen. The time for meaningless, hollow explanation after explanation after an explanation is over. 
The people of Queensland did not elect me to represent Malcolm Roberts. The people of Queensland did not elect me to represent the One Nation Party. Well, I'm very, very proud to be in One Nation. The people of Queensland elected me to represent the people of Queensland and Australia. That is why we're here. So I go out and listen in the, in the electorates and then I speak for the people in this chamber. So when the government holds the Senate in contempt, the government holds the people of Queensland and Australia in contempt. The government is repeatedly holding the people of the states and each state and, and Australia in contempt. There are jail cells in the basement of this building. It's time for the executive government to be reminded why they're there. Start serving the people or start serving time in jail. Thank you, Senator Roberts. The question is that the motion moved in the name of Senator, Senators Cash and Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. Uh, the ayes have it. Thank you. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of government bills. Is leave granted? No. Leave is not granted, Senator Birmingham. Pursuant to contingent notice standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as to prevent me moving a motion relating to the conduct of the business of the Senate, namely that certain government bills take precedent. And Acting Deputy President, I am surprised and quite disappointed the government uh, did not grant leave for this motion. This motion, which uh, has been circulated in the chamber, it's a motion that would give precedence to consideration of the Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2023, the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Data Streamlining Amendment Bill 2023 and the Public Interest Disclosure Amendment Review Bill 2022. The first two of these had previously been mooted to be listed in the normal non-contro business for the Senate. The government chose to not proceed with non-contro listing, uh, which would have ensured that these bills passed today and passed quickly and seamlessly today. The last of these has been subject to extensive debate in the Senate chamber already and I understand is close to being able to reach closure and pass the Senate. So I don't intend to detain the Senate with a long um, debate in terms of the merits of this. My intention, Deputy President, is to actually enable us to get these bills done. Um, this is simply what the government should have done as good housekeeping in terms of the management of its legislative program. Pleased to cooperate, I understand, with the support of the Greens in terms of bringing these on. Yes, I know the government wishes it could get a vote on its housing bill today. It hasn't provided sufficient time for that to be debated. The Senate has determined that matter multiple times already. So you should have heard the message of the Senate by now, and this is an invitation and an opportunity for the government to get done and get past what can be passed today in an effective and timely manner. Uh, Minister, Minister Gallagher. Oh. Uh, thank you. Well, um, order, senators, please resume your seat. Senator Gallagher. I just don't need to repeat what I said. Everybody who's in the chamber then should be remembering what I've already said less than nine minutes ago. So I call Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you uh, very much. And well, 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 I mean, I think the Academy Award for Best Actor in a Drama um, <laughs> this week goes to uh, Senator Birmingham for that performance of, uh, of, of apparently trying to help the government, to assist the government with its program. Um, and to do that with a straight face, although I notice there's a bit of a smile um, on your face now. The government uh, did not grant leave for this because uh, we had organised our program. Our program uh, has listed the Housing Australia Future Fund as the priority bill, uh, and this is a government uh, time, government legislation time. There is a lot of time through the rest of the week where other senators get to list priorities for them. This is not part of that time. The government's uh, priority is the Housing Australia Future Fund. Now, I understand that the anti-housing alliance in the Senate ha it will be working together to try to get this motion up. 
um, because that's uh, the priority for them. The priority for the Greens political party and the opposition is to not support the investments that we want to make in increasing supply of housing in this country. Uh, so you can only be referred to as the anti-housing alliance. It is an unusual alliance and it's an alliance that's been created for dif from different points of view. So we have uh, the opposition saying that they don't want investment in housing uh, because we're spending too much and we have criticism from the Greens for saying that it's not enough. But the end result of the antics that have been played in this place over the past week will mean that this legislation fails to pass. It will delay the establishment of that fund. It will delay disbursements from that fund to allow the building of 30,000 social and affordable housing properties in this country over five years. That is the game that you're playing. You are playing a game on housing supply. You might think it funny and it might work in the green sub-branches in the inner cities where people People are already comfortable in their homes, but this is about other people in this country, people who are struggling to find accommodation and who are, after a decade of dysfunction, delay and neglect from those opposite who didn't care about social and affordable housing, who didn't care about housing supply in this country, the failure of that policy has brought us to the point we're at today where we have a significant shortfall in supply. And this Senate is saying we don't want to increase the supply of housing in this country. That is, what, that is the direct result of the decision that you are taking in ganging up together, the anti-housing alliance parties, ganging up together to stop this bill from progressing. Now, we have tried a number of times this week to make sure we could extend hours to allow for debate, and the Anti-Housing Alliance has taken decisions to filibuster in a whole range of areas through the program to not allow that to happen. So don't come in here and say the government didn't allow enough time. We have tried to provide time so that people had the opportunity to debate the bill. There are amendments to the bill. There are discussions about the bill. We have been working on this for months. We have been in deep negotiations, not with the No Alition, because they just disengage and don't even um, come to the table. You don't come to the table, you write yourself out. That's fine. That's the decision that uh, Mr Dutton and his leadership team have made. We get that. You're just not going to be a part of anything, any part of the future of this country. Fine. Uh, but for the Greens political party to take this position and to gang up and to frustrate any attempt to have a long-term sustainable funding stream into social and affordable housing is something that they will have to live with. And we will let everybody know that this is what you're up to. And we will have to work out how to ensure that the Commonwealth is able to increase the, uh, the supply of housing in this country. And we will, because we're focused on it because it's our priority. And we've made that clear with other investments we're making in housing through NIFIC through some of the tax changes that the Treasurer has announced on Tuesday. But let's just speak very bluntly about what is happening here today. What is happening is we have the Greens political party, the Liberal party, the National party joining together to tell Australians who rely on social and affordable housing that political games are more important than them. That is what is happening here. And no dressing it up with some helpful a apparently helpful motion to reorganise the program is going to give you cover from that because Senator we're pulling Gallagher, the cover that, that off. That is time, uh, Senator Ayres. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you there, Senator McKim. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, um, the Greens stand ready to work uh, collectively collaboratively across the chamber to assist the government in actually getting something through the Senate this week. The three bills that are uh, the subject of uh, the motion uh, moved or attempted to be moved uh, by Senator Birmingham are two uh, non-controversial bills that would pass the Senate and, of course, the Public Interest Disclosure Review Bill, uh, which we stand ready uh, to facilitate passing the Senate in very short order. 
Uh, our assessment is that that would be uh, 10 or 15 minutes maximum, and the government could have those bills through the Senate. So when the government is opposing attempts to have these bills put through the Senate, folks need to understand exactly why they are doing that. And of course, this is all about the government wanting to ram its housing agenda through the Senate. And I use the word agenda in the loosest possible way, because the Labor um, uh, Housing Affordability Future Fund is a steaming pile of neoliberal rubbish that does not guarantee the building of one single house extra in this country. Labor's bill, even under a best-case scenario put forward by Labor, that it will deliver 30,000, which there is no guarantee that it will and no reasonable likelihood that it will, but even under that uh, fantasy best-case scenario put forward by the Labor Party, the demand for affordable housing in Australia will be bigger in five years' time than it is today. That's right, folks. Labor's so-called solution will see the affordable housing crisis in this country be worse in five years' time than it is today. And how is Labor proposing to respond to this massive social crisis, this so-called party of the left? It's, which, of course, is a masquerade because they are a centre-right political party and heading further to the right every day. How do they propose to respond to it? By gambling $10 billion of public funds on the stock market. Now, the Future Fund, the vehicle that Labor wants to give $10 billion worth of public funds to to gamble on the stock market, lost 1.2 per cent of its value last year. It lost. 1.2 per cent of its value. Would Labor attempt to respond to a health crisis by gambling public funds on the stock market? Of course they wouldn't. So why are they proposing to take that approach to a housing crisis? And of course this, this so-called uh, package put forward to Labor by Labor does nothing for renters. Absolute zero for renters. We are in a rental crisis in this country. Rents are skyrocketing, skyrocketing, particularly in the major cities, but also in regional Australia. We have a Labor Party that's offered a pittance of $2.85 a day to people on income support in this week's budget, uh, using, I might add, uh, people in poverty as a tool to fight inflation while they are delivering the massively inflationary quarter of a trillion dollars in stage three tax cuts for the top end. That's what's happening here and nothing for renters. Nothing for renters in this housing affordability proposal from Labor. And in my home state of Tasmania, Tasmanians are being conned by the Jackie Lambie network who are claiming that it is in the legislation that a minimum of 1,200 new homes will be built in Tasmania over the next five years when it is not in the legislation. It's not in any of the amendments that, are being, that have been circulated by government. And yet you've got Senator Lambie and Senator Tyrrell colluding with the government to try and smash through a bill which doesn't guarantee a single house extra will be built in Tasmania. Isn't it astonishing? Isn't it astonishing that the Labor Party would prefer to see its bill fail in this chamber today than it would sit down and have a genuine negotiation with the Australian Greens. The Labor Party needs to understand it doesn't control this Senate, and I urge them to sit down and negotiate a decent outcome for people struggling with rental crisis, struggling with the housing crisis, so we can move forward and address those issues. Thank you, Senator yeah. McKim. I call Senator Askew and I'll then come to you, Senator. Sorry, Senator Ayres. Senator Cash, then. Uh, I move that the question now be put. Oh. The question is that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed. The is that that question be put. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against? No, no. Uh, the ayes have it. Vision required. Ring the bells.
for four minutes. Lock the doors. So the question is that the question uh, lock the doors. So the question is that the question be put. The eyes shall move to the right of the chairs, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Scar as teller for the eyes and Senator Pratt as teller for the nose.
order, there being 36 ayes and 21 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'm now going to move uh, that suspension. Uh, that. So I'm now going to move that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Scar as teller for the ayes and Senator Pratt as teller for the noes. Order. There being 36 ayes and 21 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I think Senator Birmingham is seeking the call. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Uh, I move the motion standing in my name as circulated. Uh, the, the question is that the motion. Are you seeking the call, Minister? Uh, yes. Thank you. I move that the motion be amended by inserting the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023 and related bills before the Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bills 2023. Uh, thank you. Oh, uh, yes, certainly. Just a moment, Minister Gallagher. Uh, President, I would invite you to rule that amendment out of order and encourage you to do so, President. The motion before the chamber seeks to rearrange the business in a way that, obviously, under current orders of the Senate, the Housing Australia Future Fund bill is the next item of business that comes on in the Senate. So the amendment being proposed uh, sorry, I would argue, has sorry, fundamental change. Sorry, just a moment. Uh, th those interjections are disorderly. I would ask for silence. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. The amendment being proposed is a fundamental change that essentially is seeking to amend the motion that the result of which could be achieved by simply defeating the motion if the government wished to. The Senate has already twice expressed its will in terms of government attempts to reorder business in relation to this bill, and the Senate has twice rejected the government's attempts. There is precedence, President, in relation to a ruling 
that where the Senate has clearly expressed its will on more than one occasion, a motion will not be taken again. Now, this is a rather unique attempt at trying to do the same thing yet again, but it is nonetheless another attempt at doing so, and I believe the amendment should be ruled out of order uh, such that the motion as put be considered rather than us dealing with what appears to be an endless time-wasting exercise now by the government to prevent consideration of its own bills. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Senator Birmingham. Order. I am advised that um, the government's proposed amendment is in order and relevant to the motion, so I'm going to call uh, Senator McKim. Wait for the call, Senator McKim. On a point of order. Um, President, I, I just ask you um, to reflect, please, on uh, 200, page 241 in Odgers, which says an amendment is not regarded as a, uh, an amendment may not be moved if, if it is a direct negative to a question. An amendment is not regarded as a direct ne negative unless it would have, ex have exactly the same effect as negativing the motion. Now, I think Senator Birmingham is right in his argument here that the effect of this, the effect of uh, the motion that uh, Senator Gallagher uh, is putting is actually has the same effect as, as voting against the motion. And, and if that's not your ruling, Order. President, could I, could I just ask you to explain uh, why, in fact, you do not believe that um, that, that relevant passage of Odgers is pertinent in this case. Uh, happy to do so, Senator McKim. I am advised that if we did nothing, it would be the housing bill, then the PID bill. This is seeking to rearrange that. The motion moved by Senator Birmingham. The amendment uh, by the government puts the housing bill next. So I am advised that in this case, the piece of Odgers that you um, used is not relevant. I'm going to call the minister, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you for that um, advice uh, to the chamber. Well, I think we are reaching a pretty embarrassing point of the, the week, where the efforts that are being taken, the, the procedural trickery and, and skullduggery that's going on, over what? Over the Senate supporting the investment of $10 billion into a Housing Australia Future Fund. Order. That is what is happening here. The efforts that are being put in place to, to not to debate, to not pass investment in social and affordable housing, and even if you don't think it's perfect, even if you don't think it's perfect, it's a start. It's a start to have a long-term uh, funding stream going into social and affordable housing. And here we are with motions going this way and that way and the Anti-Housing Alliance ganging up together to make sure that this cannot pass, this bill cannot pass. The government Order. has listed the Housing Australia Future Fund as its priority bill. Now, we've got these, these two parties, or three parties, the Liberal Party, the National Party and the Greens Political Party, working together to deny passage of the bill. Out of all the bills that go through this chamber, I have to say I would have thought this would be the last bill that would face this kind of um, barriers. Honestly, honestly, the House of Representatives have dealt with it. Every housing minister in every state and territory has asked the Senate Order. to deal with this bill. The housing organisations, the, the community organisations that are going to be a beneficiary, uh, will Minister be a beneficiary Gallagher, of this. Please resume your seat. Senator Ayres, order. Most of the senators on my left who are calling out are out of order. They're not even in their seats. So you are all being incredibly disorderly. I'm asking the back of the chamber. There is plenty of opportunity for debate on this bill, and I'm asking you to stop being disorderly. I should not have had to sit the minister down. And I'm asking for her contribution to be heard in silence, as I would do so for any senator in this chamber. Please continue, Minister. The, the housing organisations that have pleaded with us that have pleaded with all of you. They have. We know they've been to see you. 
We know they've been to see you, to say pass this bill, and the Greens slam the door in their face. Not good enough. Minister not going Gallagher, to please resume your seat. Once again, within a few seconds, I've had to call for order again. If you wish to make a contribution, seek the call. Otherwise, I'm asking you to either leave the chamber if you can't remain in here and be silent, or to respect the minister has the right and has the call and has an absolute right to be heard in silence. Minister. Uh, thank you. This amendment that I'm moving, when I shouldn't be actually in the position where we've had to move it because we would have naturally uh, some time ago gone to this bill. But the time wasting and the procedural trickery that's going on to try and ensure we don't get to the Housing Australia Future Fund is frankly a joke. I think the people of Australia expect better of us in this Senate to deal with bills as they come. We wanted to provide extra time for people to have that debate. We wanted to sit last night. No, nope, that wasn't good enough for the Senate. We wanted to bring it on first thing this morning. No, nope, that wasn't good enough for the Senate. The, filler, the filibuster started. And now, at the time that we would normally naturally get to this bill, this happens. And so, yeah, we are moving an amendment because we do want the Housing Australia Future Fund bill uh, dealt with. We do want to find that time. But this uh, absolute rubbish that what you're trying to do is arrange it so that we do have time to deal with bills is just fraudulent. It's not true. What you are doing and what you should stand up and say you're doing and what the Greens should stand up and say they're doing, everything you've done this week is to make sure we don't deal with the Housing Australia Future Fund. Let's just say it as it is. I think people can hide behind motions and amendments and gags and all the rest of it. But the agreement that's been struck between the Liberals, the Nationals and the Greens has been do whatever it takes, absolutely whatever it takes, to make sure that the Senate cannot pass a, uh, a bill that would establish a $10 billion housing fund that would allow $500 million a year to go out and build more social and affordable housing for women escaping domestic violence and their children. Uh, for low-paid workers uh, so that they can live close to where they work. That's what the Senate's doing now. And it's time for some honesty about that. You know, don't sit here and pretend that oh, you're just trying to make things better or you don't want to see the government spend so much. You two, you three have ganged up to deliver this result and we won't let you forget it. We will not let you forget it all the way. Until we get an outcome on housing, we will be letting everybody know that it's the Liberals, the Nationals and the Greens working together to make sure we can't build more housing supply in this country. That's what the Senate's doing today. And so we don't take a step back that our amendment seeks to reorder that priority and allow for the Housing Australia Future Fund to come on first, because that is the priority. Anyone who has spoken to anyone in their electorate, in their community, realises that the issue of housing affordability, of access to housing, is a major issue. And here is one measure, one measure of what we're doing. We have all these other things going on. We're working with the states and territories. We're pushing it through National Cabinet. We're increasing the liability cap for NIFIC so that they can go and ensure access to low interest finance for community and social housing providers. We had a project here in Canberra just uh, last week uh, supporting the building of uh, accommodation for women under the age of 45 on lower incomes who want to work towards owning their house. That's what we're doing. Practical steps to increase the supply of housing to take the pressure off uh, people who want to buy, people who need to rent. That's what we're doing. And this Senate's standing in the way of it. You know, it, it is actually mind-bendingly crazy that that is where we're at today. That this Senate would choose that path as opposed to the path of, okay, let's deal with this bill, let's set it up, let's make sure that we get um, the investment flowing, and keep talking about the things, the more things you'd like to see. Keep talking about the the way you want the fund to operate. Keep talking to us, but don't stand in the way of establishing it in the first place. I mean, this, the, the irony of it, you know, 
people calling for more investment when we can't get the investment that we've got before the Senate through the Senate. $10 billion, $500 million funding stream. Anyone who has watched housing over the last 10 years realises that the Commonwealth hasn't been at the table. We've completely vacated the field under the former government. The only thing you did, you did, Order. you vacated the field. There was no housing uh, policy. Gallagher, there was no housing your minister. Seat. Please resume, Minister. Please, Senator Henderson. I called you to order. You ignored me. Not only are you not in your seat, you are also continuing to be disorderly when asked not to be. Minister, please resume. And here we are with a range of interventions that we are putting in place, including funding uh, the extra support for workers in the sector, for negotiating the National Homelessness and Housing Agreement uh, with states and territories, for increasing NIFIC's liability cap, uh, with some of the tax measures that the Treasurer has brought in to try and incentivise the National Housing Accord, uh, working uh, with investors around what makes it work to put that investment into a, uh, housing in this country, and the Housing Australia Future Fund. It's part of a bigger suite of investments in housing, and this Senate won't even allow it to be dealt with. We have supporters from Community Housing Industry Association, National Shelter, Homelessness Australia, the MBA, the Property Council, the Housing Industry Association, Power Housing and the Urban Development Institute, all National saying, Delta. deal with this bill, please. Let us get started. And this Senate wants to play games with procedure and, and, and delay even debating it. I mean, honestly, do we leave this place today not being able to even have got through the second reading stage of this bill because of the agreement reached between the opposition and the Greens political party? That is the result. What a week. Everyone leave here and give yourself a big pat on the back because what you've done together is make sure that this bill doesn't get passed, that the fund doesn't get set up, that the money doesn't flow, uh, that the houses don't get built. What a terrific outcome from the Senate, and I say that with a very strong lacing of sarcasm. If that's not picked up for the Hansard, I would like that <laughs> reflected. Um, but that is the result. So I would urge people to consider and to support the amendment that we have moved. And I would then, if, if that amendment is successful, to find time this afternoon to actually deal with the bill, as we have been trying. And we will move whatever motion it takes uh, to ensure that we can deal with this bill today. And if people need to stay longer this afternoon, so be it. We want to deal with it. We've been trying all week. So I would urge those that uh, are in the Senate to listen uh, to the voices of the advocates, to listen to the voices of the state and territory housing ministers who know a little bit about housing, uh, to listen to the first ministers um, of the country who signed up at National Cabinet on La Labor's housing plan to work with us. Everybody is in the cart except this anti-housing alliance that's been formed in the dark of night in the corridors of the Senate to gang up and make sure that this bill can't be dealt with. And I move that the question be put. So the question is that the um, amendment as moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Oh, yes, sorry, Senator Birmingham. I've jumped ahead. So the question is that the motion is moved by uh, Senator Gallagher that the question be put, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I'm now going to put the amendment. So the question is that the amendment as moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Ayes have it. have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. <clears throat> so the question is that the motion to amend is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Pratt as teller for the ayes and Senator Scar as teller for the noes. Order. There being 21 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Birmingham. I think I'd already moved the motion. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Birmingham, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. <clears throat>
lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the left, the, eye, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Scar as teller for the ayes and Senator Giacconi as teller for the nose. Order. There being 37 ayes and 22 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, it being after 1.30, we'll now move to two-minute statements and call Senator Reynolds. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. I note that Mr Drumgold, the ACT <clears throat> DPP, today backflipped on his allegations of political interference in the AFP investigation. Let me be very, very clear. As I did yesterday, I categorically reject this suggestion and consider a, a complete affront to my reputation. This baseless suggestion was without any, any foundation, but it should never, ever have come to this. I have provided all assistance and possible cooperation with the Australian Federal Police investigation, as I released in a media statement yesterday, not just with the AFP but with the DPP and with the defendant's lawyers. The facts were always available to the DPP. It is baffling and it is disturbing that this view was offered under oath yesterday, as there was absolutely no basis for this claim, as the DPP has now acknowledged, again under oath, today in the inquiry. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Senator Mario Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I rise to speak on an issue that is extremely close to my heart, that of lung cancer. Lung cancer is a cruel and evil disease. It has stolen people that I love too painfully and too quickly, and I know I'm not alone. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in Australia. 42 per cent of diagnoses happen at stage four. Once diagnosed, the five-year survival rate is just 22 per cent. But you wouldn't necessarily know it, because the stigma that has so unfairly surrounded this disease has kept it and its sufferers in the darkness for too long without the support, the research or the funding needed to save lives. Acting Deputy President, no more. After decades of advocacy, the plight of those fighting lung cancer is finally in the light. Last week, I watched as Health Minister Mark Butler announced a $260 million national lung cancer screening program, a screening program that is set to prevent 
thousands and thousands of deaths from lung cancer would have present, prevented the deaths of people I know. Acting Deputy President, I couldn't be more proud of this announcement and what it will mean for those people who we would lose without it. And not just them, what it means for every family member, every parent, every child, every husband, every wife who won't have to say goodbye to their loved one because we now have this program. I want to pay tribute to the Lung Foundation, to Mark and to Paige, to every advocate I've met in the campaign to get this program established, including those advocates who are no longer with us, to see the result. To Lorraine, to Sandy, to their beautiful nurse Mel in Adelaide, be proud of the role you've played in saving thousands of lives. In government, we get to do good, powerful things. This is a good, powerful thing, and I am damn proud of it. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Alman Payne. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Twelve months out from the last election, I visited a housing and homelessness service in Mackay. And there I heard firsthand about the housing crisis in that city and how they were first forced to turn away 90 per cent of people who came to them for help with housing because they just didn't have capacity to meet the overwhelming need. Stories like this were repeated over and over as I travelled around my home state of Queensland. Fast forward to now and we're well into this term of the Albanese government. We've seen two allegedly progressive budgets and what we're left with is a housing crisis that this government wants to wash its hands of. Right now, there are hundreds of thousands of people in desperate need of a roof over their heads. Just last week in Emerald, I heard from Janelle and the team at the Emerald Neighbourhood Centre, and they told me about the ever-increasing pressure being placed on their services by people in the community who are having to choose between paying their rent or buying food, or people who are living in tents on the outskirts of town because they can't find an affordable home. I remind the Senate that we are not here to rubber stamp bad policy. We are especially not here to rubber stamp a policy that will see the housing crisis get worse in five years. We are here to genuinely help the people in our communities and to help fight, keep fighting for those in crisis. We are here to push the government for a better deal for the 5.5 million Australian renters who were left behind in the budget and for the thousands of Australians who desperately need direct investment in public and affordable housing. That's why our constituents voted for us, and that's what we are going to keep doing. Uh, Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise in this place on occasions to reflect on the current status of the live export industry. This is something I've talked about many, many times. And to give this chamber an update into the current success of that industry in achieving a very, very high quality animal welfare standards, not just uh, on the voyage, but also in overseas destinations. And as I have stood up and reflected on an ongoing basis in this place, the industry continues to improve its performance. Uh, in the latest uh, mortality figures published uh, by law on the Department uh, of Agriculture website, I'll start with sheep because obviously that's been a topic of some discussion over the last uh, six months or so. The total mortality rate is down to 0.14 per cent. And just to give you some idea, this is not a flash in the pan. This is a consistent downward trend since at least the 1980s, where the industry has consistently and regularly improved standards, improved animal welfare outcomes and uh, improved their animal handling practices. So just to give you a small snapshot, in 2017 the mortality rate was 0.7 of a percent. Uh, that went down to 0.53, then 0.25, then 0.23, then 0.21, and now it is down to 0.14. These are mortality rates that farmers would be very happy to achieve in paddocks, uh, particularly in times of uh, weather stress. 
So the industry has done an extraordinary amount over the last Senator few years Senator and deserves Brockman, to survive. Your time has expired. Senator Polly. Dirty deeds, ACDC, that's what we've witnessed here in this chamber this week. The Greens, the Liberals, the Nationals are all doing their dirty deeds right in front of our eyes. We have a homeless crisis in this country, a rent squeeze, and we desperately need more social and affordable housing. And yet, all of those opposite and around this chamber, the Greens who are throwing the baby out with the bathwater because they, they're stamping their feet because they're not getting what they want, they would prefer to see people staying homeless than give them the support of the bill that's going to make a difference. The Albanese government wants to deliver security and putting more roofs over desperate Australians needing a place they can call home. The Greens, the Liberals and Nationals, they're now all known as the Noalition because instead of looking at this legislation as another layer of support on top of everything else that we've done in our recent budget, they're prepared to say no. This is a new all-time low in Australian politics. This is senseless, destructive politics. Those opposite only say no in this place. And what they really need to do is accept the election result. They're in opposition. The Australian people have spoken. They want action. They don't want people being left behind. They're sick of the Greens coming into this place, trying to rewrite what they want in legislation instead of accepting that this is a $10 billion housing affordability investment in the future for all Australians. But no, they won't do that. They'd rather do their dirty deal with the Liberals, which is extraordinary considering that the Liberals in Tasmania are always criticising Labor for doing any deals with the Greens. And what we've seen is this no coalition which is growing Polly, with all of them time involved. Has expired. Senator Rice. Thanks. Three prominent ecological scientists assessed this week's budget in an article in the conversation this morning. Sarah Beckersey, Brendan Wintle and Rachel Morgan were blunt. They noted that the government had made bold environmental promises over the last year, including ending new extinctions, fixing national nature laws and protecting 30 per cent of our land and waters. But they said that the budget falls well short of what is needed and that Australia's threatened species and ecosystems will not survive more funding neglect. They say that budget spending does not represent the substantial increase in funding needed to halt biodiversity decline or recover threatened species, and noted that Australia must spend $2 billion a year to save its 1,900 most imperilled species and an additional $2 billion a year for 30 years to restore 13 million hectares of Australia's degraded land. So where is the commitment to finalising and implementing recovery plans for leadbeater's possums, greater gliders, swift parrots, species being decimated by native forest logging? Ensuring their future is our future. I want to finish by quoting the lyrics of a wonderful Melbourne band, Sunfruits. Their words from their album One Degree, which was launched last weekend, should echo to all of us here. Fire in my throat. I'm choking on my breath, trying to find a way out of this godforsaken mess. Would you search for me in rubble and in smoke? Hope we wake one day and this is all a joke. Won't you stay with me and watch the end of the world? We can cry happily together. Won't you sit with me and hold my hand real tight? We can close our eyes and everything will be just fine. Oh, this, it feels like this is it, the very first year of the apocalypse. Oh, I will see you at the end of the world, dipping your toes into the inferno. I think we all need to listen up to young people and the fear that they are expressing in the environmental catastrophes Thank that we're you, facing. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Antic. A journalist's job is to hunt the truth. Now, that means following the evidence wherever it leads and faithfully reporting their findings to the public. The pursuit of truth is a vital service to our common good. The truth keeps tyranny at bay and provides facts in the face of propaganda. Before 2020, I think a lot of Australians assumed that we had at least something of a free and truthful press. But that myth has been blown apart and the trust in the fourth estate has never, ever been lower. The fear propaganda surrounding COVID-19 exposed the rot at the core of the censorship industrial complex, otherwise known as the mainstream media. Throughout this period, 
the censorship industrial complex ensured that any rational, reasonable, thoughtful discussion about case fatality rates, the origin of the virus, the ineffectiveness of the masks, the criticism of the state government's draconian lockdowns and restrictions was shut down. And that remains true today. The will of the elites was enforced ruthlessly by their handmaiden media assets, and those who didn't accept the ABC News or the latest CHO press conference and, and assumed that they had it right were demonised. So what does this tell us about the connection between the media, government and big business? Few journalists have remained faithful to their duty to pursue the truth for Australians, and despite the frustration aimed at parliaments like this, the censorship industrial complex was at least as culpable. So to the media release tra transcribing employees of the mainstream media, and that's basically all of you, I say, is doing the bidding of your corporate overlords really why you took this career? Are you satisfied by being the narrative enforcers of the big end of town? Because don't kid yourselves, that's what you've become. Senator Stewart. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I want to follow in from your comments in this, and contribute in this debate too. Now, Senator uh, uh, Chair, you and I came in here together 18 years ago with hopes of, yes, I know, I know, I know, it only feels like 18 years ago. But we have just witnessed, correct me if I'm wrong, one of the most insane sessions I think we've ever gone through. When the Labor government, proudly trying to put through its Housing Australia Future Fund, the $10 billion program, to build some 30,000 new social homes, when we tried to get extra hours yesterday, the Greens Listen to everyone out there. The Greens held hands with the coalition to defeat the motion. Then, no later than this morning, Madam Acting Deputy President, they were saying they wanted more time to debate this magnificent piece of uh, 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 policy. And then, within two or three hours, they're holding hands again with the coalition to kick the bill off the table, to just kick it down the road. And then I sat in your chair, Madam Acting Deputy President and witness one of the Greens, Senator Alban Payne, get up and start talking about the need for social housing. Please, Madam Deputy President, am I in a dream? Hang on. Oh, Jesus, that hurt. I can't believe what I've witnessed today. And the no alition holding hands with them in the corner. And I've called them a few things over the last few days. But I think one of the most fitting ones should be, maybe it's part of the coalition, but maybe they should change their name to the 10 who fell out the cuckoo's nest. I can't believe what we're experiencing here today. 30,000 homes. We've just gone through nine years of a terrible, rotten, stinking government who did nothing, who didn't even have a housing minister. And you lot want more, you said. You don't get it because none of you have been in any position to spend your own money. You want to spend everyone else's money. I cannot believe this is happening in Australia thank in 2023. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Palestinians around the world mark the Nakba, or catastrophe, every year on 15 May, referring to the violent dispossession by Israeli forces of 750,000 Palestinians from their homeland in 1948. But the deep and lasting trauma of the Nakba is an ongoing reality for millions of Palestinians who continue to live under a brutal military occupation. Israeli military strikes in recent days have killed women and children in Gaza, people trapped behind the Israeli-imposed blockade. With the recent election of the most extremist government in Israel's history, led by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the reality of the Nakba has never been more present or more terrifying for Palestinians than it is today. A second Nakba, pushed by senior members of this extremist Israeli government, is a real and growing threat. In global solidarity with Palestinians and their allies, I want to read onto the Australian parliamentary record an extract from a resolution introduced, by the US Con introduced to the US Congress by Palestinian Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, and in, and in her words say this, condemn all manifestations of Israel's ongoing Nakba against the Palestinian people including Israel's illegal theft of Palestinian land in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, Israel's displacement of Palestinians by destroying their homes and forcing them from their land, and the daily brutality and violence inflicted by the Israeli military and Israeli settlers against Palestinian civilians. Mr. 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 Acting Deputy President, I will join with protesters this, this, in Sydney this Saturday to mark 75 years since the beginning of the Nakba. And I say this having visited, visited the West Bank and seen the daily brutality myself. 
and I will stand in solidarity with Palestinians in calling for peace with justice. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I say this as someone who is, is new to this place, but it, it seems to me on Thursday afternoon we haven't got through any legislation this week. It's been incredibly frustrating, and I don't think we're living up to what Australians want from their elected representatives to actually debate the issues. We've had months on this housing bill. I would urge both the Labor and the Greens to work together to come to some sort of agreement that will benefit people who desperately need housing. It's easy for me. I can ride into work. But people in the Senate fly from all over the country. Our time here is valuable. I would <laughs> urge senators to make use of that valuable time. We next sit in when is it June, and we're kicking all this stuff down the road and going to have to deal with it then. I would urge the Greens and Labor to do what I think Australians expect of the Senate, where the government does not have a majority. They may claim mandates on certain things. Every other elected representative in here, whether you're from the coalition or, or minor parties, independents, have, have their own mandate. And that's what the Senate is about, <laughs> working to shape policy, to shape legislation, so that it reflects what I think Australians want. It's incredibly frustrating that, that after three days, we've basically done not much in here other than procedural matters, slinging mud at each other. We can do better. And I, I would really hope that potentially over the next few hours, maybe something can, can be agreed on, on the half. If not, when we come back in June, that it can be dealt with. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Two weeks ago, I visited Fitzroy Crossing, a place that I know you know very well, a town that went underwater in a record flooding event earlier this year. And a hundred buildings were flooded, including homes, businesses, and the Fitzroy River Bridge on the Great Northern Highway collapsed, vital infrastructure that connects the east and the west Kimberley. Uh, to give an idea of how much water was there, the speed signs on the sides of the road in Fitzroy Crossing had dents on the top, and that's where the propellers from the boats hit the top of those signs. Now, I met with the Fitzroy Volunteer Fire and Emergency Services team. Uh, the team that was responsible for carrying out rescues of stranded locals before DFES and the Australian Defence Force arrived to lend a hand. Uh, and during the state of emergency, while homes and businesses were going underwater, captain of the Fitzroy Crossing uh, Emergency Services, Richard Oman, led teams that facilitated rescues of more than 100 individuals, in some instances needing to dive down into flooded homes swimming underneath door frames and breaking windows to be able to reach people inside. Now, even while their homes themselves, their own homes, were being flooded, the brave men and women of the Fitzroy Volunteer Fire and Emergency Service team were out in force around the clock saving lives. Thankfully, not a single life was lost during the peak of the emergency. The efforts of those heroes were truly remarkable and I commend them for their service during uh, their community's dire hour of need. And while the town is certainly still recovering, it's not closed for business. It's a beautiful place. I encourage people to go there. The causeway is now open. Caravans can get through and peak season is now. So get on up there. Go and explore the beautiful Kimberley. It's a magical place of the world. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, the pathetic pants wearing senators in this chamber all bar two prevented me from introducing my Acts Interpretation Amendment Aboriginality Bill 2023. This stunt has rarely ever been done. They are effectively saying that a senator who represents more than five million Queenslanders is not allowed to introduce legislation or speak in this chamber on their behalf. That's not democracy. That's a dictatorship of which the North Koreans would be proud. Crowd. Heed my warning. This issue would continue to fester in the referendum period and for a long time afterwards until we settle what defines an Indigenous Australian. It's a crucial question for many reasons. Many Indigenous Australians are understandably appalled 
that a non-Indigenous person would falsely claim to be one of them for personal gain. And there is plenty of evidence that many non-Indigenous people have done just that. Since 1971, the number of people recorded in the census identifying as Indigenous has risen 700 per cent. From the 2016 census till the 221 census, the total population of Australia rose 8 per cent, while the number of people identifying as Indigenous rose 25 per cent. What a joke! Budgets and monies given to Aboriginal corporations rely on these figures. Government spending per non-Indigenous Australian is approximately $24,000, while government spending per Indigenous Australian is more than $44,000. In many cases, no real evidence is required to identify as an Aborigine. It's effectively a box-ticking exercise. My bill seeks only to ensure that any future legislation define an Indigenous Australian as they do as a Knight of Title claimant. This will provide a stronger definition and aims to prevent dishonest people from falsely claiming a heritage that is not theirs. Also stop the rorting and Indigenous gravy train. Where's the accountability PM Albanese Senator with Hansen, continual lies to the public? They have expired. Senator Waters. Thank you. There's been a lot of attention on the budget night fundraiser, fundraiser event for the Labor Business Forum this week. The goal of a Labor fundraiser being sponsored by PwC, a company that had leaked confidential Labor government documents, what? rightly raised eyebrows. After pressure from my colleague Senator Barbara Co Pocock, I was pleased to see PwC withdraw their sponsorship of the event, but we will keep holding the government's feet to the fire over their relationship, the cosy relationship with that company. Previous pressure from the Greens and the crossbench has meant that party fundraising events can no longer be held in this building, but the grift certainly continues outside this place. The Budget Night fundraiser once again highlights gaping loopholes in our donation disclosure rules, rules that allow the big parties to continue to rake in hundreds of thousands of dollars without adequate scrutiny, rules that continue to give big donors privileged access to ministers. The current definition of gift allows a wide range of contributions to avoid being classified as donations. Exorbitant membership fees, like the $82,000 PwC paid to the Labor Business Forum, aren't considered donations. Donors can spend thousands of dollars on a fundraising event with the Treasurer, but it's not a donation if they think they got value for money. Well, I think $330 million in government contracts might seem like pretty good value for money if you're PwC. At $5,000 per seat, the event could have raked in hundreds of thousands of dollars for the Labor Business Forum on a night when the Treasurer announced that those on JobSeeker would get $2.85 extra a day. We won't know how much Labor coffers grew from the evening until at least February of next year. Business forums are a front to get around donations rules, and it's time to strengthen those rules. Thank if you, you really Senator want to know Waters, what stakeholders time want, for this listen has without expired. Move to question time. Oh, uh, sir. By, I seek leave to make a statement concerning minister arrangements. Oh, well, I am seeking sorry. leave. Sorry, <laughs> sorry Senator Wong. Um, I advise changes to ministerial arrangements, which uh, Senator Farrell. Sorry, sorry Senator. It's all right. Just for the Chamber's awareness, Senator Farrell will be absent from question time today on account of ministerial business overseas. In his absence, ministers will represent portfolios at question time in accordance to the letter that I have circulated to the President and party leaders and independent senators. We we'll now move to question time and I call Senator Dean Smith. Very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Yesterday the Treasurer said in Parliament, Bill Evans from Westpac, a very respected economist, said, I don't expect them to put upward pressure on interest rates. Today, Mr Evans said, the risk is that the stimulus that's in the economy in 2023-2024 proves to be stronger than the Reserve Bank is comfortable with and therefore they don't have the scope to cut rates as early as February. He said the timing of the first Reserve Bank cut will be the factor where the budget may have an implication. Does the Treasurer still agree with Bill Evans, whose comments clearly show 
that Labor's budget risks interest rates being higher for longer. Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank uh, Senator Smith for the question. Uh, we are very confident that the budget uh, providing cost of living relief and important investments into services like uh, medic. Well, give me a second. In fact, you've given me 12, so I appreciate that before the interjection starts, Senator Cash. Uh, but uh, without adding to inflation, and I would note there is a lot, there is a fair bit of commentary around. Um, about the budget, as you would expect, as you would expect uh, two days later. But Treasury's assessment, which provides advice to the government, which uh, supported us in finalising our budget decisions, Treasury's very clear assessment is that this budget will not add to inflationary pressures, and that is clear right through the budget papers. <coughs> the cost of living package is expected to directly reduce inflation by three quarters of a percentage point in 2023-24. And I would remind those opposite that, uh, uh, that a reasonable proportion of the spending that's happening uh, in this financial year is to do with the legacy pressures that we inherited from you. So it's spending that was continuing up and then it was stopping, and we are keeping uh, that, uh, those services and those agencies going. But I would note it would be very unusual, I think, to get uh, all the economists in Australia, particularly those that fi provide commentary, and for them to agree uh, on one point. I would say it's not unusual. Thoroughly unsurprising that you would have a range of views. I note um, that there has been uh, comments from uh, Mr. Evans from Westpac. Um, in fact, I had some discussions with Westpac yesterday. And I have a direct quote from Mr Evans where he says that he believes the policies were necessary, that's the investments we were making, and I don't expect them to put upward pressure on interest rates in the near term. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Smith, Senator Dean Smith, first supplementary. President, a supplementary question. <coughs> Yesterday you told the Chamber the budget was fiscally neutral, but today your colleague, the Minister for Aged Care, said that, and I quote, this is a budget that will put downward pressure on inflation, in contrast to economists from countless banks and rating agencies who have called this budget expansionary. Are you seriously arguing that the Minister for Aged Care is correct and that the majority of Australia's leading economists uh, are wrong? Thank you, Senator Smith. The time has expired. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. It would appear that Senator Smith wasn't listening to every single word I said in question time yesterday. I'm horrified. I'm horrified out of everyone. Senator Smith, I expect you. You're a man, you're a man with the eye on the detail. I know that from appearing before you in estimates. Uh, but I think if you go back and have a look at what I was saying, I was saying uh, that uh, the Treasury advice is that the cost of living package is expected to directly reduce inflation by three quarters of a percentage point in 23-24. I said it in fact, in answer to your first question as well. So uh, I think the uh, answers given by uh, uh, Minister Wells are completely consistent with the answers that I gave yesterday. I said that it puts downward pressure in 23-24 and across the forwards is, is broadly neutral. That, that is the point that we have been making for the past uh, two days. And I would say— Thank you, Minister. The time oh, for answering I'm has sure expired. I'll get an Senator Dean Smith, second supplementary. Thank you, Thank you, President. Can the Minister assure the Senate that not one of the measures in Labor's budget were thought to be inflationary in the independent Treasury advice you referred to in your first answer? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. Budget is a range of decisions, hundreds if not thousands of decisions that work together. Uh, and the focus, of, the focus of the ERC has been very clearly to make investments where we can, to make sensible cost of living relief package where we can find room to do so, and to not have those measures add to inflation. We have been consistent across that from the beginning of putting this budget together uh, to the release of this budget. It has been front and centre of our thinking. 
But we have had to accept that there is a need to provide some sensible, modest uh, investments where we can afford to do so. You see those in the cost of living package, where we can find room to support other investments like Medicare to make sure that bulk billing uh, continues on. Then we've made that as well. The Treasury advice was very clear, cannot be clearer. Look forward to exploring this in estimates that the decisions taken in this budget and they reflect, uh, are not inflationary and they are reflected the in the inflation for forecast in the budget. Senator White. Uh, <clears throat> my question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister outline how the budget delivers for women in Australia? Thank you, Senator White. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Pre President. I thank Senator White for the question and for her um, career long uh, effort in supporting uh, the rights of working women uh, right around this country. Yeah. Equality for women is at the heart of what we do as a Labor government, and there is no other government in recent memory that has done as much for Australian women as we have tried to do in our first year in government. For too long, Australians were treated as second-class citizens, and after nine years of blokey budgets, this is finally a budget that delivers for women. It delivers for all women now and into the future, but gives the most economically vulnerable immediate Order. relief. Our investments in parenting payments single, our increase in Commonwealth uh, Register. Please resume your seat. Uh, I have called order. Senator Henderson and Senator Hume. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Our increase to working age payments, and I'm pleased that we are abolishing the punitive Parents Next program from the 1st of July 2024, and designing a new voluntary. I'm sorry, but Senator, Senator Henderson, Henderson keeps interjecting, and, and I can't Hume. quite. I can't hear myself think, President. Oh. Uh, Minister, resume your seat. Order, particularly on my left, Senator Hume. I've just called you twice now, three times. To not to stop the interjections, Minister Gallagher. Thank you. We are supporting women's economic equality and helping to close the gender pay gap with investments to support highly feminised workforces, including fu fully funding a wage increase for aged care workers, investing in the Australian Skills Guarantee, which includes national targets for women in apprenticeships, and investing in building and retaining the early childhood education workforce. Over half of, uh, an additional half a billion in further investment in the national plan to end violence against women and children to bring total funding for investment in that national plan to a record of $2.3 billion. And there's a number of measures which address women's health priorities, including $26.4 million to support health and medical research focusing on women's health. Thank you, Minister. Senator White, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that comprehensive answer. It's a shame it was hard to hear, but I understand um, those who are used to developing blokey budgets won't listen. Can the Minister outline how the budget builds on the significant investments in women Order. already made by the Albanese government in just a year of government? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Senator White, and I hope you can hear the answer to this question. Uh, the answer to your question. In our first budget, less than six months after the election, we initiated the structural changes that will continue on, hopefully for generations, to improve the lives of all Australian women. This, our approach is not a sugar hit for women. It's going to change the landscape for women in this country. It builds on the investments we made in October, which will shift the dial on gender equality. This means investing in women's experiences across the board. For example, our investments in cheaper childcare and paid parental leave. We've invested in making the workplace relations system work better for women, including by putting gender equality at the, f at the heart of the Fair Work Commission's decision making and by implementing the Respect at Work recommendations so that women are safer at work. We're investing in women's safety, including to introduce paid domestic and family violence leave and in consent and respectful relationships education. Thank you, Minister. Senator White, second supplementary. Uh, can the minister outline how this budget demonstrates the government's commitment to ensuring that the experiences of women are at the heart of the budget process? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator for White, for the question. And just before I start that answer, could I welcome the Buralula women who are in the back row up in the uh, chamber there? Um, 
coming from uh, Senator McCarthy. Uh, a big hello from us, and so great to have you in the Senate here, particularly when we're talking about our investments uh, in women across the country. Our achievements, investments and actions have been uh, made deliberately and specifically to benefit women and contribute to gender equality, not because women are an afterthought or uh, something an add-on, something that you do at the end of the budget process. These are efforts that have been led by the Prime Minister down and across the Cabinet and reflect not only the values of the government, which is a majority female government, but the Australian people. And these priorities will be carried forward in the budget process through our gender responsive budgeting, our women's budget statement and the measures which support those. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to Minister Watt, representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. The government has had almost a year to assess and evaluate the $120 billion infrastructure pipeline and make funding decisions. Last week, the government announced a 90-day infrastructure review, placing hundreds of projects and billions of dollars of investment under a cloud. A genuine review would have assessed the merits of all projects in the pipeline. Why are the $9.7 billion of Labor election commitments exempt from the infrastructure review, particularly given many are smaller projects of a type often criticised by Minister King? And in the case of the Melbourne Suburban Rail Loop, also have a scathing order to General's report. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator McKenzie. It's nice to get a question from the National Party. We're still waiting for one about agriculture, uh, but one day they'll get there. Um, and it is important that we ensure that the Commonwealth Government's infrastructure program uh, can actually be delivered, can actually be funded that there are the skills available to build these projects. That, of course, was something that the former government never had any concern about because the coalition, all the coalition ever used to do was get out the colour-coded spreadsheets, work out which seats they needed to put, in, put some projects into, and off to the races. Off we go. We'll go out there and make some commitments. We won't worry about whether we can pay for them. We won't worry about whether there's the tradies to build them. All we'll do is go out and make an announcement. We'll trick people into thinking they're going to get a big road, and we'll never actually get around to delivering it. So this is exact, and you know I, I note Senator McKenzie has something to say about Auditor General reports. I would have thought she might be wanting to stay away from that. Uh, but you know we're all happy to talk about Auditor General reports that happened about the former government, uh, including Senator McKenzie, whether it be sports uh, programs, infrastructure Senator programs. Senator please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you. On relevancy, the minister has gone nowhere near why the election commitments given by the Labor Party, $9.7 billion of projects, aren't also subject to the review. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. I will draw the minister to the question. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Well, again, unlike the coalition government, this government actually believes that it's important to deliver on your election commitments, just as we think it's important to deliver on construction infrastructure projects that are already underway. Uh, so we have said uh, that election Order. commitment projects Order. or projects that are already under construction, including projects like the Rockhampton Ring Road, something that I know Senator Chisholm, Senator Green and myself have been very strong supporters of. Those projects will go ahead uh, while we review the bucket loads of projects in the former government's uh, infrastructure Watt? program that were— Please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Henderson, I did call you to order and you continued with your interjections. I would ask you to listen in silence. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. So, yeah, we make no apologies for delivering on our commitments and we make no apologies for following through and delivering projects that are already under construction. But the reality is the infrastructure program that we inherited from the former government had blown out from around 150 projects, nationally significant projects, to over 800 projects which could not be delivered, that were never funded, that never had a plan to be delivered because they were all about making an announcement. Thank you, Minister Watt. Uh, Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. There seems to be some confusion about which projects are exempt from the review and which aren't. Melbourne is one of only 18 airports from the 100 busiest in the world without a rail link. Who requested the $10 billion Melbourne Airport Rail Link project be subject to the infrastructure review? Was it the Minister, the Prime Minister or the Victorian State Labor President? Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator McKenzie. Minister. Well, we know that 
We know that Senator Mackenzie and a number of her colleagues have a bit of an obsession with the Victorian Premier, Premier uh, and that for years now they have traduced his reputation in this chamber uh, uh, with the hope of winning seats in Victoria, but all they ever actually do is go backwards. Uh, and I think we're, in, we're, all, we're all interested in the goings-on in the Victorian Liberal Party because uh, that weeping sorry. saw of a branch. Uh, Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Um, Senator Mackenzie. On relevancy to the question, Madam President, it was a very simple question about the airport rail link in yep. Melbourne and who decided it would be subjected to Thank the review. You, it wasn't, Senator Mackenzie. I didn't want to, you know, treat uh, just, on the Premier. Senator Mackenzie, I remind all senators there's no need to repeat the question. I will draw uh, Minister Watt to the question. Thank you. Minister Watt. Um, well, I mean, I know this might be hard for Senator Mackenzie and the National Party to understand, but the Labor Party doesn't operate in a way where our party presidents dictate what happens in infrastructure programs. I mean, I know that's what happens in the National Party and the Liberal Party, that you get the faceless men out there you know, coming in and telling uh, you what Minister to do Watt, and fund this Minister project Watt, and fund that project. Please resume your seat. Order across the chamber. Senator Ayres, I've just called the Senate to order. Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you. So, as I say, we don't operate on the basis of uh, the coalition, where we have outside political uh, intermediaries dictating uh, what we should Minister do. Like, Watt, I know you don't want to hear it. Please resume but your seat. Senator Birmingham. Point, point of order, President. On the matter of direct relevance, the question was very clear. It went to whether it was the Prime Minister, the Premier, or the Minister who interfered. Now, the Minister's had his fun for 46 seconds now, but in the remaining 14 seconds, I urge you to draw him to the question and encourage him to be directly relevant to it and give a clear answer. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. I will again refer the Minister to the question. Um, well, uh, what I'm trying to do in rejecting the premise of the question is point out that we operate differently, uh, that we operate on the basis of delivering projects that have been funded, that have business cases, that can be delivered rather than making announcements. Uh, Senator Mackenzie, second supplementary. The Herald Sun today reports that the minister's staff claimed she misspoke at her May 1 press conference when she gave an emphatic, and I quote, no it doesn't include to the airport rail link. When saying the $10 billion Melbourne airport rail link would not be part of the review, did Minister King misspeak? And when else has she misspoken about other projects ruled in and out of the review? Will the government release a full list of projects subject to the review, given the lack of clarity on what is exempt thank and what you, isn't? Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. The time for asking has expired, Minister. Um, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Well, I have no reason to disagree with the comments that are in the Herald Sun today uh, about that issue. Um, but let's not forget the reason why we need this review in the first place, and that is because we inherited an infrastructure program that had blown out from 150 projects of national significance Senator to over Starr. 800, littered with projects that were all about pork barrelling. Didn't matter whether they could be delivered. Grossly underfunded, grossly underfunded, unable to be delivered. I mean, there's the inland rail, the inland rail, that that signature piece of Order. the National Party at Order. work. Senator I Birmingham. mentioned yesterday that the National Party was full of e economic illiterates, and if there is one example better than any other, it is the inland rail, where the project has blown out in cost from is it 15 billion to 31 billion, or is it 32 or 33 or 34? Doubled in cost. We're not talking about small beer here. We are talking billions of dollars. There's the urban congestion fund, the commuter car parks. We are cleaning up the mess, and we're going to have Minister, an infrastructure the program we deliver. Answering has expired. Senator Barbara Pocock. Sorry, wrong page. <laughs> Didn't know I was next. Um, on the 6th, my question is to the Minister of Finance. Sorry for the delay. On the 16th of November, the Tax Practitioners Board ruled that the former PwC partner, Peter Collins, leaked confidential government tax plans and sold advice to clients to help them sidestep multinational tax avoidance laws. Since then, PW has been awarded more than 77 million in new government contracts. All you and the government have done to date is speak of reputational damage as the penalty for PwC and to seek assurances from PwC that they won't do it again. Will the government immediately cease 
and ban all contracts with PwC. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. <laughs> I thank Senator Pocock for the question. And on the issue, I think we have all been deeply shocked uh, by the information that has been uncovered through that inquiry. Uh, and I think, uh, certainly from my point of view, uh, deeply disappointed that um, you know, processes that are put in place so that we in can engage in, um, uh, in uh, reasonable open discussion uh, confidentially about how certain legislation is drafted and its potential impact, uh, where we work with stakeholders, um, not just through, obviously through all, um, places like PwC, but more broadly. Uh, has been compromised in this way. Uh, I've read all the emails that have been uh, provided through Senator O'Neill's um, at Senator O'Neill's request that have gone through uh, to the committee, and I think they uh, they reflect very poorly on PwC. Indeed, um, I know that the uh, Treasurer has asked uh, his secretary to provide advice to the government on what further steps are needed to respond to these matters uh, beyond the recommendations of the Tax Practitioners Board. And I have also asked my department some time ago to look at what can be done in the procurement framework and in contract management processes to ensure the integrity of suppliers, but also uh, to act as a, a very significant deterrent to this kind of behaviour occurring uh, again. I, am yet, I haven't received that advice yet. Uh, we've been finalising the budget, by, but I expect that I will, will get it uh, reasonably soon, and I'm happy to update you as I get it. I'm, my understanding is I am not. Well, the government um, doesn't directly engage through the departments, through their contractual arrangements, uh, that, um, that stopping those contractual arrangements you, where they exist the is not an option available to you. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Taxpayers are looking more for more than discussion and advice. The ATO estimated that up to $180 million in tax revenue could have been at risk from the PwC breach. Why is this matter not being invested, investigated by the Australian Federal Police under the Crimes Act, and will the government sue PwC to recover any lost revenue? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Um, Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Um, well, I think uh, in, in response to the um, assertion that the Australian people deserve more than discussion and advice, uh, it is uh, not unusual uh, before a government takes whatever future steps, if they are available to us, um, whether that's through the Treasury or the finance, to take advice on that before making a decision. Uh, so I don't think that's unusual. I think what I am saying to you is that the government is extremely um, concerned about what has been uncovered uh, through the Tax Practitioners Board's inquiry. Uh, we, have, we are aware of the material, we have looked at it and we are taking further advice on what further can be done uh, to deal with it. Um, I think that's what people would expect from a responsible government. That's the steps the Treasurer and I have put in place. That is what we'll follow, and when we get that advice back, we will make further decisions. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you for that answer. PwC monetised confidential government information to earn $2.5 million in fees from 14 clients to sidestep new multinational tax avoidance laws. In this clear case of systemic corruption and cover-up, which everyone in this place must find abhorrent, will you work with this parliament and support the Greens' referral of this matter to the National Anti-Corruption Commission? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister uh, Thank you. Well, um, as, as senators know, anyone can make a referral to the uh, National Anti-Corruption Commission. They can uh, then the commission determines uh, makes its own decisions about what matters it will investigate. I can say that the government is appalled uh, by the behaviour of PwC in this uh, situation. It has compromised our ability to work with third parties around uh, developing uh, policy and legislation. And the Treasurer and I have taken the matter very seriously, and we are currently looking at what further steps are available in my area around the procurement framework, around panels, around future work, around all of those things, uh, to make sure that not only are we putting in place tighter processes 
uh, for those that are awarded contracts, but that we have a very significant deterrent about this kind of behaviour occurring again. Thank you, Minister. Senator Green. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Regional Development, Senator Watt. Colleen is a registered nurse living in Theodore, west of Gladstone. Colleen has found it impossible to secure housing. On the housing crisis, Colleen has said, and I quote, we don't have any options. We are out on the street. Basically, we are homeless. What is the Albanese government doing to address housing challenges in regional and rural Australia? Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Green, for being such a strong advocate for the needs of regional Queenslanders. It, it's a shame we don't have a few more of them in this place, especially, over, especially sort of around there, or sort of around there in particular. Uh, and certainly, Colleen's story in central Queensland is not an isolated one. At the end of last year, the vacancy rate in our home state of Queensland was 0.8 per cent, and the numbers in the regions were far worse, particularly in Gladstone, the Southern Downs, the Cape, Gundawindi and the Tablelands, all seeing near zero vacancy rates. The lack of housing in regional Australia disproportionately hurts women, low and middle income earners, the very essential workers and tradies that certain people that say they stand up for. It constrains regional economies and puts people in really difficult living situations. And it is the direct result of nine years of inaction and underfunding of housing from the former coalition government, who pretend they, that they are on regional Australia's side but always let them down. For years under the former government, we saw state governments, peak groups and regional communities crying out for national leadership and funding from their federal government to address what was a looming housing crisis. And as a result of their inaction, as a result of the mess they left behind, we see far too many regional Australians being hit by growing rents, struggling to buy a home and facing or experiencing homelessness. Now we, of course, as the new Labor government, have a policy to deliver 30,000 new social and affordable rental homes across five years through the Housing Australia Future Fund. Uh, and in fact, we've committed to distribute the homes equitably across urban, regional and remote Australia. So why are Senators Canavan and Macdonald, for instance, working with the Greens to stop this from happening? Why Order. is Gladstone-based Senator Ormond Payne uh, taking instructions from the inner-city-based Brisbane housing spokesperson on the other side of the building? These people should get behind Thank regional you, Australia Minister, and back in those your homes. Time for answering has expired, Senator Green. As Senator Canavan, I've called order. Senator Canavan. Uh, Senator Green, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Kelly, a disability pensioner from, pensioner from Tasmania, <laughs> was forced to live in a tent while waiting over eight months for social housing, and she was on the priority list. Can the minister outline how the Albanese government's housing initiatives guarantee social and affordable housing for regional and Order. rural Australia? Are you uh, just a moment, Minister. I'm waiting for silence before I call the minister. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Green, for the question. And certainly we all know the impacts the housing crisis is having in Tasmania, none more so than our Tasmanian senators. Uh, and I thank the advocacy of local senators from this side of the House, as well as Senators Lambie and Tyrrell, uh, for their willingness to work together for good housing outcomes. It's a little bit of a shame that a couple of other senators from Tasmania didn't have the same approach. Order. The Albanese government has been working hard to implement housing initiatives to increase housing supply in regional and rural ta Australia. For in Tasmania, for example, we're delivering 48 new affordable homes in Launceston uh, in partnership White, with community housing. Seat. Senator McKim. Senator McKim. Order. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. We're also delivering 181 new homes in northwest Tasmania, funded by the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation, in partnership with Housing Choices Tasmania. These are the th sort of things that we're doing in regional Queensland right now, and if we can get the Senate to agree, we want to Order. do more. And that's why we've included in Housing Australia's uh, investment Watt. mandate. Minister Watt, please renew me. Order. Oh, Senator Rennick. And Senator Canavan, I've called you about three times. I expect order when I call it. Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. I mean, I know they're working together on the votes, but it seems that they're working together on the interjections as well. I say to the new Greens, uh, Dutton. Thank you, Minister Watt. The time for answering has expired. Senator Green, second supplementary. 
Thank you. That are harmless. And Thank you, Senator President. Brown. On the housing crisis, the Regional uh, Australian Senator Institute Green, has said, please and I your seat. I'm waiting for silence. Order. Senator Green, please continue. On the housing crisis, the Regional Australian Institute has said, and I quote, Regional Australia wants policies that will add supply, that will make sure everyone in the community has a housing option available to them. What are the risks to regional and rural Australia if the Albanese government's important housing reforms are not implemented? Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Green. Well, of course, we all know that the biggest risk to regional and rural Australians uh, who need more housing in this is this unholy anti-housing alliance that has formed between the Greens, Peter Dutton and Pauline Hanson. Now, we've all known for a long time uh, that Minister the LNP Watt, has— Minister Watt, I remind you to refer to all MPs and senators by their correct title. Please continue. As we know, the LNP has profoundly let down regional Australians, but the Greens have done so too. For all the Greens' cries for more housing, they don't back it up in their own Senator homes. Uh, so which Greens senator, for example, owns a $1 million investment property in Brisbane? It's apparently quite nice. It features a master suite of epic precautions that would keep any of the Kardashians happy. And why did that senator increase Order. the rent on their investment property by 9 per cent while calling for a rent freeze? Minister uh, and which Greens senator, senator— Please resume your seat. Order on my left. Senator Hume, order. Please continue. Which Green senator owns four separate properties while telling the Senate last year that the great Australian dream today is owning a property portfolio with tenants who pay your income and your assets? Why would those sort of people now want to stand in the way of other people Thank getting you, a Minister. home the and a roof over their head? The time answering has expired. I am waiting to call a senator for the next question, and I expect there to be silence. Order. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. Appreciate it. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister of Health, Senator Gallagher. Your government has acknowledged that your proposed changes to the dispensing limit for pharmacies from 30 to 60 days will mean pharmacists lose income. You have made a welcome commitment that the money your government saves from this measure will be reinvested back into community pharmacies. How much money will pharmacists lose as a result of these changes, and how much are you committing to reinvest? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I thank Senator Tyrrell for the question. Um, there is an important change uh, that the government is making based on the advice of the expert group, uh, which has provided this advice to government since 2018, but those opposite ignored and, and didn't address. Uh, it's a significant cost of living measure that's going in. In terms of, in, in terms of reducing people's um, uh, what they have to pay for their medicines, and we know how much that can hit uh, the pocket of many households, six million Australians who rely on regular medicines. In terms of uh, the changes and the impact on the budgets, in the order of, I think, from memory, and I will check this, I will correct this if I have to, in the order of uh, just over a billion dollars in terms of savings to, uh, to the government. Uh, and we are reinvesting all of that back into pharmacy. We have also heard, and it, it, and it will. Senator and Rustin. we're not disputing that there will be, um, you know, lost income to pharmacies um, through this, basically because they are not charging people um, every month uh, for the additional um, dispensing fees. Um, if they are only charging that once every two months, that will impact on on pharmacies' income. Uh, but it also has a, makes a major difference to people who rely on medicines and how much they pay. And these are the decisions that we have thought through Senator carefully. Uh, our, uh, we want pharmacies to do more. We don't want them to be seen as retailers, sort of clipping the ticket in a sense. You know, when they're making that, we want them to be health professionals. They want to be health professionals. Our investments Order are essentially putting that money back into pharmacies Senator so that Starr. they can do those important jobs like vaccination, like opioid treatments and other things. I have no doubt the role of the pharmacy, pharmacist will change Thank significantly you, the in time coming for years. Answering has expired. Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. Thank you. Does the government's commitment to reinvestment extend to the 1.6 billion pharmacists stand to lose from prescription co-payments? 
Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Gallagher. Well, certainly the money that uh, come, what would have normally returned to our budget will we'll go back into pharmacy. We make that 100 per cent commitment. We want to work with pharmacy about how these changes rolled through. So we have responded to them. Senator Rustin, it's not your turn. Um, we have responded to pharmacy about Senator the rollout Rustin. of this administration, and you're obviously arguing for people to pay more for their medicine. So there you go. That's Order. what you're doing. Double. You are wanting them to pay more. Order. Uh, that we will make those investments uh, back into pharmacy to make sure that they can um, do, you know, do new programs, more programs, and indeed programs that were facing a funding cliff under the former government. We'll work with them on the phasing of this. So, coming in in September, then coming uh, in Minister in June, please resume your seat. Uh, January. Uh, Senator Rustin. Order, order on relevance. Um, I think you'll find that the question that was asked by the senator at the other end of the chamber is not the question that is being answered by the minister. You may draw her attention to it unless she doesn't understand uh, the thank question. Thank you, Senator Rustin. The minister is being directly relevant. Minister, please continue. How's opposition going? Uh, thank you. In terms, if the question relates to whether the government, uh, the government will will fund um, the other income, not related to the one that's returning to government. That is not our intention, but we do want Thank to work you, with pharmacy the about the new things they can do. Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. Thanks, President. Does your government's promise to reinvest every dollar pharmacies, pharmacies lose include or exclude the lost dispensing fees are required to compensate per the current community pharmacy agreement? Uh, thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Gallagher. Uh, well, the, uh, the government remains committed to the agreement uh, and it will continue. Uh, we will enter, no doubt, in the next little while discussions into the eighth um, uh, pharmacy agreement. Uh, but I think the point we're trying to make here is the government got advice that said there is absolutely no reason why people have to come in every month to get their medicines. For a certain number of medicines, you only need to come in once every two months if your doctor approves it. If your doctor approves it, you can get access to this medicine once every two months. It will save you money. It will save money throughout the year. It is safe. It's the advice to government. And if we weren't acting on this, I think people who have to buy medicines every month are right to ask their government why. Uh, because the very clear advice is it's safe, we want to work with pharmacies, and it means that it's cheaper for people who rely on long-term medicine. Thank you, Minister. Senator Chandler. President, my question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Yesterday on Sky News, former Labor leader Bill Shorten said this. I always think, Senator well, Stirl. there's plenty of property tax concessions and a lot of well-off people still getting some money from the government. Do you agree with Minister Shorten? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I haven't seen uh, the comments to which Senator Chandler refers, and I do note that the opposition has a habit of selectively quoting um, to. Uh, well, you do. To be fair, you do. Uh, uh, I think the tax expenditure statement, which the Treasurer released uh, earlier this year, uh, shows the arrangements that are in place, uh, various um, tax concessions that are in place. We reported it openly and transparently. You can see it in the tax expenditure statement. It's available online, I believe, if you haven't already looked at it. Uh, and the budget uh, that we handed down on uh, Tuesday, just two days ago, uh, doesn't make any change uh, to those arrangements. Uh, the budget that we handed down was very much focused on cost of living relief, uh, about where we could make investments into key services like Medicare, tripling the bulk billing rate, and also how do we repair the budget over time? How do we borrow less? How do we pay less interest? And, and the importance behind returning those upward revisions in revenue to budget repair so that we put the budget on a much more sustainable footing so that we can find room uh, for uh, responsible investments in other areas of services as those decisions get taken. Uh, Senator Chandler, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Minister, for your response. Minister, is the government's view that a tax concession or a tax reduction is, as Minister Shorten said, the government giving out money? Or are such tax arrangements a case of Australians getting to keep more of their hard-earned income? Uh, Minister Gallagher. 
Well, the budget um, outlines the government's position on all of these matters. Um, I would refer you to the budget. Um, you know, it clearly outlines the changes that we've made around taxation. There are, there are some modest and minor changes, but ones that will make a meaningful difference uh, to the budget going forward, particularly outside the forward estimates. So you look at the changes we're making to superannuation, uh, bringing forward some revenue under the arrangements under the PRRT. Uh, that is the position of the government. But I would say you know, um, you know, it's very important, I think, and that's why the tax expenditure statement was released, uh, that people are aware of the concessionary nature of a whole range of measures uh, that exist in the budget. It's important that we, are, you know, we have uh, that information available to people um, and those where uh, there hasn't been any change to those concessions uh, in this budget um, that we handed down two days ago. Uh, thank you. Senator Minister, Senator Chanda, second supplement. Please. Thank you, President. Minister, is the fundamental reason why Australians always pay more under Labor because Labor doesn't actually trust Australians to spend their money on their own needs? Uh, thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister Gallagher. Um, I, I didn't catch the um, end of it, but I think I got the gist of it. Um, uh, Minister, just for clarity, I'll get the uh, Senator Chair, but just to repeat, it's quite a short question. Thank you, President. Uh, Minister, is the fundamental reason why Australians always pay more under Labor because Labor doesn't actually trust Australians to spend their money on their own needs? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, Senator Chandler. It doesn't change my answer, but um, the... the um, the budget that we have handed down, I think, shows the respect with which we hold uh, the Australian people, because it responds to the pressures that are being experienced now. It responds to essential services going forward, and it, it uh, creates um, space to grab the opportunities that come for the future. So it's a story about meeting Australian people's needs now, investing in services and growing the economy so more people get more opportunities in the future. Uh, this is a very responsible budget, and I think it pays respect to the Australian people. Uh, and in terms of the budget repair story, we will be borrowing less, significantly less, under this budget and under the repair strategy that we have implemented. So I don't accept uh, Senator Chandler's proposition. We will borrow $300 billion less, and we will pay. Less, well, we Thank will you, pay Minister. $83 billion dollars less in has interest. Expired. Thank you. Senator Babette. Thank you. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Minister Wong. Minister, we live in a global economy and Australia has a lot to contribute to international trade. We are blessed with an abundance of natural resources and an agricultural sector that produces the best food and fibre in the world. I commend the government on their recent success in negotiating trade agreements with the UK and India. Can the minister please update the Senate on the current progress with negotiating a free trade agreement with the European Union? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister Wong. Thank you, um, Senator Babette. And uh, as you know, uh, as a consequence of uh, thank you of Senator Farrell um, going to China, also on trade issues, and I'm happy if you come to that in a supplementary question to, to go to that. Um, uh, I will update on the EU as well as the UK, and thank you for your recognition of, of the UK agreement. Uh, securing an ambitious trade deal with the European Union uh, would obviously be a significant step towards creating more opportunities for Australian exporters. One of the points that we have made since coming to government uh, is uh, that diversification of our export markets, which we recognise is a diversification of what we export as well as where, where we export to, uh, is an important part of, of improving our economic resilience. Uh, we, we benefit greatly from trade, bilateral trade with, with, with many countries, uh, and we are better off and more resilient as a nation if we can diversify uh, our, our export markets, which requires, in turn, not only trade agreements but also a diversification of the goods and services exported. Obviously, the EU, e European Union, uh, which uh, uh, is a very large part of the global economy, it's a, a high-income market, it has about 450 million people, GDP of around uh, $24 trillion. 
Uh, we are uh, working towards. Uh, I know as Minister Farrell is working towards uh, progress uh, or seeking to progress the EU trade agreement. I think there's already been quite a lot of uh, media and discussion about it, including under the previous governments. There are issues uh, that will have to be resolved. Um, uh, uh, issues around provenance and so forth. Uh, I know Minister Farrell is working very hard uh, to try and, and um, ensure there is progress on that for the reasons I've outlined. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Babette, first supplementary. Minister, free trade agreements are a good example of where bipartisanship it delivers great outcomes for the Australian people. Now, on the 6th of March, the government member for Fremantle and chair of the Treaties Committee stated in the Federation Chamber that the independent tribunal system used to resolve investor state dispute settlements is dodgy. His words. Minister, does your government agree with this statement? Yes or no? Is the ISDS dodgy? Uh, thank you, Senator Bebet. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you. Two points there. First, in relation to bipartisanship, I think you'll find, Senator Bebet, if uh, and I know uh, you, you weren't here um, uh, when I was Shadow Trade Minister, nor would you probably remember anything about that, but because it may not have been that interesting. But uh, <laughs> I did work quite hard uh, as Shadow Trade Minister to deliver bipartisanship, and it was through that period that the Labor Party um, supported uh, the. Uh, uh, China Free Trade Agreement, the uh, Korean Free, free Trade Agreement. Oh, Senator uh, Wong, please resume question. your seat. Senator Babette. Just on relevance there, President, I just would like to know if the ISDS is it dodgy. That's all. Yes or no? Uh, thank you, um, Senator Babette. There was also a, a, a rest of your uh, question also went to free trade agreements and bipartisanship. Minister Wong. Uh, Senator Bed, I wasn't trying to obfuscate. I was actually trying to be helpful, and I, so I was actually agreeing. I think bipartisanship does matter. I'm also on record from that time, and I think since that time, our party's position has developed, raising concerns about ISDS. Uh, and uh, we all know, for example, uh, that it was my recollection is, and I might be wrong, a Hong Kong free trade agreement and investor state dispute settlement clause under that. Uh, which led to tobacco companies seeking illegal uh, thank action you, Minister. against the time for Australia. For has expired. Senator Babette, uh, second supplementary. Minister, it is important for the integrity of current and future trade agreements that the Commonwealth of Australia abide by the terms of its agreements. Senator we know Ayers. that the same number. We note that the same member of government made further statements on the 30th of March, and I quote again: "The dodgy system known as ISDS." Are we to take it that the arbitrator recently appointed by the Commonwealth to an ISDS arbitration is also dodgy? Yes or no? Is he dodgy or she? Uh, thank you, Senator Babette. Min Minister. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to comment on an individual, and I'm sorry, I don't actually um, know what detail you're referring to, Senator Babette, but I would make this point. The, clause, the ISDS clause that I referenced in the Hong Kong Agreement was used by tobacco companies to try and take legal action against an Australian government for plain packaging. Uh, I think that demonstrates, that demonstrates uh, uh, amongst other things, the concerns uh, that many in the Australian community have about those sorts of, 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 of provisions in trade agreements, that they obviate a country's sovereignty or constrain a country's sovereignty. So we in government have said we won't be doing trade agreements with those clauses in them, and we will be going through a process of trying to improve or remove those agreements which um, have those Minister clauses. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Babette. Once again, uh, relevance is the person who is appointed by the Commonwealth to, mm -hmm. the, to ISDS arbitration. Is this person dodgy? That's it. Uh, Thank you, Senator Babette. Uh, Minister Wong went to that part of your question. Um, Minister, please continue. Uh, well, uh, I again say uh, we have concerns about uh, ISDS clauses when it comes to ensuring that an Australian government can make appropriate decisions on behalf of the Australian community, and we put those on the record. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Polly. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. After nine long years of cuts and neglect, how is the Albanese Labor government investing in Medicare and, importantly, making it easier to see a doctor? Great. Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Wong. 
Uh, thank you, Senator Polly, and thank you for your support for Medicare, for your continued advocacy for public health and public health measures alongside all of your Tasmanian and Labor colleagues. Because this, what we know is Labor built Medicare and we will always protect it and we will always strengthen it. And there are some differences between those on this side of the chamber and those on that side. We can go through them. But you know what? Top of the list is Medicare. Medicare, because we are the party of Medicare, and we know that you have opposed it and sought to break it so over so many years, including under Mr Dutton. I'll come back to you. But in this budget, this Albanese Labor government is making historic investments in Medicare. We believe Australians should be able to access affordable, reliable health care. That is why we are investing $5.7 billion to build a stronger Medicare. Our priority is to invest in Medicare and make it stronger. Their priority was to cut Medicare. Cut Medicare. Those opposite left measures in the budget on a timeline to be cut, and they failed to address the needs of Australians, particularly our most vulnerable. This government is investing to ensure the tripling of the bulk billing incentive. This is the largest increase to the incentive in the 40-year history of Medicare, and it will benefit Australians. It will benefit pensioners. It will benefit Commonwealth concession cardholders, and it will benefit Australian families. We've wasted no time making medicines cheaper, establishing Medicare urgent care clinics, investing in practices to employ more nurses and allied health professionals. We've committed $219.4 million to extend public dental services because we understand Medicare Thank must you, always Minister be protected. Wong. The time for answering has expired. Senator Polly, first supplementary. What a stark contrast. <laughs> Following a sharp decline in bulk billing under the Liberal and nationals, can the minister please outline to the Senate what the government is doing to boost bulk billing? Order, um, Minister Wong. Uh, for almost, uh, thank you for the question. And of course, we we understand how important how important bulk billing is, uh, and that is, and what we also know, and what Australians know, is that over for over a decade, those opposites made bad decisions that eroded Australia's world class healthcare system, and they weren't up front with the Australian people on the bulk billing rate, which has been in decline. Let's remember they're led by a man who doctors voted uh, as the worst health minister in decades. Now, the principle that all Australians should have to access affordable care underpins Medicare. That is why, as I said, the centrepiece of our strengthening Medicare package is a $3.5 billion investment to triple bulk billing incentives for GP visits. This means 5 million children and their families, 7 million pensioners and concession card holders will be able to see a GP without, a, a, without an out-of-pocket expense. Thank you, Senator Wong. The time for answering has expired. Senator Polly, second supplementary. President, how is the government making Medicare stronger for all Australians, and how does the budget deliver crucial funding for urgent needs of today and reforms for health care for tomorrow? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, Senator Polly. Well, uh, as I said, we're investing in bulk billing. We're investing in practices to employ more nurses and allied health professionals. We're investing in public dental health services. We're investing $47.8 million in wound care for patients with diabetes and chronic wounds. We're investing in digital health to ensure that critical information sharing more secure, safe and uh, uh, sa more secure, safe and efficient information system to benefit patients and clinicians. Those opposite are remembered for many things, and one of them is the GP tax. Let's remember that the man who will front the parliament tonight saying he's going to talk about yep. families was the health minister who sought to impose a tax on Australians going to GPs. Yep. The GP co-payment, which Mr Dutton sought to impose, is something every Australian should remember when he stands up tonight and claims he speaks for Australian families. That is why we know it is only those on this side. Time has expired. Order. Order.
Order. Senator Smith, you've got one of your own senators on his feet. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, uh, Senator Gallagher. What proportion of Australian households will face the impact of higher inflation and interest rates being higher for longer as a result of Labor's budget, but receiving none of your selective handouts? Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Um, Minister Gallagher. Well, uh, thank you for the question, and I, I guess we should expect um, we should expect that kind of divisive uh, question from those opposite that seek to divide Australia as opposed to unite it. Uh, and if uh, the senator had read the budget papers, they will see that we are predicting that inflation comes down considerably over the next financial year before heading back to the target range. And I would remind those, I would remind those opposite uh, that interest rates uh, began rising under them. They, yeah, because you lost the election, mate. Order. You lost the election. Order. That's why. Order. And we are, have been in a, a period of tightening of monetary policy uh, since that time, and that's why the budget has been carefully crafted to not add to the inflation challenge in the economy. Thank but here you. you go. Here's a list of things where we have our focus on all Australians. This is a budget that seeks to make investments that benefit all Australians, no matter how much you try to divide different groups across our community. In terms of wages growth, who do you reckon that helps? For the first time in a decade, under an overturning of your policy to deliberately withhold wage increases from working people, we are going to see real wages growth. And the reason why we've got significant upward revisions in this budget is because part of the reason is because we are seeing wages growth. Our investment in Medicare, the tripling of the bulk billing rate, supports all families across the country. We're putting downward pressure on inflation to tackle the cost of living on energy bills. The gas and uh, energy caps that we put in place that you voted against, have a look in the budget at what that says about uh, the, the fact that people will be paying less on their bills because oh, as a you, direct Minister, the time result for answering of has expired. Senator O'Sullivan, first supplementary. Yesterday on the Today Show, construction worker Frank was interviewed and said. I feel that our standard of living has reduced considerably. I've never seen it like this. Australia should be considered a lucky country. Are we lucky? No, we're not. Give the working person, the people who support this country, the middle-income workers, more relief. Minister, wouldn't Frank and indeed all Australians be better off if you had a plan to tackle inflation rather than a budget that just selects a few winners? Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Gallagher. Oh, here we go. It's so predictable. Uh, and would I say? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't see that interview, but what I would say is there are challenges in our economy because of 10 years of failure to deal with the challenges, to deal with the energy transition as one example, and we are playing catch up so that we can seize the opportunities and the jobs and the income that is going to come with that tr energy transition. We are uh, putting in place legislation that you voted against to get wages moving in this country. You voted against it every single time we put in this place some legislation to improve the lives of working people. You vote against it. You vote against the Housing Australia Future Fund. You vote against Order, the National Senator Reconstruction Stark. Fund. You vote against everything, every idea that we are bringing into this chamber to build a better future for every Australian. You vote no to it, and then you come in here and start pretending Thank that you're you, on their side. The time it doesn't for add up. Answering has expired. Senator O'Sullivan, second supplementary. Thank you, President. This budget confirms that cost of living continues to go up. Gas and electricity prices continue to rise. Real wages are not growing. Inflation remains high. Unemployment will rise, and Australians will pay more taxes. Why is it that Australians always pay more under Labor? Uh, thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, um, Madam President. And what, uh, what the Australian people will see in this budget is targeted cost of living relief, helping those that are most vulnerable. Are you opposed to that? Are you opposed to those investments? Because it sounds like you are. Delivering historic investments Order. in Medicare and aged care. Are you opposed to that? Because it sounds like you're opposed to that. 
wage increase for aged care workers. You opposed to that too? That's in the budget. Uh, is that because is, it sounds like you are Senator growing Sullivan. the economy in skills, in small business for renewables? Sounds like you're opposed to that as well. Strengthening the budget Senator surplus, Hume. cleaning up the mess that we inherited. Uh, Eleven and a half billion dollars in legacy funding pressures that just were going to end, tip off a cliff. Fourteen point eight billion dollars, seventeen point eight billion dollars in savings in this budget. We're borrowing less. We're paying less interest. We've returned. We've forecast Thank a surplus you, this financial the year, and you're opposed to that. Expired. Senator Wong. I'll ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Smith, do you Thank seek you very call? much, uh, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of questions uh, asked, responses to questions asked by coalition senators during this question time. I'm going to start with a history lesson, and Senator Gallagher probably knows which part of the history lesson I'm going to start with, and that is the history of Medicare co-payments in this country. And I want to take everyone back to 1991. And who was the Labor Party leader? Who was the Prime Minister? Bob Hawke. Exactly. And what was happening to Bob Hawke in 1991? He was facing leadership pressures. And what did Bob Hawke, as Prime Minister, and his then Health Minister Brian Howe, do without consultation and announce in the 1991 federal budget? A Medicare co payment of $3.50 and a reduction in the rebate of $3.50. So it lacks credibility for Labor senators to come into this place and try to suggest that it is only coalition members and senators who are interested in a sustainable health system. So let me finish the story. Let me finish the story. What happened, what happened later in 1991? What happened later in 1991, and this is particularly important for the current Treasurer, what happened next? What happened next? The left and the right and the ACT, they ganged up on Bob Hawke, who, to be fair, was a very, very popular Australian Prime Minister. And guess what happened by Christmas, a week before Christmas? Paul Keating had become the Labor Prime Minister. I understand completely why Labor does not want to go back and hear about the horror story of your experience with Medicare co-payments. Plenty of horror stories under Labor. This brings to an end the first week of Labor's second budget. And what will be top of mind to many, many Australian families this weekend is just one word and the consequences of that one word. And that one word is inflation and the consequences of inflation being higher interest rates. When Jim Chalmers attended the National Press Club yesterday, he said he was supremely confident, supremely confident that the budget would not add to inflation. Well, they are very brave and courageous words by the Treasurer, no doubt. And we can't trust, trust the, pre, uh, the Treasurer's supreme confidence that the budget will not drive up inflation, because just a year ago, just a year ago, Anthony Albanese tried to tell Australians that life would be cheaper for them, life would be cheaper for them under Labor. Well, 12 months on, we know that is not true as this country struggles with the very, very real challenge of higher inflation rising interest rates. So we've heard a little bit of commentary earlier in question time today about the remarks of the Westpac chief economist, uh, Mr Bill Evans. And those remarks are important because Mr Evans is a trusted economist. Uh, Westpac is a significant banking institution uh, in our country. And I just want to remind people some observations that Mr Evans made and why they are important for the budget implications 
and the analysis of the budget that will continue over coming weeks and indeed when we come back for Senate estimates. Mr Evans said that do, does, Mr Evans said, do I believe that rate relief I thought would be that we would get, that Australian families would get in February could be delayed? Mr Evans says yes. Rate relief, falling interest rates that people are expecting to happen in February next year, Mr Evans is saying he thinks that is not going to happen or the chance of that happening is significantly reduced as a result of the budget. What else did Mr Evans say? He also said that the opportunity to cut rates as early as February starts to fade away. That's the one thing I'm worried about with regards to the budget, Bill Evans has said. He also said that $20 billion going into the economy into the space of, in the space of three years is what I would call big spending. <laughs> Mr Evans' comments. Not, not his only comments, but I think some very, very pertinent comments when we think about the challenge that has now arisen as a result of the budget that was delivered on Tuesday night. Now, the budget will not be measured today, tomorrow, two weeks' time, three weeks' time, but in a year's time, when Thank we you. are still in this Thank chamber— Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Green. Thank you, Deputy President. I'm very pleased to stand and take note of the answers provided today. Um, uh, and, it, and it does um, beg belief, really, that those opposite, um, in defence of, of um, their— well, their defence of their actions on Medicare over many years and a decade of delay, of ignoring the GP crisis, of, of standing up every day and supporting someone who, as Health Minister, did propose a co-payment, want to go back to a policy um, that Labor was, uh, was supposedly implementing when I was eight years old. I mean, it's two days after the budget and we're going back to 1991 to try to defend the position of the Liberals, which is to not support the things that we put forward. It's clear that they don't support these things. It's clear that they don't support a budget that's responsible, that's measured. It's clear that they don't support the measures in the budget to provide cost of living relief to everyday Australians. Those on this side have been working really hard to get those measures into the budget, to get that relief out to Australian families. And we couldn't be prouder of the work that's been done to make sure that we're taking care of vulnerable Australians, that we're making more opportunities for more Australians, and that we're building a strong future, a strong, resilient economy for our future. The budget strikes this balance between helping Australians through hard times right now and building for the longer term. We're delivering real cost of living relief and the biggest ever investment in bulk billing, the biggest ever incentive increase for bulk billing incentives. It is something that needed to be done and it's something that those opposite would never do because after 10 years of just drilling Medicare down to the ground, starving GPs of resources and getting us to a point where I am sure if they were still in government, we would have got to a point where uh, they would have um, got to the point where Medicare would have been completely privatised. That is their legacy. But in our budgets, we care about Medicare. We built it, we'll protect it, and we are strengthening it. That's what they're against. That's what we are for. We're lowering the cost of medicines on top of this. Another thing, it seems, from the questions today that those oppose. Funding the biggest pay rise for aged care workers. That's what's in this budget. That's what is in this budget, but those on the opposite say we shouldn't be doing. On top of all of this cost of living relief, something that's incredibly important is offering cost of living relief on electricity bills. That is something that was in the budget the other night. We're working with states and territories. And it was something that we had in our October budget because we're completely aware of how important this is for people. Those on the opposite, opposite side had the opportunity to support cost of living energy bill relief in the last, term, uh, last uh, year of um, the parliament, but refused to support it. We're creating opportunities for all Australians to share and making the services that we rely on stronger. Our plan will grow the economy, create new jobs, boost renewable energy, 
and invest in skills and training. Remember that, that problem you also ignored, the skills crisis that you did nothing about for 10 years that was already happening before the pandemic, was made worse by COVID and you had no plans other than paying um, uh, interns $5 an hour to wash cars and getting Scotty Cam to come out of the woodwork and be on a TV ad. That was your plan to fix the skills crisis. Well, we've put real money behind it in our budget because we know that we, uh, we need to get skilled workers into skilled jobs to make sure that Australians have those opportunities. This is a respons responsible budget. It's a practical budget, and it's one that works to clean up the mess of a wasted decade under the Liberal Nationals. And I'll give you one example of that neglect and decay. In Townsville, it's the home, proud home of the Australian Marine um, Science. Australian Marine Science. They're a fantastic organisation, and they do important work in our oceans, um, making sure that we've got the very best marine science in the world. They do incredible work on the Great Barrier Reef. Well, we are at a point where the defunding and underfunding of this incredibly important institution was going to lead to job losses under the previous government. Their equipment was out of date. They hadn't had a refurb of their um, uh, premises for years. There were jobs on the line. Well, in the budget um, last night, the other night, we added $163 million to the budget of the Australian Institute of Marine Science. $163 million to get them back just to where they needed to be. That's Thank what you, this Senator budget Green. does. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, I too rise to take note of the government's answers, and sadly again today we've seen the fact that this government has no understanding, no capacity to understand, approach, deal with the economic challenge of our time, the economic challenge of our time, which is inflation. Uh, we had the finance minister in question time uh, basically saying that, that uh, you know, citing an economist who said, oh, at least the least worst the budget is, is it's not going to be inflationary. I mean, that's not, a, that's not a passionate evidence that the government actually understands that they need to act to put downward pressure on inflation, not just, not just do nothing, not just take their hands off the wheel and say, oh, we'll leave that up to the Reserve Bank. They've shown no capacity to understand that inflation is the key economic challenge of our time. Now, so I started in this place yesterday to read out some quotes from senior economists in this country on the impact of this government's budget. And I'm going to continue that because I, I did not get through them all. And it's not like uh, Senator Gallagher says that uh, there's just one or two economists you know, out of a, a room of 100 who, who think this is an inflationary budget. Senior economists across a wide range of organisations have come out and said that this budget makes it harder for the Reserve Bank, not easier. The government has failed its first test. David Bassanese, chief economist at Better Share. Contrary to all the talk of a surprise budget surplus for 2022-23, the second Labor budget under Treasurer Jim Chalmers is unambiguously expansionary, with a boost to GDP growth equivalent to around 1.5 per cent over the next two years. This adds to the risk that the RBA will feel the need to raise interest rates at least once and possibly twice more in the coming months. Goldman Sachs, uh, Goldman Sachs Chief Economist Andrew Boak. At a time when the RBA is lifting rates to contain elevated inflation and accelerating labour costs, we assess the budget's near-term boost household incomes as having an incrementally hawkish read-through for monetary policy. Incrementally hawkish read-through for monetary policy. Yes, that's uh, economic language, but it means that interest rates are more likely to go up. USB economist George Tharanow. We also now think the RBA is unlikely to cut the cash rate this year. Specifically, we formally push back our expectation of the first RBA easing to February 24. 
it is a, a greater risk that inflation will go up and it is going to take longer for inflation to go down. Pinpoint macroeconomic analytics chief economist Michael Blythe. Unfortunately, proposed fiscal settings look a little confused. You're telling me. The policymakers cannot claim that fiscal measures are both stimulatory for households and non inflationary. Mr. Blythe said the government's decision to increase job seeker single parent payment and aged care wages had no inflation offset. Nobody will begrudge lifting payments to welfare recipients, but the hard hearted economists will point out the potential risk of boosting household spending power and adding to labour costs at time of elevated inflation. Yes, there are hard decisions that have to be made. There are hard decisions. Inflation is the key economic challenge of our time. EY Oceania Chief Economist Sherelle Murphy. The government plans to spend more than it saved in the short term. In normal times, the economy would easily absorb this stimulus, but inflation is already running at an annual rate of 7% and more than one in every $4 spent in the Australian economy is by state, territory, local or federal governments. This is an expansionary budget. It puts upward pressure on interest rates. It forces the Reserve Bank to consider con continuing to raise interest rates further and higher than they've already had to to contain the inflation that give this government continues to ignore. Senator Sheldon. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, interest rates, you know, isn't it interesting, just before I start, like, these are the people that are giving lectures about interest rates and inflation and how to deal with the cost of living. I mean, they're the ones that started this whole rise and with the commencement of interest rates going up into this economy. Now, they seem to forget that one of the big issues that we had was a failed energy strategy and policy, consistently 22 failed energy policies from those opposite that put the pressure on our cost of living in this country. And of course, if you look at the budget, you clearly see that the Treasury's assessment is that interest rates over the uh, inflationary pressures is clear in the budget papers because it says that the cost of living package is expected to directly reduce inflation by three quarters of a percentage point in 23-24. And of course, you also have to realise the importance of this budget, getting inflation right and support for our community. A $14.6 billion cost of living relief package has been critical to hard hit Australians to be supported. But what they're saying is nothing, because what they're actually saying is that we should turn around and do nothing. We shouldn't turn around and support hard-working Australians. We shouldn't support those people that are at such a disadvantage due to this increase of inflation that commenced under their watch. Now, let's just start looking at the building the capacity to deal with future shocks into the future. 87 per cent of revenue windfall over the budget and the last, compared to 40 per cent average over the last governments, that's the money that will be going into dealing with some of the issues that have pressure on our spending within our budget. We've prioritised and saved almost $40 billion, and that's returned 87 per cent. 87 per cent of a revenue windfall over the budget, over the last compared to the 40 per cent averaged by the last government. But these are significant figures because it actually puts us in a position to deal with future shocks in our economy. It's actually making sure that we have the capacity to deal with the future. Now, quite clearly, with, when we go to these questions about you know, what has an economist said, well, what they fail to leave out and what they fail to quote is ANZ Adelaide Timbrell, or Namura Andrew Tish, uh, Tishurst, or Alan Oster from National Australia Bank on Tuesday, or JP Morgan, Ben uh, Jarman, or ANZ Richard Yestin Stenger, which I might just quote him in particular, because all of those previous uh, economists have said that at, best, at worst this will be in neutral and many have supported the fact that this budget will have a positive effect on inflation. Now, the particular quote from ANZ is that $14.6 billion in household support is the largest package of spending. Yes, and in Australia's $2 trillion economy, this won't make the inflation challenge materially worse. That's what was said. 
And of course, to hear the, those opposite saying to quote Westpac, well, how about you quote everything that Westpac said and Mr Evans said? Because Ms Evans said this, I think these policies were necessary. Listen to that word, necessary. And I don't expect them to put upward pressure on interest rates in the near future. Now, these are some of the important aspects of what we've done in this budget. And of course, what they don't want to do is talk about cost of living because they haven't any plan for it. Because these are the same people that voted down having a strategy to put downward pressure on energy prices. These are the same people that have turned around and made sure that they wouldn't support secure jobs and better pay proposals so that people have the capacity to deal with cost of living. They're the ones that turned around and didn't want to have people uh, getting more secure jobs so they can bargain more fairly. These are the people that turned around and refused to support the appropriate fee-free TAFE and cheaper childcare, the expanded paid parental leave scheme, introducing the pedestic violence leave. All these strategies they have been consistently trying to undermine or have opposed in this place. And of course, the real question for those opposite will be the future reforms, because same jobs, same pay, minimum work standards for gig workers, an objective definition of casual employment and the pathway to permanent employment, and a criminal offence for deliberate wage theft. Let's see what they do, because that will show them up for what they think about cost of living. Because they are not about taking it on. They're not about giving people the opportunity to have a decent wage, a decent income, and they certainly haven't got a plan to deal with inflation. Senator Fawcett. Thanks, uh, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to take note of the answers, uh, in this case from Senator Gallagher, to the first supplementary question by Senator Smith, who pointed out um, that the Minister for Aged Care said, and I quote, that this is a budget that will put downward pressure on inflation uh, and highlighted that that was in contrast to the economists from countless banks and rating agencies who have called this budget expansionary. Um, Senator Gallagher gave a response and she mentioned, pleasingly, the concept of frameworks because it's really important if we're not just going to look at short-term perturbations but long-term impacts. We need to understand the consequences that the frameworks we have in place. And I notice when we come to the issue of cost of living, and I go here to the Cost of Living uh, Committee, which has been inquiring into that, and their interim report, that uh, one of their key findings is that energy prices have risen and are a major contributing factor to the cost of living crisis in all sectors of the economy. So what has that got to do with frameworks? Well, the government's rejection of the expert opinion of a number of economists in terms of inflation, uh, it's not the first time. They have form on that. I was flabbergasted to see Mr Bowen in the other place say in response to an answer or a question uh, in the House that every sensible economist would tell you that nuclear energy is the most expensive form of energy there is. I'm paraphrasing there, I haven't got his exact words, but that was the sense of his answer. Well, the OECD, who globally are probably the most reputed group of economists looking at economic cooperation and development around the world, uh, actually issued a report last year in April where they looked at the frameworks that countries put in place around their energy systems. And they actually highlight, and on page 35 of their report, which was a, a strategic briefing on meeting uh, emissions targets, uh, they look at the levelised cost of electricity across the OECD for various forms of energy generation, and they highlight that um, the lowest cost option for generating electricity is the long-term operation of nuclear power plants. And that's quoting work done by uh, themselves and the IEA, the International Energy Agency, in 2020. But as they highlight in their report, that's only part of the equation. When you look at the system's costs and you also look at the context in which we are seeking to reduce emissions by 2030 and getting to net zero by 2050. Uh, for anyone who's interested, I'd highly recommend looking at pages 37 and 38 of the report. 
because they highlight that as you constrain emissions and you take fossil-based fuels out of the system, and you must remember here in Australia, our national electricity market still uses nearly 70 per cent fossil fuels, that the costs will go up exponentially beyond about 2030. And to quote from them, they say the policy implications of these systems cost findings are significant. It may be possible to reduce emissions to meet 2030 targets by growing the share of variable renewables in the mix. However, the costs of reaching net zero with high shares of variable renewables are likely prohibitive. And they go on to make a conclusion, which is backed up by the IPCC and the IEA, that the only way we can still have reliable, affordable power and reach net zero is to embrace a form of base load power, which is either hydro, if you have the suitable conditions, or nuclear power, which is why so many countries, such as the US, are looking to double their amount of nuclear power. And to the issue of expense, not only did they find that long-term cost of electricity shows that it's cheaper, but from a grid scale, as we seek to reduce emissions, the framework says it will be cheaper. And if we look at the lived experience of nations like Germany, high levels of variable renewables, the most expensive power in the OECD by a country mile, versus Canada, which has the lowest penetration of variable renewables, hydro, but also 19 nuclear reactors, they have the lowest energy price in the OECD. And Ontario, the province which has those reactors in it, and the majority of their power comes from those reactors, is amongst the cheapest provinces in Canada. So frameworks matter, and the framework of this government will just drive up prices further. I put the question to the motion moved by Senator Dean Smith. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Pocock. I also rise to take note of Senator Gallagher's response to my questions about PwC. I'm going to start by clearly laying out some of the facts of this outrageous case of institutional corruption and cover-up. Every parliamentarian, indeed every Australian, must be horrified by this chapter. And I know that many are because they're contacting our office in outrage. First, the facts. On 16 November 2022, the Tax Practitioners Board published their findings that former PwC partner Peter Collins breached three confidentiality agreements by leaking government tax policy to staff and partners at PwC to monetise that information by assisting private clients to sidestep the new multinational tax avoidance laws. Peter Collins was deregistered for two years as a tax agent, and PwC was required to roll out confidentiality training. Confidentiality training. I ask you. It's outrageous. It's so inadequate. At estimates in February, the ATO estimated that up to $180 million in annual tax revenue would have been at risk from Mr Collins' breach. The same estimates, Taxation Practitioners Board Secretary Michael O'Neill said that 20 to 30 PwC staff were implicated in the leak. PwC CEO at the time, Tom Seymour, contradicted O'Neill's evidence, claiming the board had made, quote, no findings to support the statement that 30 staff had access to this information and that claims about the breach, uh, that claims about the breach were a perception issue in PwC uh, Tom Seymour's view. Shocked by the revelations unfolding in relation to PwC and the huge increase in spend on consultants in the public sector over the last decade, we're talking billions of dollars. In early March, I initiated a Senate inquiry to investigate government use of consultants with a focus on management of unethical behaviour, conflicts of interest and breaches of contract. That committee is working hard. It will go hard, and taxpayers want us to. Since then, more evidence has emerged in relation to PwC. On 2 May, 144 pages of redacted emails were released involving 53 PwC email addresses related to the leaking of information. They make an extraordinary read. It's clear that Tom Seymour had significantly downplayed the, the extent of the breach. And this wasn't a perception issue or the case of one bad egg, but systemic institutional corruption and very, very poor internal culture and leadership. 
Days after the emails were published, Tom Seymour admitted he had received emails relating to the leak and stepped down as CEO. And last night, two other senior executives followed him, though it's important to note that all three still remain at PwC. The emails also revealed that PwC collected $2.5 million in fees as it did this um, extraordinary act. It's an, an astounding case of corruption in a company that employs 10,000 Australians and whose website front page says, and I quote, our purpose is to build trust in society. Unbelievable. So what are, uh, these are the facts. Um, what's the facts of the government's response so far? Well, I encourage you to keep your expectations very, very low. And this will be short. I wrote to the finance minister in March um, asking her uh, to remove PwC from the Management Advisory Services Panel, which gives PwC access to government contracts, because they have clearly failed to meet the panel requirements. The minister's department confirmed that estimates the Department of Finance can terminate uh, a consultant off the panel. And to be clear, it is absolutely in the minister's uh, Minister of Finance's remit to do so. She has not done this. She has not banned them and instead has sought assurances that this won't happen again. Completely inadequate. So there's four things the government needs to do immediately. First of all, stop cozying up to the large consulting firms, taking their money and political donations and keeping them safe when they do things that are totally inadequate. Secondly, cease and ban all contracts with PwC. And thirdly, initiate civil proceedings against PwC to recover a huge loss of government revenue and ensure that the, a the Australian Federal Police investigate this matter under the Crimes Act. And finally, will you work, will the government work with this parliament? We are all appalled across the political spectrum and support the Greens' call today to refer this matter to the National Anti-Corruption Commission. That's where it belongs. We need to to run down this uh, corruption and look more broadly beyond the bad apple to the systemic nature of the consulting industry and what it's getting wrong. Thank you. I put the question. Those, those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. It is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on 16 March 2023 of Ronald Ch Charles Elstob, a senator for the state of South Australia from 1978 to 1987. I call the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of Ronald Elstob. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. I move that the Senate records its sorrow at the death on 16 March 2023 of Mr Ronald Charles Elstob, former Senator for South Australia, and places on record its gratitude of his service to the Parliament. Uh, and the nation and tenders its sympathy to his family in their bereavement. I rise on behalf of the government to express our condolences following the passing of former Australian Labor Party Senator for my home state of South Australia, Ronald Charles Elstob, at the age of 98. And I convey at the outset uh, the Albanese Labor government's condolences to his family and his friends, and I especially extend our sympathies to his partner Faye, daughters Wendy and Christine, three grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. I'm grateful to Wendy for sharing memories of her father prior to this motion being moved so that it, we could incorporate these into my remarks and the recollections of the very political family environment in which she grew up. I understand Wendy and Christine are listening to us as we remember their father today. I also know they are very rightly very proud of their father and his place in this Senate and in Australian politics. Politics was central to the life of Ron Elstob. It consumed him and in turn he involved everyone around him, regardless of whether they shared his ideological position. Ron Elstob was Labor through and through. Shaped by experiences of poverty, employment insecurity and war, both learned and personal, he became South Australian, South Australian by choice through marriage. He embraced politics on the waterfront and in the suburbs. After active involvement in the trade union movement and as a local party organiser, he was convinced to run for the Senate. And he embraced the role and the opportunity to advance policy, policies to the benefits of veterans and in the area of social welfare. But I start first with his early life. 
Ron Elstob was born in Toowoomba in Queensland in 1924 and his early years were spent on his family's farming property. Handling cattle and other stock, he later said the experience was that of a child doing a man's job. The effects of the Depression in the 1930s became one of the formational experiences of his early life. In his early teenage years, his family moved to Sydney and became part managers of the Marlborough Hotel in Newtown, an establishment that still exists in the electorate of the member for Sydney. This exposed him to a completely different environment from that of his childhood. As he helped in the business after school, as he was expected to do, he heard patrons talk about their experiences at work and too often out of work. Getting to understand about the lives of these men and women galvanised a determination to fight for social justice, a passion that would remain for the rest of his life. He gave expression to this resolve by joining the Australian Labor Party and soon found himself supporting the member for East Sydney, the irre irrepressible Eddie Ward. The outbreak of World War II also had a profound impact on his life and became a bitter memory. Too young to enlist in the regular army in 1942, he instead joined the US Army Small Ships Section. Uh, a year into his service, Ron Elstob was aboard a ship struck by a Japanese fighter and he was subsequently deployed as a coast watcher. It was an unenviable task as he and his four comrades faced constant jeopardy, taking drastic and violent actions to stay alive. Only two of the group remained when his mission concluded. He lost an eye and was shot in the ankle. Years later, as a senator, he convinced the Minister for Veterans Affairs, another South Australian, Tony Messner, to extend the service pension to merchant seafarers. This was a particular source of personal pride for him. Following the war, Ron Elster took up work selling industrial equipment, including forklifts and cranes across the country. On a trip to Adelaide, he met Angela, who became his wife and Adelaide his home. And they were married until Angela's passing in 2008. He found work on the waterfront as a crane driver and he joined the Waterside Workers' Federation, a forerunner of the famous MUA, the Maritime Union of Australia. He witnessed appalling accidents in the workplace, which resulted in injury or even death, and the distress this caused him he channelled into advocacy for improvements to health and safety. Alongside his union involvement and with Angela, he became a key organiser in the Hindmarsh Federal Electric Council, where he became close to power broker and Whitlam Government Minister Clyde Cameron. And he, he helped Clyde Cameron maintain his grip on the party in South Australia with his well-regarded organisational skills. He used these to advance the cause of labour within the state. Most notably to achieve the election of Don Dunstan as Premier against several, several <coughs> severely malapportioned electoral boundaries. It was Don Dunstan who would ultimately convince Ron Elstob to stand for pre-selection. And in 1977, the year I arrived in this country, he was elected to the Senate for the first time from second place on the Australian Labor Party ticket. He would be re-elected in 1983, this time from first place. He made Senate contributions on a wide range of issues, but two subjects in which he took a particular interest were defence procurement and social welfare. And the former was a vital part of his role as a seven-year member of the Joint Committee of Foreign Affairs Defence and Defence. It complemented his previous advocacy for a strong Australian shipbuilding industry as necessary for national defence, something this government and this Prime Minister advocates and has taken forward today. He was also a member of the Senate Standing Committee on Social Warfare for the majority of his parliamentary service and the majority of its existence, including as chair from 83 to 87. This committee conducted landmark inquiries into drug and alcohol issues and the administration of government social services program. It also inquired into social matters, including a national superannuation scheme, children and institutional care, homeless youth and income support for the retired and aged. Looking at that list, it was a committee ahead of its time. This work gave a voice to some of society's most vulnerable and sought to find policy students, po policy solutions that might enable such people to lead better lives. Ron Elstob, Elstob was ineligible to seek re-election at the 1987 
some simultaneous dissolution. As a result of the age limit, the South Australian branch of the Australian Labor Party placed on candidates at that time. During retirement, he lived on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Uh, he always maintained his optimism and lived by his mantra. Every day is a good day. Some days are just better than others. We can be grateful for the service of Ron Elstob in this Senate. He represents a generation that gave so much to this country, a generation that knew the Depression and a generation that served uh, in World War II. So once again, on behalf of his family, I express condolences following his passing to his friends and family, especially to Faye, Wendy and Christine, his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Deputy President. Deputy President, I rise to associate the opposition with the remarks of Senator Wong in relation to the motion marking and honouring the life of Ronald Charles Elstob. On 29 November 1924, in Toowoomba, Ron Elstob was born, a son to Charles and Anne. With his two sisters, Ron attended Toowoomba East State School before the family moved to Sydney when Ron was 14. As Senator Wong indicated, Ron's parents became part managers of the Marlborough Hotel in Newton. And after completing his education, Ron helped behind the bar and in the cellar. This was where he gained his education in many ways, and also at this time where Ron joined the East Sydney branch of the Labor Party. In 1942, Ron joined the United States Army Small Ships Section. He had been too young to join the Australian Imperial Force at the outbreak of the war. The US Army Small Ships Section instead provided a collection of trawlers, sailing craft and freight vessels crewed by men and boys considered too young or too old for the regular forces. In shallow vessels, they are able to land on small beaches carrying ammunition and supplies, in this case for the New Guinea campaign. It was tough and dangerous work, carried out in the cover of darkness and often in rough weather. Ron and his company continued this work for a year before their ship was sunk by a Japanese Zero fighter. They were then dropped onto, uninhabited islands, onto an uninhabited island to be coast watchers reporting on the movements of enemy aircraft by radio. Sadly, though, Ron was one of only two of his company to survive. He himself, as Senator Wan acknowledged, was shot in the ankle and lost an eye during the war. Recounting his wartime experiences, Ron made clear he believed the Allies knew of Japanese movements long before the war ended. He believed many more lives could have been saved. He had strong views in this regard. His reactions, his approach, is a reminder of the different emotions and reactions that many returning service people have to the traumas and challenges of war. Ron, like some, chose never to join his local RSL or march in Anzac Day parades, but, as Senator Wong acknowledged, he worked hard in different ways to uphold the rights of those who had served in all forms, including those serving in a non-military capacity. Post-war, Ron worked selling industrial equipment, travelling much of Australia. It was through this, in 1949, he settled in Allenby Gardens in Adelaide, having met and married South Australian Angela Smirlak after first meeting her during one of his work trips. Ron found work as a crane driver and joined the Waterside Workers' Federation and the Port Adelaide Labor branch, later joining the sub-branch in Hindmarsh, as Senator Wong has touched on. Ron Elstob believed he left his run for politics too late, but I understand it was South Australian Premier Don Dunstan that helped to convince Ron to run for the Senate, and in 1977 he was elected. Ron served with great enthusiasm as a senator. His interests spanned across industry, transport, social welfare, defence procurement and foreign affairs. As well as making time for his constituents, Ron also acknowledged he had a vital interest in his committee work. Notably, Ron was a member of the Foreign Affairs and Defence Committee for nearly seven years, sat on the Publications Committee for eight years, four as chair, and also eight years on the Social Welfare Committee, again of which he was chair for four years. In Ron's early years to the Parliament, he had a quick but perhaps unwelcome claim to fame. As the National Times described it in 1984, he made, quote, a notable oratorical flourish 
that the Parliament House Tucker was, quote, fit to kill a brown dog. Ron probably wouldn't have predicted that such remarks would result in the then Parliament House chef in the old building announcing his resignation and the building's catering staff staging a 24-hour strike. <laughs> However, reports suggest, indeed different times, Senator Wong, reports suggest the matter was perhaps settled in good humour with Ron giving an apology in the Senate and the Parliament House chef constructing a metre-high sculpture made entirely of butter and margarine in his honour. Ron's committee work saw, though, in more serious ways, Ron's committee work, much more serious, saw him navigate inquiries into income support for the retired and elderly, as well as into institutional care for children and youth. His time as chair of the Publications Committee also led him to oversee the production of the fourth edition of the Commonwealth Style Manual, which I gather was jokingly referred to as an eagerly awaited tome. He did the hard yards in many different ways that are necessary for the operation of this place, and effectively so. But Ron also took strong and principled approaches. In 1986, Ron was one of three Labor members of the Foreign Affairs and Defence Committee to call for the then Hawke government to take a stronger stance in response to sanctions imposed by Indonesia against Australia at the time as a result of Australian media reports on President Suharto. Ron's stance was informed in part by a delegation Ron took with the committee to Papua New Guinea where he saw firsthand refugee camps of people fleeing Indonesia. He was in agreement with those recommending Australia take some of those refugees. A double dissolution election was called in 1987 and as Senator Wong said, due to the South Australian Labor Party's then age rule, Ron did not recontest after serving for nearly nine years in the Senate. At the age of 63, Ron retired to Mountain Creek in Queensland, but continued to be an active member of the Labor Party. Reflecting on his time in Parliament and his engagement in the Labor Party and politics more broadly, Ron was quoted as saying, if you can't count numbers in politics, don't go into it. It doesn't matter whether you've got the best idea in the world unless you can count on the numbers to support that. You've got to be able to count and count accurately. In this, as in life, Ron Elstob showed pragmatism and practicality that have appears to have been a hallmark of his life and contributions in politics, in Parliament, in the Labor Party and more broadly. We acknowledge and thank Ronald Charles Elstob for his service to our Parliament and we pay respects and send condolences to his family and loved ones. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is carried. We now come to tabling and consideration of committee reports. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Deputy President. On behalf of the Chair of the Economics Legislation Committee, Senator Walsh, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into the National Energy Transition Authority Bill 2022. On behalf of the Standing Committee on Appropriation, Staffing and Security, I present the 66th report of the committee concerning the estimates for the Department of the Senate 2023-24. And on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, I present the report of the committee on its review of the Counterterrorism Temporary Exclusion Orders Act 2019. Thank you. I note no Senator wish may, wishes to make a contribution. We now come to consideration of documents. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of documents which are listed on pages 5 to 7 on the notice paper. Any document to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Do the government whips wish to make a advise me of those matters that they wish to address? Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy. Thank you, Mr yeah. Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of uh, documents one to six on page five, 
and also document 9 and 12 to 18 on page 6 and also document number 19 on page 7. seven. Seek leave to continue my remarks. Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you. And if I can uh, take note of document f uh, 7 on page 5 and continue my remarks. Does any other senator wish to speak on any of the documents? We will then move forward to further consideration of reports and responses and government responses and Auditor General's reports, which are listed on pages 7 to 9 of the notice paper. Any report or response to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged on the, from the notice paper. Uh, senator Scar. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of documents 1 to 10 on page 7. Uh, 11 to 22 on page 8 and document number 23 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Well, given that's the whole lot, I, um, I, won't, I won't see if any other senator wishes a, a contribution. Are there any ministerial statements? Senator Long, I understand there may be a ministerial statement. Senator Wong. Do you want me to go back there? <laughs> I take all documents relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the South East Trawl Fishery. The President has received letters requesting change. Sorry, my apologies, I thought Senator Scar was remonstrating. The President has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Minister. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the documented document available in the chamber and as listed on the dynamic red. I intend to put the question. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2023 for concurrence. Minister. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. I put the question. Those with the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Act 2016 and for related purposes. Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 13 June 2023. Senator Scar. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Ring the bells until quorum.
I'll, I'll have to call the clerk. clerk. General business debate. Notice of motion number 232, standing in the name of Senator Bragg, in relation to budget 2023-24. Senator Bragg. Uh, I move the motion. Actually, I think I said the wrong thing. I need to say something else. That's right. That's it. I was just waiting to hear your dulcet tones. I'm ready to go. Okay, good. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to make some remarks, uh, Deputy President, about the, uh, the Labor Party's recent budget from just a couple of days ago, because it is very important that this chamber is able to have a debate about the nature of budget management, fiscal management in Australia, the way that we tax, the way that we spend, because this goes to one of the central components of how we are governed as a people. And the core point to make this afternoon is that fundamentally this is a budget which is based on increased expenditure, which will have two particular consequences. One, it has already and will result in higher taxation and it, it will continue to fuel inflation. Those are the two direct consequences of the government's latest budget. Now, in relation to new taxation, and of course uh, much is made of the promises that politicians make before elections and before the last general elections, the now government made many statements about promising never to increase taxation. Of course, uh, there was much uh, laughter uh, in many quarters when these statements were made because no one believed uh, that the government, and now government, then opposition, would be able to help itself, that it would be able to maintain a lower level of taxation. Because ultimately, when you have an addiction to spending and you can't seem to say no, then necessarily you will have to look to raise taxes. And since the election, there have been a couple of new taxes that have emerged, and you can read them in the October budget from last year, in Budget Paper 2, or you can look at them in Budget Paper 2 from this May's budget. Now, the first tax which was uh, leaked out and briefed out in the course of the budget's preparation was this new tax on superannuation. Very interesting taxation policy for the Labor Party, of course, not taken to the election and a breach of a promise, but, but quite curious for a few reasons. The first of, of which is that by putting in place a new tax on balances over $3 million and not indexing that, which means that over half a million people will be captured. And the people that are most heavily impacted by this new taxation measure will be younger Australians because of the failure to index. Um, perhaps one of the most curious implications of this will be that superannuation will not be the preferred savings vehicle for many people um, in the future, uh, because it is so uncertain. And when you are asking people to put money away for 20 or 30 years or maybe longer, um, people will want confidence that the settings are going to be reasonable and won't be set aside by a future government. Um, so for a party that is obsessed with talking about how fantastic superannuation is, it's a very curious initiative because I think it will shake the confidence that many Australians have uh, in the scheme, because this new taxation measure, which is going to hit over half a million people, uh, is a unfair tax for younger people. But it also introduces this very no novel concept, novel concept I should say, of unrealised gains. And everyone from the Farmers Federation through to the uh, inner city asset management groups uh, have had major have issued major reservations about this idea of the introduction <laughs> of taxing uh, in unrealised gains because of course the whole principle of the tax system is that you only pay tax 
on something uh, when you sell it uh, or where you earn it or there is a particular moment where something happens which triggers the taxation. Uh, the GST is levied on transactions. Uh, when you sell an asset, you pay capital gains tax. Um, these are natural points which occur, but an unrealised gain, uh, very hard to define uh, from an accounting and legal perspective. And as I say, uh, the farmers feel that they will be unfairly targeted. And the head of the Farmers' Federation has said the Treasurer doesn't care, quote unquote. Uh, another person who's been involved with some of these debates, uh, Jeff Wilson from Wilson Asset Management, has said taxing unrealised gains uh, is like a gain on your house when you still own it. Uh, so I think this is going to be a major, a major problem for the government when it seeks to legislate this particular tax policy. But it is ultimately uh, another attack on self-managed super funds. Uh, the Labor Party have never liked self-managed super funds because, of course, their savings vehicle of choice are the funds which are controlled by their, their friends and their great benefactors at the union movement. Uh, so perhaps uh, on one level it is true that it is a curious thing for a Labor Party to do to try and damage the long-term confidence people have in this system. Uh, but perhaps it does suit the short-term tribal uh, initiative, uh, which is evident in all the policies of this government, uh, which I am uh, regularly referring to as the government for vested interests, that of course uh, they would like to uh, damage the self-managed super funds because uh, these are funds which are run by individuals, not by the, uh, the major union and bank funds. Uh, so that is, the, that is the first consequence, uh, that you have a tax like this, uh, which was briefed out before the budget, but it appears uh, now in Budget Paper 2. Of course, the second uh, taxation change, which appeared in the last budget in October, uh, was the changes to franking. Now, the franking changes, which the, the, the now government uh, canvassed widely in 2019, uh, again, very curious, because, of course, it was the La Labor Party which introduced imputation, and it was an idea that had been around for some time that it was a bad thing that people were going to be taxed twice. And so they introduced this measure to avoid double taxation. Now, uh, unfortunately, uh, on this occasion, the two measures that the government proposed in the last October's budget to change imputation uh, are going to result in a new tax effectively because it will uh, remove the ability of people to receive frank dividends and avoid double tax taxation. But it is a clever, perhaps clever measure uh, that after you've, you've, you have taken a policy to an election which has which was designed to remove the ability of people to receive, to receive, I should say, frank dividends. Uh, this policy, which of course, again, another breach of an election commitment, uh, aims to switch off the frank dividends from the, from the companies themselves. And it, it will do this principally, we now have legislation, which is before the Economics Committee, uh, uh, which will remove the ability of a company to pay a frank dividend when it is raising capital. Now, that is a, there is a very broad test in this bill which basically says, well, unless you have an established practice of paying dividends, then you can't, uh, you can't pay a dividend in any period. Now, um, companies, by definition, actually need to raise capital. That's actually how companies work. They raise capital, that becomes the company's equity, and that can be used for running the actual operation. <laughs> so. Um, having a very uh, difficult to manage and navigate test uh, in the law will mean that companies will be less likely to raise equity capital, they will be more likely to raise debt in order to fund their operations, or well, they may, may in fact look to go offshore. Uh, and so um, ultimately um, this particular measure, which is designed to improve the budget balance by 
$10 million per annum um, could actually result in a significant loss of revenue because uh, companies will be less likely or less able to pay company income tax uh, because, of course, their profits will be lower. Um, and uh, that, of course, will then that mean that there's a lower level of frank dividends that are available for shareholders and the owners of the companies. It was curious to hear the Treasury Department come and give evidence on this bill, uh, and the Treasury Department made it very clear that there was no activity in Australia's capital markets today that was giving rise to a need to regulate or impose a test as has been proposed in this legislation. And the test again is that if you have raised equity capital, you cannot pay a frank dividend. It is a very, very ugly test, I would say. And uh, Treasury have given evidence that there's no activity in today's capital markets that would require that sort of intervention. Uh, Treasury, uh, I think, uh, are also quite concerned, perhaps uh, over the long term, have been concerned over the long term about imputation. I'm not sure whether they actually think that imputation is a good idea. So this may have been an idea that was pushed through into the first government's budget. Uh, we know now it was based on modelling or data from 2016. And as a result of the motion yesterday, uh, we should now be able to see the, the assumptions and the methodology which underpins that particular tax measure. And then the last tax measure I'll refer to briefly is, of course, the new tax on gaspers and cigarettes. Um, you know, again, uh, new taxes required uh, across the board as we chart up to a projected 26.4 per cent of GDP in the medium term, so quite a high tax to GDP ratio. So everything from complicated measures on uh, imputation through to uh, new taxes on super, but also uh, new taxes on cigarettes. So um, that is the net result of the government's uh, expansionary fiscal policy, that you need to have more taxes. But of course, on the spending side of the budget, we're looking at an additional $185 billion of expenditure since the election, $44 billion of new money in this budget. So what we're looking at is an expansionary fiscal policy at a time when the central bank is trying to pull back on monetary policy, and that means that you've got that the arms and legs are not working in sync. You've got the Reserve Bank trying to rein in inflation by using interest rate policy. They're, they're raising interest rates and the government is fuelling inflation uh, by uh, the budget uh, massively expanding expenditure. So that, that is ultimately the decision that the government has made. Uh, they have put in the budget papers that they think that they can cut inflation by 50 per cent over the next 12 months. I think that is an ambitious and obviously you know, laudable objective, but I think it is a great test now for the government. Um, can they get inflation down to 3.25 per cent? It's going to be very difficult when you're running an expansionary fiscal policy, and I would have thought it would have been in everyone's interest if they were able to take some difficult decisions now and to uh, look to consolidate their position. Uh, and look to re remove stimulus from the economy, because ultimately, unless we can rein in inflation, uh, we're going to have a major problem for particularly lower income Australians. So, I mean, ultimately, governments will decide how they want to tax and how they want to spend. Uh, this government has made a very clear judgment that it will be increasing taxation through a range of these measures. I've pointed out how some of these are going to be problematic. Uh, but that is a threshold they've crossed. They want to have high taxes, and that will be their record. Uh, they've also decided that they would, would work, frankly, against the central bank. The government has decided that it wants to work against the Reserve Bank. It wants to send its backbenchers out to whinge about Philip Lowe and say what a terrible person Philip Lowe is. Well, Philip, well, Philip Lowe is doing his job, whereas Jim Chalmers refuses to do his job, and he refuses to fight inflation. So that is the reality of the situation. Uh, the Australian people will not be passing judgment on Philip Lowe. They will be passing judgment on Jim Chalmers and Mr Albanese. And they will be looking at whether or not that three and a quarter per cent inflation figure is going to be achieved. And that is in the budget papers, we will look to hold the government to account to ensure that that is achieved 
uh, as much as is possible, because we don't set the government's budgets, uh, but we do, of course, uh, hold the government through uh, to account through these processes of the Senate. So that is the position that I would like to leave you with right now, and I'll pass on to the next speaker. Thank you, uh, Senator Bragg. I call uh, Senator. Sorry, I wanted to just say your first name, Senator Grogan. <laughs> Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, what we've got in front of us is a motion that starts off with the line that the Labor government has delivered a budget that doesn't have a plan to tackle inflation. Well, we do have a plan to tackle inflation, a fully articulated one. Pages and pages of descriptions in the budget papers it's all there to read. We've had various members um, in the lower house, in the Senate, stand up and talk about the kind of things that we're doing, the exact detail of what we're doing. The fact that you don't like it doesn't mean it's not there. There's a serious issue there with some of the scaremongering and spin and hoo-ha that goes on. There really is a lot of detail in those budget papers. It goes through quite clearly exactly what it is we're intending to do and exactly what it is that we're doing to curb inflation. Yesterday I stood up here and I spoke about the positive side, the upside, the relief side, the kind of things that we're doing to help Australians across this country deal with what is a serious cost of living challenge. We've seen it coming, in getting worse. It wasn't invented, as some would say, round here on the 21st of May last year when Labor was elected. You cannot end up in the kind of situation we're in now in that space of time. The housing crisis that we see is significantly about stock, housing stock, supply. Where is the housing? Well, we've seen 10 years of the coalition government doing very little, seeing these challenges coming down the road and choosing to do nothing about it, actively choosing to do nothing. And we are now in a situation where the Housing Australia Future Fund, which is $10 billion, $10 billion for housing. And again, we've heard time and time again this morning, this afternoon, that there's no detail. Well, there's a very lengthy explanatory memorandum. There is an awful lot of information an awful lot of detail. And again, just because you don't like it doesn't mean it isn't there. So take the time, read the EM, and then maybe think about what $10 billion worth of investment would do for the people in this country who are struggling to find somewhere to live. And I've spoken about this in this place before. But I, my story, where my experience, lived experience, of being in abject crisis, when I was pregnant, three months pregnant, the doctors told me and my partner that our child was likely to be born with a disability. Now, that was alarming. My partner then decided that he couldn't handle that and left. I then became unwell and the doctor told me that I had to give up my job or I would not be able to keep my baby. I chose to keep my baby, lose the partner and it was really hard. It was really, really hard. But what got me through those times 
were exactly the things we're talking about. You know, the sole parent pension was my lifeline. And my Medicare card was my saviour. Having access to those payments when in the space of three short months I'd gone from being very happy, very comfortable, happy, rosy future, in three short months I had nowhere to live. I was sleeping under the kitchen bench at a friend's house. So I get pretty wound up when I listen to some of the rubbish that has been spoken about in here in this last week. $10 billion investment in housing will help people like me at that point in time of their life. Affordable housing, social housing, support for women fleeing domestic violence. We have to do something about the situation we are in. Now, you may not like it. If you were in government, if the Libs were in government, Nats in government, Greens in government, sure, I'm sure you'd do something else. But you're not. Right? And this is our plan. This is our plan that we took to the Australian people. And the majority of them said, yes, that looks like a good plan. We'll take that. And here we are now in this chamber with no, no action happening. Everyone filibustering, everyone trying to avoid a debate, anything but bring on this bill. And I don't know, is that because you're all afraid that if you vote it down, the Australian people will actually be a bit pissed? We need Senator, to do Senator something. Grogan, I'm um, terribly sorry. I, I just I withdraw. To, you know, we, we all but, hear in the importance of the personal story that you're bringing to the Senate, um, and it can be very mighty speaking in that way. I just ask that you respect the, the dignity of the chamber. My apologies. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grogan. So, I go back to how we got here. And in part, it's 10 years, 10 years of neglect in our energy system, 10 years of denying any form of energy transition, hiding under a rock as far away from the rest of the world as we can get. Nothing on housing. We have to change. Something has to change. That's why, that's why the country voted you out. Okay? So it's time to just move on. We have to take action. We have to do something meaningful. We actually have to change what we're doing, how we're doing it, to respond to the situation we find ourselves in. The war in Ukraine that hideous war in Ukraine has driven a tsunami across our supply chain. It has meant enormous increases in the price of goods. It has impacted energy prices, food prices, you name it. We've seen so many challenges and they've all come home to roost and we have to do something. And the Albanese Labor government has set forward a budget, a sensible, responsible, balanced budget that brings down the amount of interest we're paying on the hideous debt that we were left. That helps us over the long term. And I think this is one of the issues that we're not really seeing come through here. The, the things that we have done in this budget, the structural changes that we have made in this budget, will make a fundamental difference to the ability of this country to respond to the situation we're in, to lower our debt, to lower our interest payments, to lower inflation, to lift the people in this country who need assistance. 
we have significant ideological differences. And I think it's time to acknowledge that and accept that and realise that us doing something you don't like is okay. Ideologically, the coalition are very much about the survival of the fittest, the primacy of the wealthy, and the free market. And that's fine. You have that view, but we have a slightly different view, right? I may well have read it on your membership application form. I'm just going to call the senators to order. Um, if you want to have a chat outside, please go ahead. But conversation across the chamber is disorderly. Senator Grogan, you have the call. Please continue. So, we do believe that the government should step in with targeted strategic relief for those who need it. We do want to make sure that we reduce the waste within the budget, that we look into every single crack and crevice to see where we can make sure that every single dollar of government spend is absolutely the right thing to do, that it is totally defensible, integrity is critical, and that is what we're doing. And we haven't, have, we, have we got to a point of saying, yeah, look, everything's fixed? No, not at all. There is a long way to go. But the budget that Senator Bragg and this motion is, um, is about takes a significant step on that road to recovery to make a difference to those people who desperately need it, to make our economy stronger for the whole of the country, to impact every single Australian, to have a stronger, more sustainable economy. And that's exactly what we've done. And I think, bearing in mind the differences we have, sometimes our way of doing it is because we're in government and your way of doing it is when you're in government. And I'd just like to say that Labor is in government now. This is our plan. This is our plan that we took to the election and this is what the majority of the country voted for. And I'm going to go back to the inflation piece just briefly because I, I saw an interesting article this morning um, from someone who you wouldn't say was, I don't know, a close ally of the Labor Party or of the Labor government. And that's Terry McCran. Um, and in this morning's article, he said, the budget is not going to increase inflation and force the Reserve Bank to whack us with more interest rate hikes. He then went on to say, yeah, the RBA is likely to hike rates, but any such rate hike will have nothing, and I mean nothing, nada, zip, to do with the budget. He then goes on to um, say a whole range of other entertaining things. Um, but the point here is, I think what I'm trying to get at, we have a different ideological perspective. And we need to just accept that. And listening to the spin and the scaremongering and the bother is really frustrating. It's okay to just say, well, we kind of disagree with the approach you're taking, but we get that this is an important thing that needs to get done. And while we're about it, I've just referenced um, friends over here in the Greens party, because 10 billion isn't enough in your world, 10 billion is enough for right now. If that isn't enough, if the crisis increases, if we find that that's not enough, we can do something else. But right now, right here, right now, we have to do something about 
the housing crisis. And the best thing to do right here, right now, is to pass the bill. Because we are just, the longer we drag this out, the more filibustering there is, the longer people have to wait. Because you don't build a house overnight. It takes a while. So I would just plead with the people in this chamber to realise, to look deeper than the spin and the bother. What we are doing here with this budget is sensible, is responsible and is taking that first strategic and significant step to protect this country, to build the housing we need, to support the people who need it and to strengthen and build our economy. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And at the outset, uh, can I sincerely say uh, that uh, it was uh, uh, quite generous of spirit for Senator Grogan to share her own personal story uh, with this chamber, and I, I deeply respect that. Uh, and uh, I, I'm sure all my other fellow senators would deeply respect that fact as well. Um, Having said that, um, I have pulled out Terry McCrean's uh, article, and uh, and and well, well, sorry, Senator, yeah, Senator Grogan quoted from Terry McCrean. So, um, what can I do but go to uh, the Oracle and uh, and see what other words he he gave in this uh, in this article? Because uh, he did, in fact, I did check the the quotes which Senator Grogan attributed to him, and I did find them there. Uh, so I acknowledge that. Um, but he also said, he also said, the biggest danger, the biggest risk to our future, setting aside the really big one, the climate cult lunacy, was a wages breakout chasing higher inflation. A wages breakout chasing higher inflation. So, uh, as he said, it is no small thing if these Dr Jim handouts can mute some of the wage pressure by directly reducing the published inflation rate. And I acknowledge that. Um, albeit only starting with the September quarter numbers published at the end of October. That's, pretty, that's actually pretty too profoundly important. Uh, these inflation numbers will immediately determine what the RBA does with rates in its November meeting on Cup Day. So I think, uh, I think we would do well, we would do well to heed the whole of the message, the whole of the message in Terry McCrane's uh, article when he does talk the, about the risk of a wages blowout and that feeding into an inflation cycle where the dog is literally chasing its tail. So I think that is a point that uh, Terry McCrane made very well. I also accept Senator Grogan's proposition that there is a philosophical difference. There is a philosophical difference between those sitting on that side of the chamber and those sitting on this side of the chamber. Uh, I wouldn't put it in the terms that Senator Grogan put it. I think uh, we are both parties of government. Uh, those on the other side of the chamber, despite the Greens' protestations that they're a centre-right party. I don't see you as a centre-right party, I must say. Um, I see you as a centre-left party, a social democratic party, uh, a party with a long tradition uh, of activism and philosophy along those lines, and I see my own party as that being a centre-right party. And The key philosophical difference from my perspective is the role of government in our society and the uh, freedom uh, as we would say, of individuals to pursue their own dreams, their own aspirations, uh, with the minimum of government intervention, thereby creating wealth and prosperity, which thereby provides for all Australians, everyone in Australia. So by giving an opportunity to everyone in our community to pursue their aspirations and dreams, we thereby create, we thereby create wealth and prosperity, which enables us, which enables us to do some of the laudable things which have been done in this last budget. Because without that investment, without that job creation, without that return on capital, then we simply do not have the funds as a society to help those who need support. And that's the point. That's the point from our perspective. And I think that is one of the fundamental differences between those on this side of the chamber and those on the other side of the chamber. And in terms of looking at the budget, I'll be, I'll be quite frank and open in terms of my biggest concern. This budget was dependent, dependent upon a, uh, rivers of gold flowing in from the mining industry, the oil and gas industry, personal income tax receipts, company tax receipts. 
what is going to happen what is going to happen when those receipts fall away that is my concern because all of the laudable uh, social spending helping the less advantaged in our community depends upon those tax receipts and if you turn to the budget uh, paper number 1 page 168 it talks about the importance of those tax collections and let me refer to page 168 tax collections for 2022 to 23 continue to be higher than anticipated tax receipts to march 2023 are 13 billion dollars higher than expected at the October budget. So just in that short period of time, tax receipts have increased by $13 billion. What happens? What happens as unemployment increases, as the cost of living, which is also a cost of doing business, becomes more and more difficult for businesses to navigate, when they start laying off people and people stop from, people stop from paying tax to claiming unemployment benefits, job seeker benefits? That's the question. How sustainable is the spending which has been cooked into the budget over the board estimates? That's the question. Tax receipts outlook on page 169. Relative to the October budget, tax receipts are forecast to be $42 billion higher in 2023 to 2024. So the budget's actually assuming that tax receipts are going to be 7.3 per cent higher in 2023 to 2024 than what was. Uh, forecast in the October budget, and also $134.8 billion, or 4.5 per cent higher, over the five years from 2022 to 23 to 2026 to 27. So this budget, this budget is dependent upon increasing tax receipts. This budget is dependent, totally dependent upon increasing tax receipts, and that's uh, that's a fundamental assumption. In this budget, company tax has been revised. This on page 169. Company tax has been revised up by $28.9 billion in 2023 to 24, and $52.7 billion over the five years from 2022 to 23 to 2026 to 27. So again, again, the predictions, the forecasts are that tax receipts are going to keep going up, and that's my concern because when I'm talking to small businesses medium-sized businesses and in particular larger businesses they're telling me they're telling me that in some cases small businesses have started to shut their doors because it's just simply becoming too difficult to keep their doors open and they're looking for a way to transition out and in terms of at the larger end of the sector in terms of the big mining companies the big oil and gas companies they're telling me they're looking overseas and that's what really concerns me that is what is really concerning me, that if you have those big mega projects, the $5 billion projects, the $10 billion projects, and instead of those projects being constructed, for example, in Western Australia or in Queensland, they go to Mexico or they go to Vietnam or they go somewhere that doesn't have the current safeguard mechanism, which makes it more difficult and problematic for companies to carry on business here. They go to jurisdictions where perhaps they're not going to be facing the prospect of taxes being changed after they've already built, after they've already built their project on certain assumptions and then the ground shifts, shifts under their feet when the government decides to change the tax system. And this is what profoundly concerns me, that when I'm talking to people, including in my, own my old industry, in the mining industry, and they're telling me that they're seeing sovereign risk in this country. And it's not all just coming from the federal government, I should say. It's also the state governments. And in my home state of Queensland, the Queensland government shamelessly increased royalties on, on mining companies in Queensland. Just shamelessly increased royalties. And that sends a message to investors, because companies don't have to invest here. They have a choice. With respect to greenfield projects, they have a choice. I've got a dollar of capital. Do I invest it in Australia or do I go to the US? Do I go to Canada? Do I go to South America? Do I go to Africa? Do I go to Asia? They have choices. They have choices. And my concern is that this budget is being supported by projects which were constructed, which have been built under the investment regime that Australia had over many years, and that that investment environment is deteriorating from the perspective of those who make investment decisions. 
They are the ones making the investment decisions, and they will compare whether or not they should be investing their capital in Australia or investing in Mexico or the United States or Canada, Vietnam, wherever else it is. They have choices. And I've often given the example in this place in the oil and gas industry. I lived and worked in Papua New Guinea for over two years and had a lot of clients in the mining oil and gas industry. And three kilometres north, three kilometres north of Australia at the closest land point, a company can choose to, instead of investing their new oil and gas project in Australia, they can go to Papua New Guinea. They can go to Papua New Guinea and they can enter into a long-term fiscal stability agreement. They can decide that in terms of risk, around approval risk, the length of time it takes to get approvals, even if you're doing the right thing, they can decide that they're going to invest their dollar in Papua New Guinea instead of Australia. Now, that's wonderful for Papua New Guinea, absolutely, and I care deeply about our Pacific neighbours, our family in the Pacific. Great news for Papua New Guinea. But they will make choices with respect to, with respect to the allocation of their capital. Another point I want to make in terms of this debate, and, and again I think this goes to there is a philosophical difference. I've gotten up in this place and I spoke against the National Reconstruction Fund. I spoke against it. Why? Because I don't believe in the usual course, unless there are incredibly uh, extenuating circumstances, where, and I think defence is an example, that government should be taking equity positions in, in any business, unless it really has to. I really think it is uh, a perilous, a perilous thing to do, because once a government is a shareholder in a business, then that government has responsibilities over and beyond what a common shareholder has, because of its very nature. And uh, there will be people, stakeholders, approaching the government for that investment, putting forward their story as to why it's a good, good idea for the government to invest in those businesses. But what happens when it goes pear-shaped? What is the government going to do if it's a shareholder, a minority shareholder in a business, and that business has cash flow problems? If that business needs urgent equity injections, the government is on the hook. The government is practically on the hook because of the political pressures. The government is practically on the hook. Now, uh, depending the way you look at it, that might be a good thing, depending upon the way you look at it. From my perspective, from my perspective, I'd much rather see a situation as occurred under the coalition government where if a, a grant injection is needed for a company to buy a piece of equipment to modernise, etc., it's done in that way, rather than, rather than the government actually becoming an equity holder in a business, because I think it raises all sorts of issues, and I think we will see that play out over the next few years. And I do note in that respect the budget papers uh, note in one of the sections that there is going to be a special it is recognised by the Department of Finance that those risks are there and the Department of Finance is actually setting up a special team to, to look at those risks and to try and manage those risks. And I think the Department of Finance is right to do so. But I really do caution I've I've been involved in companies with government shareholders, typically governments are unable, for all the reasons we know, to move quickly, to act quickly, and I, I'm deeply concerned that the government is not going to get the return it expects to get on that $15 billion of investment, and I think uh, it could be extremely disappointed. But I do commend at least the Department of Finance on page 115 of budget paper number one notes that, and I quote, uh, the government is committed to effective, efficient and transparent management of its assets and will establish a new centralised oversight function for investment vehicles within the Department of Finance." End quote. And I will certainly be looking very, very closely at the investments which are made in those companies, in those corporate entities, and what return taxpayers are getting for that investment. And I do hope that there is transparent reporting with respect to those investments, because the Parliamentary Budget Office has previously raised the issue around opacity in terms of these sorts of investment vehicles and what it means for the budget. Uh, lastly, my last comment in relation to Senator Bragg's motion. I do want to commend his comments in relation to the changes which are being made in relation to the utilisation of franking credits. And, uh, 
I am concerned about how the legislation, uh, which Treasury did put out for consultation earlier this year, in relation to the utilisation in relation to equity raisings and the utilisation of franking credits is going to work in, in practice. Um, it is absolutely correct what Senator Bragg said, that typically companies like to pay uh, dividends on a sustainable basis across the years, but at the same time, during the same timeline, they won't, will go to shareholders and raise equity. And the concern is to what extent the ATO, the government will say, well, you're only able to pay dividends because you've raised that equity. But that is common practice. That is common practice in the list of public company space in Australia. So again, it's something I'll be watching very, very carefully. Um, and with that, I'm happy to conclude my comments. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. And look, I, mean, I share in actual fact Senator Scar's view in, in many respects on, on the fact that we do come from this from a different place. But Many of us in this chamber actually have a strong view, and so I know, including Senator Scar, that they needs to get the balance right. And when you're actually, obviously, preparing, drafting, and presenting a budget, there is a number of tests. And one of those tests are importantly, of course, what the Treasury is saying about the, the veracity, the capacity of the budget, and what the forecasts are. And of course, when you look at this particular budget, you see the incredibly important aspect where the Treasury has noted that there will be that the cost of living package, for example, is expected to directly reduce inflation by three quarters of a percentage point in 2023-24. Now that, that goes to a very the heart of the discussion that's been put by those opposite, and this and this proposition has been put forward by Senator Bragg. Is, is it what's what's the independent advice? What's the governing advice? Uh, for the country uh, that's making comment about what should be happening and what will be happening and what's the desirability of us getting a budget right. and they've, they've actually hit the nail on the head. Now, of course, we understand that uh, all of us here, that many Australians, and I, I've got to say, say that some feel it more than others, and I just want to say that you know, the, the cost of living package is an incredibly important aspect of the way that we approach the present pressures that are on Australians right at the moment. And not only should we be looking at the, the package that we've said to get that balance right, because it is, it is a task to get the balance right, deal with inflation, set ourselves up appropriately for the future, for our kids and their kids, but also making sure that we get the appropriate and possible and the appropriate um, support that we can to, to our community. And we've seen that in so many respects to regard to this budget, you know, whether it be pharmaceutical support, whether it be you know, the tripling of the rebate for, um, for Medicare, uh, whether it be a number of the important initiatives that come the 1st of July with childcare and early childhood education. You know, important that particularly in those, those aspects have also a productivity boost. The issues that we were doing in regards, of course, regarding um, fee, uh, free fee TAFE um, and that program's uh, ambition for the coming budget period. And also that desire of saying to so many of our young and those wishing to retrain that there is a future here and saying to our, our industries that there is a capacity to actually invest because what wasn't happening under the previous government is a package that actually delivered an outcome that said there was certainty about both trained and able staff to come in and do the work that needed to be done to make sure that we could have productive, efficient and ongoing um, uh, business um, confidence in in performance of, uh, of, of them running their uh, businesses, running their operations, but also what's critically, critically important, and that is about what others say about the, about the, the budget. And it really says to me probably the most important point of question time in this if, in this one narrow way that the key question and the key, key reliance on saying that the budget wasn't up to scratch and dealing with many of those issues that Senator Scar raised before and Senator Bragg before was quoting from Westpac, um, the Westpac uh, Bill Evans and talking about what Bill Evans and Westpac's view were with regards to budget. And I'll repeat this again because it was said earlier in the chamber. And Mr Evans said, I think these policies were necessary, going to these very important, you know, again, these very important issues of how we deal with making sure that we have 
proper safety nets for our community and proper productivity investment so that people in, in early childhood education, child, uh, child care, so that um, uh, parents uh, that are otherwise at home have the capacity to go and work. Um, the skills area, getting the capacity to go and make sure that we have a more skilled workforce, a more agile workforce, retrained workforce, but critically also the hope for the workforce and individuals within our communities to be able to, to get jobs. So he said, I think those, those policies were necessary and I don't expect them to put upward pressure on interest rates in the near term. Now, it just says that this is a whole house of cards that, from what those opposite have been saying, that this is a house of cards when they're relying on quite the uh, uh, Bill Evans' um, uh, comments from Westpac, because when you actually read Bill Evans' comments from Westpac, they actually endorse the trajectory of the getting that balance right. And so many more economists did the exact same thing, that they said that this is a projected opportunity for us to get the balance right, to deal with inflation, but also put an incredibly important package forward to make sure that we give support to the most needy, whilst we're using also that opportunity to take pressure off cost of living, but also investing in the right places. Job skills, training, 1st of July, childcare, early childhood education. And of course, you know, when we start saying where those um, important areas for us to be investing in uh, our social infrastructure, which is critically important to the country. You know, that's, that's mums and dads out there. That's our, that's our parents. That's our, that's our kids, making sure that they're secure. That's our next door neighbours. That's, you know, that's our brothers and sisters. That's our new Australians. That's our First Nations Australians. It's everybody. When you start talking about what are we doing when we're saying social capital into the Australian community, it's everybody. And that part of that um, program is looked at you know, those important areas of also how we reduce costs and reducing costs, of course, in the area of, uh, of energy. You know, this is a critical area to put downward pressure on those increases. And what we've seen for those opposite is that they've done the direct opposite. They've actually voted against. The coalition votes against having downward pressure on energy. They've voted against, and, and we'll see how, you know, um, the, the flippant comments that come tonight. But we'll see, we'll see certainly as the comments have been passed regards this budget so far from those opposite. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not including Senator Scar because Senator Scar had a thoughtful proposition. It's wrong. It's not in the right direction. Um, but he's holding his ideological view and I you know, respect that. But what's, when you get the independent advice, it says the opposite of what Senator Scar is saying. It's saying the opposite of what those on the opposite side have been saying. And of course, when you start looking at some of the issues like the 15 per cent increase for aged care workers, you know, a critically important part of social infrastructure to make sure that we have our mums and dads, our granddads and grandmums, and some of us and all of us into the future, getting that sort of service and protection, that social capital that we need. The economists, even the conservative commentary from the Australian is saying we're getting it right. The only people saying we're not getting it right are those opposite. And of course, whatever we do, they think we should be doing 20 to 50 per cent less. And then on, on our left, we've got the Greens saying, whatever we do, we're going to do 20 or 50 per cent more. So you know, there's another reference about how right we're getting it here. We're getting the balance right because of that um, certainly independent commentary and even the commentary that's coming from those with an opposite view on many of the initiatives that we've taken to this, um, this budget. And when we start looking at those questions about getting it right, it does go to that cr critical question of cost of living. And cost of living is a, a substantially critical issue now and it will always be. And one of those things of dealing with cost of living is making sure that we get wages right. You know, we've had a circumstance here with the previous government for over a decade, wage decline, intentional wage decline, an intentional strategy to suppress wages. And of course, when every proposition to deal with the cost of living challenges that, we, that everyday Australians have now, the inflation, strategy, the inflation problems that commenced under the previous government, where it was unleashed, we have the opposed opposite 
turning around and opposing the propositions we put forward. We put forward to have better and secure jobs. We put forward proposals about a fair bargaining system. We put forward a proposal, which is always the real killer. You know, this is the real killer on this argument. They opposed. They opposed, which says it to a T. Whatever your ideology is, this is the practical consequence of an ideology. When you turn around and say the poorest people in this country don't deserve a dollar an hour wage increase, you've just, you've just nailed your ideology to the wall for everyone to take pot shots at. Because every Australian in this country, every ordinary Australian in this country, well, I should say every, because there's a few on the opposite side that have been, unfortunately, in the Senate, every Australian, decent Australian in this country would say that is a fair dickum thing. And I tell you what, I'm confident there's some living on the opposite side that reckons it's a fair dickum thing too. And when you start looking about what the changes are that come to the future and the proposition about how we deal with issues like wage theft, you know, where decent companies putting their energy into skilling their workforce, having a more productive company, working with its workforce, and heaven forbid, I'll even say it, with their union representatives of the workforce, duly elected, a tripartitism to try to make a better system forward, whether it be the aviation industry, whether it be any other industry, where those companies do that, are actually dealing with companies that carry out wage theft, the ones that actually take the low road, the ones that turn around and decide that the best option for them is not to do better, not to build a better work community, not to build a better society, not to lead the way, but to pull the rug from underneath hard-working Australians and the community that they should be serving. Because, yes, they should be serving their working community and serving the broader community. And, yes, you can do that, and I can name up to companies that do that, making a profit and a very handsome profit indeed, because they know how to, to generate decent wages, a productive workforce, a good engagement, not without argument and sometimes even conflict, because, hey, sometimes having an argument across the chamber can come up with a better result. But simple opposition, the opposition political point scoring, does not get a better, spot, a better, a better outcome for any of us. Now, we're going to see a whole series of propositions put through this year dealing with the critical issue, issue of wage theft. And what I'd really like to see those opposite when we talk about cost of living is go to making sure that casual jobs have the appropriate, when they are casual jobs, an, an important area of the economy, an important option that people do, do have. But when they're casual jobs and they're actually working as a permanent without the job security, so, they can't, so companies can force them not having a bargaining position, when labour hire companies are actually engaged, created by the same company that's got agreements with its own workforce to undermine the workforce, whether it be BHP, whether it be Qantas, then you have to start turning around and saying, are you going to be fed income and deal with the cost of living? Because I've seen, when I've gone to the cost of living uh, uh, Senate inquiry, we were talked down about raising the issue against the retailers that are amongst the biggest employers in this country, what is your strategy to deal with cost of living with your workforce? How are you going to pay them more? Here are examples of things that are going wrong within your system. Answer that. Give us some evidence. Tell us about how you're going to deal with it. You know, some of the scoundrels like Aldi in particular. And to see those in the chair opposite of the Senate inquiry turning around and defending those companies is nothing but shameful. Because the thing is, what too many of them the opposite side don't understand is that when you start talking about industry plans, industry isn't the person who's the CEO of the company and the few well-paid executives. It is them. But it's more than that. It's all the people from the top, that means the person cleaning the, the bathroom, right down to the bottom of the CEO. It is everybody in the system that makes that a successful business. And the, and the employees that actually approach it that way, with that sense of, of uh, justice and a sense of humility, are the ones that succeed. But what they can't do on the opposite side when we talk about industry policy, whether it be the aviation industry or whether it be other industries, they just can't understand it. So when we start talking about same job, same pay, 
That is an issue about the opportunity for rather than companies gaming the system, rather than taking the Alan Joyce strategy, the Qantas board strategy of wiping out decent wages and conditions and job security, an industry that attracted people, now rejects people, isn't able to find people because of the strategy that they've adopted that you've only encouraged, encouraged when you were in government. And of course, when you encourage it when you're in government and allow it to prosper, then what you see is other companies following the exact same strategy. And we saw that through the job security inquiry. And I, you know, I just really hasten, you know, when, for, those that, that, for those few that do listen in to parliament or listen to question time, when you hear comments from Jack and Fred, well, I'll tell you what from the opposition. Well, but why don't you just go to the, the job security inquiry and hear from the dozens upon dozens upon dozens of people that have been abused and abused under the previous government's policies. Thank you. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, the biggest economic issue facing the country is clearly the uh, out-of-control inflation rate uh, we, uh, we are experiencing right now. And the government's budget does not even put one, effort, one ounce of effort into tackling or, or trying to reduce uh, the rate of inflation in this country. And, and, and while that is the topic of this motion, and, and it's, uh, it's obviously a, uh, uh, a statement I have made, uh, you don't need to uh, spend a lot of time arguing about whether or not the budget's inflationary or deflationary or going to add to, uh, to the cost of living crisis we're facing. You just need to go and have a look at their numbers. You just need to look at the numbers in the budget because the budget does tell you whether or not the government is increasing spending or decreasing spending. And very simply, if it's increasing government spending, that is going to add uh, to inflationary pressures in the economy uh, because there'll be more, more demand for, for goods and services and not necessarily any more production of goods and services. That is the set definition of how we get inflation. Uh, and so that table is not very well promoted in the government's budget, obviously. They're not very proud of. Uh, uh, the results of these facts and figures. But for those listening and playing at home, if you pull up budget paper number one, uh, available on budget.gov.au, and you go to page 94, uh, table 3.2, it's the most interesting and probably should be the most discussed uh, table in the budget. It's in every budget. Uh, you can compare it from different years, which I'll come back to. That table shows you how much government spending is increasing in net terms due to government decisions, so not, not because of economic activity or, or unemployment going up and down or, or, uh, or, or commodity prices affecting the budget. It, all it does is tries to isolate what are the impacts of what the government has done uh, this week and over the last few months leading up to the budget to the economy. And so there is a line. There's a line in that, uh, in, in that uh, table 3.2 which says total policy decisions impact on underlying cash balance. Now, that's the cash balance is just our overall uh, balance, and, uh, and a negative number in that line means that things are getting worse, that uh, our cash balance is deteriorating, or in other words, the government spending in net terms is going up. And so in that line, it shows that the government, government's impact on spending uh, is deteriorating the budget to the tune of $20.6 billion uh, over the five years of the budget in that table. $20.6 billion of extra cash going to the economy. So let's forget all the spin. Uh, we, don't even have to, we don't have to refer, or I might, if I get time, refer to some economists who have had their say. Uh, they might be right or wrong. Uh, different economists will say different things, of course. But, but the simple facts are, in the government's own figures, in its own budget, it is adding $20.6 billion to the Australian economy uh, through its decisions over the past few months for its budget this week, and that is going to be inflationary. And why is it going to be inflationary? Because that is a, it's a lot of money for a start. We could all say it's a lot of money, but it's also very, a significant amount of money in comparison to what has taken place in previous budgets. As I said, this table is a common table in all budgets. Uh, all budgets, all modern budgets, have had this table out, uh, identifying what the policy impact of a government's budget has been. And uh, the other night, I, uh, when I'm here late, uh, quite often with not much to do, uh, I went through and had a look at this table in every budget since 2007-08, uh, so for the last 15 odd years. And uh, this amount, this, this stimulatory amount, is the largest we have seen since the global financial crisis, putting aside the COVID years. Obviously, the COVID years are pretty special. In fact, uh, the year of the coronavirus 
that figure wasn't 20.6 billion; it was 233 billion, uh, and no doubt that's one of the reasons we're in this uh, cost of living crisis. But uh, very few of us uh, opposed at the time that level of stimulus. Uh, in fact, the Labor Party wanted to spend more uh, if they were in government. But but we all recognise that because we had the lockdown, because we had a pandemic, the government had to support the economy. Now we're left with this: the overhang, the, the hangover of uh, an inflationary crisis. But yet still, being out of a pandemic, uh, uh, with no recession, very strong economic growth otherwise, the government has put in more money to the economy than we've ever seen in a budget since the global financial crisis. So back in 2009-10 budget, which uh, was trying to respond to that financial crisis, uh, when the banking system in the US was collapsing and in Europe too, uh, where housing prices were under stress. Uh, the Rudd government uh, put in that this table was 20. The, the equivalent table showed that uh, the Rudd government uh, put in 29.5 billion dollars to the economy. Uh, so a figure not that dissimilar to what we saw this week. Now, notwithstanding all of the Rudd government's waste in pink bats and school halls and other calamities, uh, uh, they at least had the excuse of trying to fight a global recession. That's why they put that money in, and, and that was a sensible thing to try and stimulate the economy. It was just unfortunate how they went about it. Uh, but they were, they were at least in the right direction, going in the right direction. This week, the government's going completely opposite direction for, with what our economy calls for. What our economy calls for, and just to put that in context. In those other years, the next biggest stimulation, apart from the COVID years and the GFC, was in 2018-19 of 14.9 billion dollars. So this this amount of 21 billion is is a very significant amount of extra government spending. Uh, on a, in a situation where inflation is already at uh, 7 per cent. Some economists have a rule of thumb that for every $6 billion, I think, I think it was Mr Chris Richardson mentioned this the other day, but it was one of the economists commentating, said a rule of thumb is every $6 billion the government adds to the economy is another quarter per cent of interest rates. And, and so on that rule of thumb, uh, this budget is potentially, potentially adding a, a 0 .70, 0 0.75 or 75 basis points onto interest rates. That families are already suffering under, so that will be to the tune of three or four hundred dollars extra a month uh, for families already suffering uh, on, on on higher mortgage payments. Uh, this budget now won't be judged this week. Won't be judged tonight in the reply. Won't be judged in the polls that we see over the next few weeks. It'll be judged in the next six months to a year when we see whether the government's massively. Uh, expansionary budget has actually caused the Reserve Bank to raise interest rates further and make things tougher uh, for Australian families. The exact wrong recipe. Uh, it's such a big amount of spending. And I'm, I mean, being fair to the government, I'm using the net impact of spending. Their actual total increase in spending is $42 billion, but they are netting that off with various tax increases or not, but nowhere near fully funding those increases in spending. So you're left with the $21 billion. Now, admittedly, it's over five years, and I was just on the ABC when a uh, Labor Senator Senator Chisholm tried to claim that, oh no, no, when I raised this point about the 21 billion being the biggest since the GFC and COVID, uh, um, Senator Chisholm tried to say, no, 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 it's over five years and the money is sort of spread out over those five years, so it won't be that expansionary. Now, that, that was a complete lie. That was completely wrong. Because again, in that table, it's helpfully broken down by year. And so if you look at that, that row, the column I mentioned, sorry, the row I mentioned, uh, it, that, that extra spending, the $21 billion extra spending, $13 billion of that comes in either this financial year or next financial year, exactly at the time we're having this high inflation. This is a massively expansionary go uh, budget. It is adding fuel to the inflation fire. It's putting a huge amount of petrol on already a fire that's out of control. It reminds me of that scene in Zoolander, you know, when they're having that petrol fight. And they're all throwing petrol on each other and having a great time. We're all having a great time right now. The economy is going strong. The Murray Watts over there with the, with the, with, with, uh, with the hose spraying the Treasurer. Uh, the treasurer is spraying Katie Gallagher fire. Oh, they're all oh, having a great time until someone lights a match and that all blows up. This is a powder keg here waiting to blow up this budget uh, because it's adding this fuel uh, to, a, to a fire that's already raging through our economy and through Australian households. Um, I think it is, uh, it's also instructive to go and look at, well, where is this money being spending? What's, uh, what's, it, what's it doing? Again, during that comparison to the Rudd government stimulus, it, at, least, at least that Rudd government stimulus was largely in temporary programs, temporary programs that ended up being complete dogs, but, but, but you know, at least the Pink Bats program, the school hall programs all had an end date. Remember, it was building the education revolution. Do you remember that? It was called building the education revolution. Did, did we have a revolution? 
Did, do we remember? Did, <laughs> anyway, I'm getting distracted. But, 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 um, but building the education revolution always had an end date. So uh, they're, they're, even if it was overly stimulatory, it was, it was a going to ease itself out of the economy. The, the problem with this budget is when you go to the um, chapter on spending, when you go to the chapter on spending, uh, uh, the big increase in, in the government's um, spending here is in social security and welfare. Um, defence spending stays about the same. Health spending actually falls a touch uh, in the next financial year. Very few other items change significantly uh, in spending except for social security and welfare. And um, the problem with that is that these aren't, these aren't, this isn't a temporary scheme. This isn't a one-off sort of subsidy. This is a, uh, either increases in uh, the job seeker rate, uh, uh, the expansion to the single parenting payment. Uh, these will be locked into the budget now. There will be structural changes to the budget uh, which will make our debt situation, our clearly love quite large structural deficit that we have now, uh, permanent and, and ongoing. Uh, and, and again, you wonder what the strategy here is from an economic point of view in, in responding to uh, the inflation crisis we have. And, and I've just found the figures here. So, social security and welfare was, is costing us $226 billion this year. It's by far the biggest um, single, uh, single function or expense function of the budget. And, and it's due to grow in just one financial year, just one year, from $226 billion to $250 billion billion dollars, so a, a 10 per cent growth in one year. Uh, and then it's going to stay, it's going to grow another 13 billion the year after that, another 14 billion the year after that, and 10, 11, just, just to show of 11 billion uh, dollars the, the year after that. They're locking in, they're baking in a massive expansion of a welfare program. And that's, that's in the context where their estimates are that our economy will have pretty strong employment and, and, and therefore won't necessarily be paying out a lot of um, uh, people on welfare. If, we, if that changes, if those assumptions fail, changes, those figures will easily grow to over $300 billion a year in spending. Again, you, you just, this is just not a very well-formed response to the crisis that we have right now. Um, because if the other, the other major crisis we have economically that the government should and I would hope respond to at the moment is our shocking productivity performance. Uh, we've actually now got lower productivity than we had before coronavirus. We've had pretty stagnant growth for the last 20 years, along with almost all other Western countries. But, but, but in, 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 in the last few years, we've actually fallen. We're, we're, we're producing less with the same amount of labour and, and capital. And, uh, and, and, and that actually adds to inflation too. These, these issues are uh, somewhat separate, productivity and inflation, but they are also in a, in a way connected because, as the Reserve Bank Governor has said, if we can increase our productivity performance, if we can produce more goods, that will soak up the excess money supply we clearly have right now post-COVID and help reduce inflationary pressures in the broader economy. So it should be a major goal of any Australian government that wants to respond uh, to the inflation crisis we have to increase our productivity, to have certain policies and plans to do that. It's a very difficult thing to do. There's no particular lever uh, the government can pull, but they could try. But there's not even an attempt here in this budget to try and do that. And certainly expanding welfare spending is not going to do that. Uh, investing in dams or, or major roads, uh, attracting new investment, reducing regulation, red tape, those sort of things could help increase productivity. But the government's cut funding for dams. The government's put in massive amounts of new regulation in our energy sector, including price caps going back to the 1970s, the failed policy of the 1970s. They're, 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 all of their policies, are, uh, none of their policies that I can see, are doing anything to help our productivity performance and therefore also help make the job of the Reserve Bank Governor easier. The big problem here of this budget is that Philip Lowe had a tough job, somewhat of his own making, but that was spilt milk, uh, had a tough job and his job, Phil Lowe had a tough job before Tuesday, he's got an even tougher job now. And I do wonder, I wonder if uh, Mr Lowe actually had a bit of a hint on what was coming this week because he did shock a lot of Australians. He certainly shocked the markets and shocked the business community with his decision to raise interest rates earlier this month. Um, uh, I'm sure he speaks to people here in this place uh, who would have had a, no a bit of knowledge about the overall macroeconomic situation of the budget, where it was going to go. And, uh, and, and maybe he was getting ahead of the curve here uh, by raising interest rates uh, uh, in an unexpected way. And he may have to that might just be the first of the interest rates. We can blame on the government's ill-timed and ill-thought-through 
expansion, massive expansion of government spending, um, but there may be more to come. Because this is, this is a pattern, unfortunately, for the Australian Labor Party. There's not the likes of uh, uh, Paul Keating or, or uh, I've forgotten their finance minister's name in the 80s. There's not those sort of giants there anymore. Peter Walsh. Peter Walsh thank you. Thank you, Senator Scar. There's no one around that cabinet table that seems to be able to say no. Let's face it. Like, Senator Gallagher is a nice person, but I can't see her intimidating anybody around the expenditure review committee, with all respect. Uh, again, Jim, he's, he's sort of a hail, hail well fellow sort of guy. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't inspire confidence that he's got any guts and ticker uh, to say no, to make tough decisions. And they're, they're just kicking the can down the road. They're addicted to spending your money. The Australian Labor Party is just addicted to it. They just think they think it's their money. They take tax you. They raise taxes this budget by $20 billion. They spend another $40 billion, and they, then they have the gall to say they're fighting inflation. Their own figures damn them. Their own figures damn that they are totally misreading the Australian economy. They are wasting your money. They are taxing you more, and they're doing nothing to help you pay your bills and get the cost of living down. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Uh, Senator Watt, are you speaking on Senator Bragg's motion? No, I was going to. I thought I, I my understanding put, is that I might put okay. Senator Bragg's motion before I call you, but I think I know what you're seeking the call for. Um, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Bragg be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, Minister, you were seeking the call. I was. Thank you for the prompt, Acting Deputy President. I move that the sitting of the Senate be suspended till the ringing of the bells at approximately 8 p.m. The question is that the motion moved by the Minister, Senator Watt, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The sitting of the Senate is suspended till the ringing of the bells at approximately 8 p.m. Government business, order of the day number 20, budget statement and documents 2023-24, a resumption of adjourned debate. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. I seek leave to table the Leader of the Opposition's budget reply speech. Yes. Leave granted. Leave is granted, Senator Birmingham. I thank the Senate and I table the Leader of the Opposition's budget reply speech. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. <laughs> Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I rise this evening to speak about the appalling misuse of confidential government information. Are we this into adjournment? No, this is the budget. Oh. Any speakers on the budget? Yeah. Senator Babette. Thank you. Yeah, everyone's a winner. Everyone's a winner in uh, Treasurer Chalmers' budget. At least that's what Treasurer Chalmers will tell you. Now, the Treasurer himself, he's certainly a winner. He's a winner. His budget windfall victory is one which is largely driven by luck. But many expect, as I do, that his luck will be short-lived. 
Now, following the budget release, if you believe the rhetoric, you might also believe that maybe you're a winner, unless, of course, you understand that inflation is a tax. That's what it is. A tax that does not require legislation. A tax that hurts the most vulnerable. Now, inflation is not driven exclusively or only by consumer spending. It is not. Government spending also drives inflation. And they promise to spend around $185 billion more of your money. Of your money. Now, the RBA's money printing obviously drives inflation and government debt accumulation also drives inflation. Inflation raids all of our pockets, all of our pockets, and like a thief in the night, it makes us all a little poorer every single time. Now, you see the trouble with politics, the trouble with politics nowadays is that all the incentives are upside down. We have, a, we have created a system, a system over time whereby politicians are rewarded. They're rewarded not for what they achieve, like it should be, but instead for how much they spend. Politicians know that they will rarely be judged based on the outcome of their actions and are all too often tempted to announce a big spend, knowing that the return may not be there for hard-working taxpayers. Our politicians, unfortunately, find it much too easy to spend other people's money. Now, the Treasurer, Treasurer Chalmers, he had an opportunity to cut spending, an opportunity to post a large surplus and repay debt. Instead, Labor continues to frivolously spend taxpayer funds taxpayer funds, $450 million to our nation's largest industrial businesses to reduce emissions. An additional $200 million for the war in Ukraine and $360 million on the Indigenous Voice to Parliament. Just a couple of, only a couple of examples there. Now, we congratulate the Treasurer on projecting a budget surplus for 2022-2023. Now, this is something that obviously every single government should aspire to. Now, our challenge for the government is this, produce back-to-back -back surpluses. Can they post a budget surplus in 2023-2024, I wonder? Probably not. Now, the other victory for the Australian people in this budget is a lower projected federal debt. Now, that is a good thing for our country, of course. Now, we urge the government, we urge the government to make a concerted effort to repay debt, because low debt, it is a youth policy. Higher debt means higher taxes for our kids. Now, our treasurer, I think he is the luckiest treasurer in history. He's pocketed an unexpected windfall that on the surface, on the surface, makes him look rather competent. Low unemployment, higher than expected commodity prices and high inflation have boosted the treasurer's bottom line. Our farmers, our miners, they unfortunately don't get any thanks from the government. But it is these hard-working Australians who produce our minerals, our food, and that create real economic value. The blood, sweat and tears feed and literally clothe us. Our regional industries, you know what they do? They sustain and they build our cities. Now, the hidden but very painful very painful tax of bracket creep is another key driver of the Treasurer's windfall. Bracket creep occurs when wage growth 
forces employees into a higher tax bracket. The brackets are fixed. They're fixed and they do not increase in line with cost of living and wages. Now, without the indexing of tax brackets, we all end up with less money in our pockets and the tax revenue received by the government obviously balloons. I urge the Treasurer to not only pass on the legislated Stage 3 tax cuts, but to consider indexing our tax brackets as to alleviate the silent theft of bracket creep. Many Australians are going to get $500 towards their energy bills or so. Now, the government feels the need to hand out cash to help everyday Australians to keep lights on. But, government, but the government then assures us that it's got nothing to do with our forced transition to expensive and unreliable renewables. Of course, we beg to differ. Green energy policies are impacting family budgets. They have also, the government also has the audacity, the audacity to claim, to claim that this measure you know, will temper inflation. How does handing out money to people temper inflation? There are no tough decisions in the budget. Courage, it seems, is not the Treasurer's strong point. Unions are happy, globalists are happy, big corporates, they're related. Productivity boosting measures are non-existent in this budget. It's all about big government and short-term fixes to large problems. Large problems often created by the very government that chooses to ignore them. Average families, they are forgotten, forgotten people in our nation. It wasn't that long ago that a single income family could own a home, go on an annual holiday and also buy a new car every, every few years or so. Now, those days they're gone, they're over. But there are many things that government can do to ease the cost of living pressures, for example, income splitting. It is such a simple policy that would yield incredible results for Australian families. Imagine, imagine this. A family comprised of one primary income earner and one stay-at-home parent. What if they were able to split their incomes for tax purposes? For example, a household with one, with one party earning $100,000 a year currently pays roughly $23,000 of income tax. If they were able to split their income with their spouse, the combined tax they would pay reduces to around $13,000. That's around $10,000 of their money back, back in their pockets to spend as they wish. Treasurer Chalmers, this is the kind of family-friendly tax reform our nation needs. Now, the solution to our nation's headwinds is not more spending or a bigger government. The solution is cutting red and green tape removing barriers for business, promoting entrepreneurial attitudes. We must grow the pie so that everyone can eat, not just hand a slice of pie to a select few. Now, the United Australia Party, obviously, we believe in small government, fiscal responsibility, entrepreneurship, free market capitalism and family. We will continue to hold the Treasurer to account he has said that he plans to remake capitalism, and we know what that means. That means more socialism, which has failed and will continue to fail everywhere it has been tried. Thank you, President. So the question is that the Senate take note of the budget. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I propose the Senate now adjourn. Senator O'Neill. President, and I rise this evening to speak about the appalling misuse of confidential government information by auditing and insurance company PwC. In response to questions I asked in February at the Senate estimates and further questions I put on notice to the Tax Practitioner Board, there's now a cache of emails that give shape to an undeniable scheme of theft and deception undertaken by PwC designed to cost the Australian people and profit price Waterhouse Coopers. The deception was designed and known by 
at least 53 as yet largely unidentified partners and participants in the PwC email chain. References in Singapore, the United Kingdom, Ireland and the United States and Europe appear throughout the correspondence, and it's clear this is an issue with global implications. There has been extensive discussion in past days in the community and in the financial sector about the immense and far-reaching implications of this misconduct by partners at the pinnacle of PwC's partnership hierarchy. Mr Peter John Collins has been banned from practice by the Tax Practitioner Board for two years. Mr Tom Seymour has stepped down as PwC Australia CEO but remains a senior partner at PwC. Mr Peter Kaleida, Head of Financial Advisory Division and Mr Sean Gregory, Chief Strategy and Risk and Reputation Officer, have stepped down as board members but remain partners at PwC. Acting CEO Kristen Stubbins has not released a media statement to the public. We do not know if she is one of the blacked out recipients of the now public and shocking email chain. There has been no reveal of the identities of any of the people whose names are currently blacked out in the documents we have. Claims have been made by PwC about the appointment of an independent inquiry, but there is no public document revealing the terms of reference of the inquiry. And the independence or otherwise of the inquirers appointed by PwC to inquire into themselves is completely unknown. With trust in PwC at an all-time low, you'd think they would have figured out that such an inquiry is not to be trusted when it is self-appointed. Given the impact of this situation for every Australian who has superannuation, it's not surprising that over recent days my office has been inundated by emails and letters from Australian citizens and key stakeholders deeply concerned about the recent revelations regarding PwC. Many told me that they had never written to a politician before, but felt that due to the seriousness of this issue, they simply must communicate. Amidst the extensive coverage of this issue, I seek tonight to share the voices of a number of concerned Australian citizens, some with tangential connections to the assurance industry, who know deception when they see it, others with deep and informed understanding of the sector, who abide by the professional standards, People who do abide by those standards are there, and they so clearly spell out the standard of behaviour that is required to be an accountant, auditor or tax practitioner, and they know those standards have been breached. So here are some voices from the Australian people who have been in touch with me this week. The actions of PwC are an outrage. This particular white-collar crime has helped the privileged to even more wealth illegally. The opportunity cost to the Australian public of that money they acquired and saved their clients in tax avoidance would have done immeasurable good in improvements to health, education and infrastructure potentially. Keep going after these unscrupulous bottom feeders who have taken advantage of their privileged position to advance themselves. It's pure greed at the expense of the collective interests of the Australian public. Another fine Australian citizen wrote to me saying, as someone who used to work at PwC, I want to thank you for your efforts in bringing their terrible behaviour to light. I encourage you to keep digging. I left because of bullying from my boss. After I reported it, I was encouraged to take stress leave while there was zero accountability for her. In fact, I think she got promoted. There are so many people, at P there are so many people who have been damaged by working at PwC. They truly seem untouchable, which is why your efforts mean so much. Another citizen wrote, I have worked in multinational service companies and the arrogance of some of these companies and the arrogance of some of these executives is staggering. Some would truly drink their own bathwater. Others wrote, it is evident that the firm is trying to wriggle out of an ethical and professional morass in which many of its personnel appear to be involved. There is only one way future clients of the firm, be they government or private clients, can have any confidence in the firm going forward. The bad apples need to go and the firm needs to suffer. Another wrote, I personally don't think apologies and scapegoat resignations are enough. Yet again, white collar crime has minimal impact on the perpetrators or the industry which promotes their behaviour. 
which it will only check itself when publicly exposed or embarrassed. And there are more. I hope to get their voices on the record as we continue our investigations into what happened at PwC. Some of my Senate colleagues have called for this matter to be referred to other bodies for further investigation, and that may yet occur. Any and all future action on this PwC matter needs, however, to be faced based on facts, on detailed information, and any proposed action needs to be given due consideration. That's what responsible governments do. Chasing headlines for a day will not fix this problem. Knee-jerk reactions rarely manifest lasting reforms that have integrity. Irrespective of calls to action and what further developments there may be in terms of potential pursuit of criminal charges or investigation through the National Anti-Corruption Commission, or indeed by the professional bodies that supposedly oversee the sector in a self-regulatory model, there is a task for the Senate to undertake to continue to further reveal the underbelly of a sector that is now a matter of public record. I use Joseph Conrad's words from his remarkable novel, The Heart of Darkness, to express my personal response to what I have seen of this PW scheme. In these documents that I have at hand here, 144 pages of communications across the globe inside PwC with bits and pieces blacked out and still no transparency about who was involved from PwC. When a company thinks it's okay to steal from the government of a country, what does this mean for the multinational companies, for the Australian companies and for the small and medium enterprises that they are supposedly servicing? What does it mean in terms of the integrity of the advice that they're receiving? What does it mean for us as holders of superannuation about the truth that they're supposedly assuring with their reporting of what's going on in the companies in this country? I assure you, colleagues, that those Australians who are listening to the broadcast tonight or those who read of this in the newspapers in Australia or overseas this matter is a matter I will continue to prosecute here with my colleagues in the Senate to bring light to the darkness and change the cultural realities that have been revealed. We need to propose thoughtful, substantive and impactful recommendations to government and other entities for the change that is necessary. Misconduct of this nature cannot occur within the assurance sector. For the Australian people's economic security, Assurance companies in a healthy economy must be trusted actors. Section 30-10 of the Tax Agent Services Act of 2009 establishes the legislated code for registered tax practitioners. The code sets out the professional standards, the ethical standards required of registered tax practitioners. There is no mystery here. There are five categories covering 14 principles. Honesty and integrity independence, confidentiality, competence and other responsibilities. They had a manual, clear and explicit, to follow. They had a professional obligation. They did not accede to any of those standards and instead, instead set up their own scheme for profit. Requirements are clear, but many at PwC have failed the test. The PwC cultural reveal is an issue which deserves far more than knee-jerk reactions and snappy headlines. I intend to continue to pursue this issue through the Senate in the same reasonable and deliberative manner which originally brought these issues to light, and I seek the support of my colleagues in doing that on behalf of the Australian people and transparency in the financial markets of this country. I hope for the same determination from all my Senate colleagues. This is exactly the type of work that we were elected to do. And it's what we must do in this important place at the heart of our democracy. I thank the Senator. I remind honourable senators that legislation committees will meet to consider estimates commencing on Monday, the 22nd of May 2023, at 9 a.m. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Tuesday, the 13th of June 2023, at 12 noon. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>